this January 3rd meeting of the Charlotte City Council Transportation Planning and Development Committee. Uh, we have two agenda items today. Let's start with introductions, actually, in uh, committee members first, please. Malcolm Graham, District 2, committee member. James Mitchell at large. Good morning, James Mitchell at large, committee member. Ed Driggs, I chair the committee online. Happy, Happy New Year, this is Renee Johnson, District 4. Great, and let's have introductions around the room, starting in the corner back there, please. Brandon Cagle, Interim Cast CEO. Brandon Hunter Cats. Jason Morris Cats. Tracy Dodson, Assistant City Manager. Kelly Gavin Cats. Andy Mock Cats. Liz Babson, Assistant City Manager. Yolanda Jones, Planning. Braxton Winston, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Allison Craig, Planning. Lynn Alexander, Short Transportation. Great. We have two agenda items today, the Silver Line Locally Preferred Alternative Update and the CTC Update. For the first one, I guess I'll hand over to Kelly Goforth. Good morning. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present to uh, Council again on the Silver Line Center City Alignment Alternatives. And uh, this morning we're going to give a brief update with some additional information. Um, that should uh, respond to some of the questions that uh, committee members had at our, our last meeting. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Andy Mock, uh, who's the project manager for the Silver Line. Thank you, Kelly. Andy, be before you start, I just want to remind the committee that at our last meeting, we did actually vote by, I think, a four to one margin to recommend the LPA uh, to the full council. So what we're going to get today are some answers to questions that arose during that conversation and also a uh, recommendation by the staff uh, along the same lines as the conclusion that we reached at our last meeting. So Andy, go ahead. Thank you. Next slide, Len. So this, uh, Council Member Driggs is ahead of the game, and this really just reminds uh, the committee of where we were, which, uh, which was a committee vote last uh, December 5th, 4 to 1, in favor of the locally preferred alternative, noting priorities <clears throat> of ec focusing on economic development and concerns about business disruptions of Trade Street uh, with the shared gold line are some of the key takeaways from staff. Uh, and he we're here today again to share some new information to, and to address any questions that were outstanding from last time. Next slide. Um, we won't spend a lot of time on this. You all have seen this map quite a few times. We have three alternatives, the locally preferred alternative item one. Item two is shared blue line merging onto the blue line near 12th Street and shared gold line merging onto the gold line near Charlottetown, uh, so we don't have to go through too much detail on that. Next slide. Uh, so the, the next couple slides really compare some of the alternatives based on some questions from the last committee meeting. And the first one we heard uh, was about traffic considerations for the three alternatives. Uh, so I'll, quit, I'll briefly go down through this and, and I'll, I'll also recognize uh, Ed McKinney who helped craft some of this language with Charlotte DOT, so he, we can step in if we need to. Uh, the first item is the locally preferred alternative as far as traffic impacts. Really no traffic impacts because it's, it's completely uh, grade separated. You know, it, it bridges over all the streets. There will be disruption because road construction will be required, especially on 11th Street and some of the ramps. But for the most part, we're bridging over all the roads. Uh, really no access impacts, really no change in access for anyone. Uh, any business access because of the bridge. Uh, that's part of the, the payback on the investment for the bridge. Uh, but, there are, but there are considerations regarding uh, construction required on 11th Street and the access ramp, so things will have to change on 11th Street and the ramps regarding the implementation of the bridge. For the shared blue line option, uh, it, we, we kind of characterize these three types of considerations in, in, in this, a traffic impact and access impact and other considerations. So from Share Blue Line, from a traffic impact perspective, there are some impacts to traffic from the Share Blue Line by having the gates closed on uh, 9th, 8th, 7th, 6th, 5th, you know, more often on the Blue Line. Uh, CDOT characterizes those as manageable, but there are certainly delays associated with that. From an access perspective, really no change in Phase A uh, because we're on the Blue Line, so access stays the same for everyone. Uh, just more closures of those crossings at key, at, at, during, especially during the peak hour. If, 
assuming we're on, on trade street for the phase B, then there would be access changes uh, uh, similar to the shared gold line option because we would be in the median of trade street. So there would be access impacts associated with that. Other considerations regarding the shared blue line, there are some complexities about the maneuver to get from 12th Street into the shared blue line. So certainly there would have to be uh, some changes to 12th Street and there would be some somewhat complex uh, intersections of 12th Street and McDowell and, I'm oh, sorry, Caldwell and Brevard. And there would be access changes on I-277. So there's not a 100% straight path uh, on 12th Street, but once you're into the blue line, it's relatively simple and straightforward. Uh, regarding shared gold line, uh, so there's traffic impacts uh, associated with that. Uh, CDOT characterizes as manageable. I mean, there certainly would be delays on Trade Street as gates, as, as traffic with cross streets would have to be closed through preemption and, and more often, so there certainly would be. Um, but I think the bigger change is really about access. So access to all the streets and the business access will be different. Uh, so they will be, the essential access will be maintained to the existing businesses. But there will be turn limitations, so there will be less lefts available, mostly right in, right out, uh, only lefts where absolutely necessary. We will provide whatever access is required for emergency responders, certainly, uh, but it, it will certainly be different than it is today. Um, and, and, um, yeah, and that includes both crossings, turning for intersections, as well as business driveways. Uh, regarding Charlottetown, uh, there's certainly, there is a decreased capacity on Charlottetown because we need to take some lainage to make, uh, and there's some additional analysis required to figure out the, what the crossing detail of Charlottetown and 7th Street is somewhat complex. So I'll pause there, there's a lot of information there, see if there's any questions or comments, or if Ed wants to add anything. Um, have, have, have there been any uh, kind of super block considerations for the act grade crossings for vehicles um, along the shared blue line or the shared gold line routes? We have, n no, we, we have tried to keep access this blocks the same as much as possible and not, and not change. Well, there are two blocks that would not be able to, traffic would not be able to maintain, whether you characterize that as a super block, I'm, I'm not sure. But the block between Church and Pine would have to be closed for traffic and the the, the lock between uh, Pease and Charlottetown would have to be closed to traffic through CPCC. Well, I, I would certainly suggest if, if, if either two or three has any legs um, that we consider um, a super block model or, you know, limiting uh, through traffic vehicular use along those at grade crossings. Um, you know, I think it just makes sense. You know, for those that are watching, super blocks are really where only the only vehicular access is for local um, and service vehicle access, not um, uh, not uh, through traffic, general general traffic, more pedestrian oriented. We, we do have some certain blocks are kind of maybe organically heading that way, but we didn't really have the conversation about specific designation as such. Now, a lot, there's a, several blocks with limited access on the shared gold line that really is only access for local, like hotel access. So uh, it's certainly that, that by the nature of it would kind of lend itself that way, but we haven't really had a design discussion about a specific design goal for that. Like I said, if, we, um, if, if, if this has, has any legs and moves forward, we strongly suggest we make intentional um, design considerations towards that direction. Great. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, no, we'll talk some more about um, how we pull all this together because you're going to see a couple of different criteria for the comparisons. Uh, and, uh, and then the process through which we reach a conclusion uh, but carry on. Next, Thank you. next slide, Lynn. So uh, this slide is really trying to, to trying to explain and communicate the amount of disruption through the types of adjacent. That was Councilmember uh, Mitchell's comment last week. And so what we tried to do, so it was apples to apples, is identify the types of uses in the quantity of guideway that was adjacent to it. So we're trying to make you know an apples to apples a fair and balanced comparison. So just for, 
for comparison, the locally preferred alternative has a really limited uh, disruption on business uses because we're basically along the edge of the freeway and adjacent to residential neighborhoods along through Elizabeth, First Ward, and Fourth Ward. So it's really very limited business uh, disruption. But there is more residential disruption associated with coming along the edge of Elizabeth, Fourth Ward, and First Ward. And there is, uh, there is some amount of street reconstruction, so to get to that, biz that disruption to the public space. So there is certainly some uh, uh, disruption. Mostly that is along 11th Street, the Brookshire Freeway, and the Charlottetown Ramp. Charlottetown Ramp is consistent in all cases. There's going to have to be some amount of adjustment to that. Uh, related to Share Blue Line, it's kind of the, the least disruptive of the three because there's really no business uh, there's really no business uses along a lot of that. Most of that's residential because we're really coming along. And the impact, the footprint of the shared blue line is relatively small because we're just merging into the blue line, running on the same tracks that are out there. Um, but there are certainly is uh, some residential impacts associated with uh, Elizabeth, uh, the Elizabeth neighborhood and uh, the, some of the communities along um, 12th Street. And there's a, a relatively small amount of uh, street reconstruction associated with that. Regarding shared gold line, is, you know, that was a, a big conversation last time about the amount of business disruption. Here we've got almost all of it is, is you know, 1.9 miles of business disruption associated with reconstruction of Trade Street. And just to, as a note, so the, the, one of the reasons that Trade Street is being reconstructed is because what we're trying to implement with a silver line shared gold line vision is a kind of a dedicated guideway that could be used for both the gold line and the silver line. So why not right now the gold line just kind of runs in mixed traffic and we would like the reliability so that we could have the, the operational benefit of a dedicated guideway and that really requires additional construction of Trade Street because the gold line Trade Street wasn't built and designed that way. Also the stations would need to be reconfigured for a light rail boarding standard. So there's, there's certain things I just wanted to get into that a little bit more why we have to do so much construction on Trade Street. But there is also some residential uses and packs there associated with Elizabeth and of course the 1.9 miles of street reconstruction. So I'll pause there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Staff, uh, thank you for this presentation because I think you're right. We had a lot of conversation about, around construction uh, disruption. But the 2.2, can we go back? Because I want to make sure lessons learned from what we did at Hawthorne that we work on our communication piece, because you, you remember we all got headaches. Hawthorne resident and the business owners was very upset that we didn't communicate. So can we go back to the map? Because I, I don't want to upset Council Member Graham, no Council Member Anderson. So you're talking about the residential, we're talking about that purple. Yes, correct. And so I think it would be great if we could identify those neighborhoods very quickly and make them part of our overall communication so there's no schedule. Um, if we're going to impact the businesses, how the hours need to change. I just want to make sure we do a lesson learned from Hawthorne when we, if we go this route. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Great. And, and Council Member, which we have had a lot of outreach to Fourth, fourth Ward and First Ward. Okay. Next slide, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One more. There we go. Uh, this really associated with costs, just a minor tweak from last time. Councilmember Member Mitchell, you asked some questions about the overall cost of the, of the locally preferred alternative in center city. So you can have a, a context and a point of reference for what we're talking about. So this just kind of breaks that down a little bit further. So the overall LPA cost from Charlotte Gateway Station to CPCC Levine, uh, for this, so that's the entire locally preferred alternative as adopted, for, based on our 15% engineering, is about $5.9 billion in the year of expenditure. So for the LPA in Uptown from Charlotte Gateway Station to Pecan, and Pecan we just kind of pick because that's the, the, the last point where those, they, all the options kind of deviate, so it's apples to apples. Uh, and that's $1.3 billion through the center city to go along the northern side along 11th Street. Uh, with the phase A terminus uh, for the Moorhead with an additional 400 to 500 million of a year, year of expenditure, if that option is selected. Regarding the, the, the changes of cost, regarding the shared blue line and shared gold line, those inform, that, that has not changed. It's, there's still four, five to six hundred billion million dollars less for either option, and a lot of that cost is associated with the reduction of the bridge. Ms. Anderson. Ms. Anderson, do you have a question? 
We can't hear you. Yes, sorry, just coming off of mute very slowly. Um, thank you, I do have a question. Um, as we go through these three slides, can, can you also just speak to the ridership impact and um, analysis that has been done for these three options? I, I think Thank we you. have that. Uh, we do have that on the slide, Ms. Anderson. Uh, so uh, oh, let's take a look slide. at that. And right. if you still have questions, let us know. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, yes ma'am. Any other questions about cost before we move to, I think, ridership is the next slide. Yes, it is. It's a good timing. All right. Next slide, please. Oh. Um, just, I just want to understand the, the verbiage on uh, the first column, LPA, overall LPA cost. Okay, it's the overall, and then you broke out the uh, gateway station. To Correct. Point. Okay. Yeah. The overall, the total adopted alignment from Charlotte Gateway Station to CPCC Levine, the 15 miles to go into the town of Matthews, versus the center city. That was the question last time. Well, okay. what kind of, what scale of a decision are we making here? All right. Thank you. Great, thank you. So next, next slide is really focused on ridership. This is something that's been a lot of attention, a lot of discussion, rightly so. It's a very important variable in our decision making and our uh, overall process. So we, we have been doing analysis associated with uh, ridership of the alternatives. I'm gonna explain a little bit about this. Um, there's really two different runs of the, the ridership. There is the kind of the existing year based on existing socioeconomic data and the future year, which is based on a future projection based on the Metrolina Community Viz model. So when you see 2019, that's basically the existing year run. And as you can see to explain, there is a difference in the ridership between the locally preferred alternative and the existing year uh, in the 20, 2019, between the locally preferred alternative, the share blue line, the share gold line, because there's been a lot of growth and focus and there's an existing travel market based around the blue line. Right? So being on the blue line gives a benefit to Rasha. There's also more stations on the shared blue line option. Uh, and it goes, it kind of hits the center city core and also hits some emerging areas on the northern side for that shared blue line option. So in the kind of the current development pattern, the shared blue line, shared gold line provide the, the, the best ridership. But when you look into the future, based on that future projection of the, the growth in center city, which is really very high projected growth in center city, it kind of washes out the alternatives because there's so much growth distributed across center city that it really creates a scenario where that the, the future ridership based on those growth projections is very, is very similar in, in the future years than the current years based on that growth. So a couple of notes here is that the LPA kind of serves, the, you know, it serves the, the planned growth adjacent to the center city core area, doesn't really hit trade and try on where that existing market is as well as those growth areas along the edge. Share blue line kind of hits the, the core and some growth areas along the north, and the share gold line kind of hits that, that spine, that main spine, the same spine that the gold line does. So I think our overall punch line for our initial projected preliminary ridership analysis is that ridership is really not distinguishing in the future year between the three alternatives. So Ms. Anderson, is that responsive to your question? Yes, it was. I just, I wanted to make sure that we covered the slide. I thought the last slide was gonna be our last slide. But thank you for this perspective and uh, these numbers and sharing it with the public. Thank you. All right, uh, Commissioner Altman, uh, if you have a question or a comment, uh, feel free to speak. Thank you, that's very kind of you. Thank you, Councilman Driggs. Um, For the clerk, this is County Commissioner Lee Altman. Okay. Um, I had heard that to qualify for federal funding, they'll be looking for um, data to show what's likely to draw the most amount of ridership and that economic development isn't a consideration to qualify for federal dollars at all, which is key. Here And so I guess I'd have a question about whether or not um, you believe that that option two or three, um, or, or that option one could suffer 
and being competitive for federal dollars if it is perceived as drawing lower ridership? That's my question, and thank you. A, a couple notes there. Economic development is a factor in the New Start's criteria. It, it's more qualitative, looking at policies and plans. It's not like an economic development study. So it is, it is one of six factors. Uh, four of the six factors are really based on ridership. So ridership is a very, very important from a, from a federal funding perspective, as well as cost. Uh, so I think our, our view of these numbers based on that projection is that ridership is somewhat similar between the options and really not a decision maker in a, in a federal funding perspective. Uh, cost, you know, is, is, is certainly something that you have to, we have to keep in mind always because that feeds into cost effectiveness. Um, so 100% agree that ridership is a critical part of this. But with numbers as kind of close as these are in our current projections, based on a, a growth vision of, of the center city, we don't see this being distinguishing from a federal funding perspective. All right, thank you. Go ahead. Next slide. And so this is just a really an update based on the final uh, comparison of the, of the uh, public engagement survey that we did. That survey was open through no, from November 1st and from, through November 30th. Uh, and it also include pop-up events at CTC, CPCC, and Trade and Tryon where we solicited input directly from people and paper maps and paper copies and everything. So this is really just an update of, of information that y'all saw last month. And, w and so the updates are, are, are updated. We, last time we showed a range so I'll just kind of walk through these numbers real quickly and then to kind of talk about anything that's changed between uh, then and now. So for the LPA, as far as supportiveness goes, we're at 39% supportive. That's down uh, a little bit from the range that we had on, uh, at the last meeting, which was we ranged at 40 to 45. So it's down a little bit on supportiveness. Uh, neutral is about the same and opposed is up a little bit as well, 37%. Uh, so in the comments there, the, the kind of the, the themes that we hear through the survey is really people, people like access to new opportunities within Center City, new areas that aren't currently served by the Blue Line. So that's a, that's a distinguishing characteristic. But there's comments about, you know, concerns about the higher costs and, and also the converse of, the, of what you like about new opportunities is you don't get the old opportunities. So there's also the concern about not getting to trade and try and not getting direct access. It's a longer walk to trade and try and longer walk to CTC. Uh, regarding uh, shared Blue Line, those numbers are, are really have been the same. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of movement on that one. Uh, and and the, acts, the comments there are really, and it's the, the one that's the, the highest opposition. And I, there's, there's, there's things that are people mostly reacting to is the required transfer between the phases and the traffic disruption associated with the, the crossings of the shared blue line. But really not a lot of movement in those numbers since we presented that last time. Regarding shared gold line, uh, and that one, the, the numbers uh, is 43%, so it's the most supportive, supported of the three options. Those numbers really haven't changed since last time. We had a, a, a range of 40 to 45, so we narrowed down on 43, so we're within the range. The neutral went down a little bit, uh, so now it's at 35, and the opposition went up. The opposition actually went up about the same amount as the opposition of the uh, LPA, so there's kind of a consistent movement there. And so what people like about the uh, share gold line is access to all the current center city markets and trade try on, you know, spectrum center, all that stuff that's on trade street, you know, and then the dislikes of stuff we've talked about, which is the traffic disruption uh, from access changes and roadway reconstruction. So no, no news there. Just wanted to update the committee on those new numbers now that we've closed the survey and we're final. All right, next slide. Any, well, let me pause there. Any comments on or questions about that? We're good. Okay. We have a number of, of uh, we have, if we have time to go through the, the visualizations, we can do that. Or if we would like to skip forward, I don't know what the, what the agenda looks I like. I think we only have the two items, so um, okay. yeah, go ahead. Okay, so just uh, briefly, and we went through this last time, just to kind of talk a little bit about the, the, the visual differences between the alternatives. So the locally preferred alternative, of course, is an, an aerial guideway, and it goes the whole way from uh, you know, uh, Central Avenue the whole way to Charlotte Gateway Station, pros and cons associated with an aerial guideway. But this is the, 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 the 11th Street Blue Line Station. Uh, so it's, it's something we heard, which caused a lot of this conversation, is about how that interaction between the LPA and the Blue Line is 
connection would be from a pedestrian's perspective. We think there's some things that we can continue to evaluate if the locally for alternative moves forward in, in, as, as the, as the uh, LPA. So I think there's some things we can still look at, but there's still always going to be a vertical difference between those two between those two projects. So are you talking <clears throat> about this is the 11th Street situation where there's a some yes. distance between yeah. the nearest Blue Line stop and correct. the Silver Line. That's correct. And there's still work being done on how to minimize that issue. Yeah, we would we would certainly you know once the decision is you know finally made that the that the uh, local for alternative will remain the local for alternative were reaffirmed then we would try to re evaluate whether we could improve the vertical and the ver the the horizontal now w we don't think we're going to be able to improve the vertical much so there's always going to be a vertical transfer of 40 to 50 feet so there's always an escalator or a it, it could be an escalator it could be uh, elevators you know, we've tried to kind of minimize through this. We have a ramp. We also have alternatives for like a a glass stair tower kind of thing. So we're, we're, we will be evaluating different ways that we can make that better. But there's always going to be a significant vertical transfer between the, the, the blue line and the silver line. We may be able to make the horizontal different distance a little bit better, but there's always going to be vertical. Okay. I think that's one thing that's a key distinguishing element between the shared gold line especially and, and the shared blue line and the LPA is that all the station access on the LPA is, is vertical. So there's, there's vertical access to every station is required because they're all on a bridge. So while the, while the shared gold line, shared blue line is mostly at grade, so there's, that's a key distinguishing uh, change to it. Next, next and, and that's the higher cost? I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Next slide. There we go. Uh, so th this is the Graham Street station. This would be the next station toward Charlotte Gateway Station. So this shows the uh, elevated guideway going over across <laughs> Graham Street uh, and kind of going over the kind of jug hunter ramp that comes down. So this is kind of what the bridge would look like going through uh, the corner of Fourth Ward adjacent to uh, Brookshire and over that as it, as it gets ready to go into the Charlotte Gateway Station district. So we've had a lot of conversations with the, the first ward folks. You know, there's certainly concerns about the visual noise, vibrations, and things we, you, you'd imagine if with a, a bridge going through, going through Fourth Ward. Yes, Mr. Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just curious. Uh, how many property owners will we have to uh, build a relationship with to build a bridge? Uh, all of them along there. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there, I mean, there, were, there will be property acquisitions along this entire, along this entire extent. I mean, so but everything between Smith and Central Avenue, there will be some amount of acquisition. A lot of that acquisition will be in NCDOT right away. Okay. So there will be NCDOT. I mean, certainly there's going to be there's going to be some, yeah. but it's going to be a, it's going to be a kind of little bit of NCDOT right away and a little bit of private property on the edge. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Next slide. So the, the, these next two slides really show the shared gold line alternative. We didn't show the shared blue line because it's really nothing to see there. It's, 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 it is the blue line, but the shared gold line is a distinct difference. And here, that the vision there is to create a dedicated guideway in Trade Street that could be more reliable than the gold line currently is so that we can run a light rail type service in Trade Street, not a shared street streetcar like as currently runs on the gold line. So. And that would require us to rebuild the stations to meet, you know, we have, we would be designing for the capacity for a three car light rail, not a one car street car. So all the stations would have to be rebuilt and that we would have to reconfigure the rail so that it can be configured in the middle so that we can have the reliability that we would want. And that would require some amount of reconstruction on trade sheets somewhere between, you know, we don't, we, don't exact, we don't exactly know how much reconstruction at this point. We're hopeful that a lot of the utilities would be relocated out of the way. We would need to go further into design to have a lot of confidence to say that. So there's a chance it could be more construction or most construction of Trey Street or, or maybe half. So I think that's a, we don't really know that. We're, we're assuming at this point and from a conservative perspective that more construction is required than less just to be conservative. But 
we would have to go into design to really know what that detail is. And there are no cars in this picture, so. On this section, this is the CPCC section. Right. So this section of, of Elizabeth Avenue, there would be no cars We're going through campus. Yeah, they do go through there now. Well, that, that would be a change. Yeah, it would be a change. And you'd have to then analyze the impact yeah, on all of the surrounding all roadway wow. network. Yeah, correct. Okay. Yep, next slide. And this shows the, uh, the, the vision for the block along Charlotte Gateway Station. Uh, so this would be what you see to the left of the curb is the, the private development phase two component of the CGS project as we've interpreted it. Uh, what you see in the backside is the bridge for the future Amtrak and the future uh, rail, the trail would be, the 704 trail. And we're, we're showing here a, the light rail in, the, in a newly created median with a station uh, with tra traffic on the outside. So this would not, we would have traffic on, on these blocks. Mm -hmm. uh, so we would have traffic, we would have limit, access limitations, there'd be limited lefts, but most, it'd be mostly right in, right out. And we would have access to Charlotte Gateway Station and Amtrak via a, an elevator tower at the edge or across the street and in, directly into the main block. So that's kind of our view of how, if we choose Share Gold Line, you would access uh, CGS. So in this one, uh, the Silver Line is coming in perpendicular to uh, the the rail lines, right? And Correct. Uh, it would have to do a kind of button hook thing or something to get back on yeah. the rest of the alignment? So as soon as we go underneath that bridge, we would have to hook a left to go parallel, and we would, we, we would be able to make that curve to get tied in back into the Moorhead station. But at the station itself, you're going to have these, the, this lower level, it comes in that way, yep. and then it goes past that point Correct. around, and yes. it comes back onto the alignment we talked about yes. before. Yes, exactly. Okay. Next slide. Uh, regarding uh, Moorhead extension, that was something that we've, we've talked about. We believe that there is, uh, there's been strong support from the uh, public and stakeholders reg regarding the, the benefits of the Moorhead extension. Uh, and it would provide more direct service to development opportunities as well as the stadium use with that extension, with trade-offs, certainly. Next slide. So, uh, yeah, yeah okay. I've got one too. Go ahead, Mr. Mitchell. Okay. No, go ahead, Mr. Chair. I yield to you first. Okay. <laughs> um, how does the choice among the options affect the Moorhead extension? Right. So, with the shared gold line option and the LPA, can both make it to as part to make the Moorhead extension as part of phase A. The shared blue line cannot. The, the trade off there is about the cost and the complexity of the extension. So if we were to stay on the LPA, then we can make it, it's a, it's a complex bridge over the railroad. So there's a, a greater cost and risk associated with that bridge structure to get over the railroad. But that's part of our, that's part of our phase, that's part of our 15% design. So we have some design on that. Uh, with the shared gold line, it's relatively, you know, relatively more straightforward because we're going underneath the bridge. And as you noted, Councilmember Driggs, then we're no, coming up around at more, mostly at grade to tie into Moorhead. So we think it's a lower cost to make the extension to Moorhead if we choose the share gold line option. So uh, is there still a pending decision about whether the Moorhead extension is even included uh, in phase A? Yes. Right? But, but what you're saying is that there's a little checkbox in the plus column for the gold line as, as far as the comparison is concerned because of the fact that the gold line is not involved that bridge, right. which also involves cooperation with Norfolk Southern. Is Correct. Right? Correct. <clears throat> so there's a cost and a risk associated with the LPA getting to Moorhead extension. And then there's a pending question as to whether the Moorhead extension in either form would be included in the first phase of the Silver Line. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Anybody else? Mr. Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You had some of the questions uh, that I was going to ask. Uh, but so I, I hope we will have these in two separate motions. Um, a motion to make a recommendation and a second motion if we want to include potential phase A. 
Uh, I see the potential of the area, and we have a good corporate partner located in that area. Uh, but when you look at the, the the tremendous additional cost from 400 to 500 million, if we go to LTA and the goal line, 250 million, 350 million. Um, I feel more comfortable if there's some more due diligence, more study. And I, I notice in your note, you say support for Mohead noted in public survey. Did we miss that? Did, did we miss the, the results of the public survey and the stakeholder engagement? We should, we present that last time. Okay. We didn't we didn't get to that today because I wasn't I didn't think we were making a motion on Moorhead extension, but we we talked about that last time. I'd say it was mostly overwhelmingly supportive. Mr. Chairman, the committee, I, I, I think I feel more comfortable. Just like you've presented the data on one, two, and three, sure. if we could just have more public survey. And, and the only stakeholder engagement for that area is uh, uh, our football team, correct? I mean, uh, our NFL franchise. I mean, there's other stakeholders in that, that area. There's. Can, can you share the list? I know we got Charlotte, Pack, uh, Charlotte Pike and Foundries over that area. And then we have uh, the Panthers. What other big stakeholder do we have? There's, I mean, there's a string of developments along okay. that edge between uh, between Trade Street and uh, 277. Okay, okay. Staff, you can just provide. I don't mean to put you on the spot. I think that'll be helpful, Mr. Chair. But I, I think the uh, the vote that we took last time just talked about the LPA and not the Moorhead extension, right? right? So That's we're correct. not doing anything uh, about the Moorhead extension right now other than taking it into account as we decided, yeah. as, as we did decide on the LPA versus the gold line alignment. We, we at, at the next, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I think if we get to the next yeah, slide, yeah, then we can address the yeah. recommendation. So, so this is based on what we've talked about. This is where we where, where we are. So, for the center city alignment analysis, we have two separate and distinct bullets associated with it. Um, we have we have the center city alignment analysis, which is based on the four to one vote at the last committee meeting uh, to reaffirm the locally preferred alternative as following 11th Street. We are not recommending to a change to the LPA in center city based on that recommendation and that vote from from committee. Uh, as far as second goes, the second bullet goes regarding the Moorhead extension and the, the question about whether that's in part of this phase A or that's a future phase. We want to continue to evaluate that and have more conversations with the stakeholders and to evaluate the right way that we could potentially include that or do some amount of work to maybe facilitate that in the future. But I don't know that we're ready to draw a conclusion on that at this point. I'll see to Liz or Kelly if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, just to reaffirm what Andy said, um, council members, what staff is recommending, because we heard through the stakeholder and the public engagement process, is there's a lot of interest and support for the Moorhead Station being part of phase A. And from a staff perspective, we want to continue to evaluate that so that we can move that along. If at some point in the future we have enough information to determine there is support and then we'll need adoption for a change in the LPA to include that. But we're not asking for that at this time. Did I state that correctly? All right, thank you. And the question really is, is it part of phase A or phase B? Correct. Right? right. So uh, That's it, exactly it doesn't it. really change all, all the basic design. Mm -hmm. right. um, it, yeah. But uh, good. So do you have any more? Just the last slide just really shows the meetings and kind of where we're going. Uh, so really this morning's committee meeting and then t tonight uh, in front of council and then the MTC on January 25th. And that, that's all I have. Chair. So committee uh, tonight, I would like to refer to the vote that we took on the LPA uh, as uh, the preferred alternative. And Ms. Anderson, you were not ready yet to support that vote then. Uh, has your position changed at all? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I believe it has, having conversation with staff and having additional information around ridership and impact of ridership, I think my position has shifted. Thank you. So I, I can report tonight that the committee is unanimous in recommending the LPA and in uh, considering continuing to talk about Moorhead but not uh, making a recommendation yet. 
Is that a fair characterization, everybody? Uh, okay. Um, good. I, I, I guess that's all we need to do about that right now, right? And uh, oh, I'm sorry, Miss Johnson. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to um, get some information on the public input. I know we have uh, the percentages um, and the, the the amount of input, but I wanted to know, like, do we have the whole number that responded? You know, if we know it's 39 to 40 percent mm -hmm. of approval, what was the sample, or, or how are we doing our outreach to citizens? I mean, I see the list on how we're doing the outreach, but I want to know what the response percentage is. Yeah, we, we can provide that. We didn't make that as part of this uh, abridged presentation, but we have a full, full accounting of the information, including demographics and the overall responses. So we can provide that uh, to, to committee shortly after this meeting. And just to clarify, it's not it's not intended to be a statistically valid survey uh, of, of, um, Correct. Uh, of people in the in the area. It's based on voluntary responses and, and involvement in our public engagement process. So for the committee members, I think that's important that we have that information. I mean, is that 39% of 1% of our population? Or we know that there's uh, we've had challenges in the past with with response from uh, from the public on these large projects. So I think that when we talk about intentionality, we need to be intentional about ensuring that our public is engaged in this decision. Thank you. Great. And Ms. Johnson, I think you know I've made the point too that uh, these are kind of qualitative indications, I would call them. Uh, it's an outreach to stakeholders, um, including residents, but also if there are institutions or businesses. So uh, we can get more information about how that was done, but there, there are always going to be limitations. Very hard to get a statistically significant kind of poll of everybody that could be impacted by it, uh, except uh, as sometimes occurs, I think you're suggesting, we, we start to get that information later, which isn't very helpful. Um, but thank you for that. And well, I thank think you. And if we could, I mean, you could have that information tonight um, during the council yeah, meeting. We, that we way. will. And t tonight's will be more inclusive on the public engagement, Councilmember Johnson. So we'll have demographics and we, we can have some of those overall numbers that you're looking for. And Councilmember Johnson, thank you for the question. Um, just so everyone is reminded, that was part of the presentation that staff did at the December committee meeting. So we can quickly provide that information to you and we'll cover it tonight as well. So I have Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Not for tonight, staff, but uh, uh, down the road, if you can provide, uh, like to see what federal funding options now might be available uh, for the LPA as we go through this, uh, this process. I, I mean, because one narrative, we did support the uh, most expensive option but I do think if it lends us to some federal dollars, uh, I think that'd be very helpful if we can share with council down the road. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, so um, our second agenda item is the CTC update, and I think I will turn over initially to Ms. Dodson to talk about that. And committee, uh, just for orientation, this relates to the design of the bus center um, we have a lot of things still to talk about in relation to this whole CTC project. But as Ms. Dodson will explain, I think what we're trying to focus on today is the uh, is design process for the bus center. Yes, thank you, Council Member Driggs. And I'm very quickly going to turn it over to Jason Lawrence. Um, but we do want to go through um, a lot of the information. Some of this you've seen, <clears throat> some of it will be new um, related to um, the design of. Um, the CTC and the public infrastructure portion of it and then also spend a little bit more time at the end talking about next steps and the further um, integration and collaboration that we would have with uh, council as well as stakeholders. So with that. Great. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity to come again and, and talk about our, our, our outreach and discussions we've had with the public and we will round this out with a staff recommendation today. Uh, on the design concept to go forward with. 
If we can go to the next slide. I, well, I really like this image to really just really shows the transit center in the context of not only the Lynx Blue Line and the City Lynx Gold Line, the intersection of two of our most important federally funded capital projects in the region for CATS, but also shows, you know, in some ways, you know, the transit center is a bit of an island where it currently exists today. And what's also kind of telling to me, you know, this picture was taken in 2018, and you can see in the kind of the far reaches of that image where the Weston Tower is, that's all empty kind of construction areas now. If we took this picture today, that would be completely filled around the Brooklyn Village Station. So what's really important for CATS and has been since our inception has been this integration of transit and, and land use. And if we go to the next slide, that really did start with a vision back in the 1990s. And it wasn't only about transit, it was about land use and integration of that land use with transit to accommodate the growth that we were experiencing then and we continue to experience that growth today. The plan has evolved many uh, over the time, over the past 20 some odd years, but it's, that vision is still consistent with what we're trying to achieve each and every day. Next slide. And two guiding documents, two maps really guide where we are looking at not only the rapid transit space, the five rapid transit quarters and the 2030 transit system plan that all converge in our uptown area, but also a newly adopted, and we've been in front of this body many times to talk about the Envision My Ride effort, truly our first adopted kind of system level approach to bus network of high frequency corridors, micro transit, on demand zones connecting to mobility hubs. And the mobility hub concept really will start with the conversion and eventual replacement of the Charlotte Transportation Center. But if we go back in time again to the 90s, next slide, it really, at, at the time of the old transit center, which in the mid 90s was at the intersection of Trade and Tryon, that's where most of, of not all of our transfers occurred on street, open air. Uh, it came in right after the, the, the uh, Tryon Street was changed into a pedestrian oriented mall. With the transit sh shelters that are there really accommodated those transfers. But in a partnership with Nations Bank, which eventually, of course, became Bank of America, we developed a new transit center located at the site, it is still today, to solve a series of problems related to the passenger, you know, creating a more comfortable transit experience, a site to have all transfers into a single location, and minimize those kind of pedestrian conflicts with the automotive uh, traveler who was traveling on trade and try on. And so we feel like we solved that problem and it has served us well over the years. Next slide. But if we look today and the new challenges that we see with growth and congestion and opportunities in our uptown, we have a new series of problems that we'd want to solve in a new transit center. Next slide. We feel that there are great opportunities to reduce some of the passenger conflicts within the transit center, but also outside the transit center on trade uh, and on 4th Street. We have a rail trail. There wasn't a rail trail in the 1990s. There wasn't a Lynx Blue Line. So how do we fully integrate those two uh, facilities into a new development? And how do we activate a long-held goal of, of active Bavard Street between the Spectrum Center and the Convention Center? How do we activate that side of the street? Because it's currently not active today. And certainly the Transit Center in any new redevelopment would need to be incorporated with the surrounding land use visions and how does it catalyze that? Next slide. And what else has changed over the past almost 30 years since this center was, has been built? A lot. And you think about technology and you think about all the things that have happened in the mobile space where people's expectation is that, they, that transit and, and on-demand services are coordinated through mobile apps, that we are, you know, we're electrifying our fleet. We have the Lynx Blue Line now. And so those, also those mobility expectations need to be folded in into a new redesign of the facility. Next slide. But in order to solve all of those, in order to advance a project, we must solve the funding of that project, we must find a temporary transit center, and we must, you know, we think to activate the surrounding space as well as something that we would want to achieve in a new redeveloped transit center. Next slide. And so with that, we, we were presented with a unique opportunity with an unsolicited offer. Uh, in, in 2019, we issued a formal request for proposals, and through that uh, uh, open procurement process, we selected the Charlotte White Point Partners and Dart Interests to begin the conversation and the, to begin the development of concepts for a new transit center. And what was key to their proposal was they controlled land near the transit center that enables us to have a temporary center right across the street on 4th Street. So we're able to have that temporary keep continuing operations with uh, access to the Lynx Blue Line to the 3rd Street and the CTC station. Next slide. 
And so as we began that conversation with them, uh, we you know, selected a developer and began feasibility analysis of a series of options. And as you are well aware, we did a public input uh, throughout the month of October. We're very early in this project and this process. Uh, and, but in order to move forward in this project and process, in order to advance design, in order to begin the environmental assessment, which is a requirement of the raise grant that was awarded this project, we must have a design concept that we can move forward with, one that we can agree upon, that has broad consensus, and that we can start moving forward and refining. Next slide. So as we look to look at the various options, we had a various uh, uh, transit and mobility goals we wanted to achieve. Now certainly we must have a continuity of service in a temporary facility. We want to elevate the transit rider experience. Safety and security is a top priority, so any design would have that included. It, but it must be convenient for transit connections, for a mobility hub, a bus, light rail, and streetcar. We have the opportunity of including sustainable design and, and being, the opportunity to be integrated with a mixed use developed to create a vibrant places is very key. So the designs need to also achieve that last goal as well. Next slide. So through that early process, we studied many options uh, across the board, some that were on the same block as the transit center, some that bridged over 4th Street to the adjoining uh, block that White Point Partners uh, has control of. And we narrowed those, uh, those various options down to three main options. Next slide. One that was at grade, one that was terrace, meaning a, a, an option that bridged over 4th Street, and one we called concourse, which was just below grade, incorporated within in the building. And the circles and half circles that you see there are comparing the options with each other. And so bus to bus transfer is very important. Uh, bus to rail, safety and security, climate controlled and natural lining were all the key indicators that we wanted to evaluate to narrow down those concepts. And we focus on which option best improved the passenger experience. Uh, the terrace option, the key indicator that we felt uh, wanted us to reevaluate that it made it very difficult to accommodate the, the temporary transit center because it bridged over 4th Street and it impacted that block at White, the White Point Partners controlled. And the ad grade option we felt did not meet passenger expectations at the end of the day. It would largely be very similar to what we have today. It would be open on either ends. It would be more difficult to uh, activate Bavard Street because we still have to accommodate that active usage there. Uh, the concourse option does give us more flexibility because if we are below, we are able to extend underneath the sidewalk and gain a couple of feet. That really matters in, in the very tight spaces. So on the next slide, with those three options in this initial evaluation, this is prior to submitting to, to the raise grant. Keep in mind, we eliminated uh, the street level option. We voted to, if, to refine, continue, think about the terrace option, but wanted to advance the concourse option for the purpose of submitting the raise grant, and that's the option that was submitted uh, with that raise grant proposal. So next slide is we sought public involvement to think through uh, the revised terrace option, which became the two-level terrace option, and then the revised concourse options. These were the two options that we took out to the public throughout the month of October. And the key differences between these are natural light, the two-level option having one level that's above has more natural light coming in, uh, bus, bus operational flexibility, uh, secured climate control space and passenger experience were the really key differentiators between each of those options. I will note, because this is the one slide where you can see this in clear, the two-level terrace does require a ramp from 3rd Street over to over 4th Street to the second level that would be at the same level as, as the Lynx Blue Line. Uh, so in the concourse option would be a simple at-grade road connecting the two streets. So. Although not listed, uh, from a transit standpoint, that does make that a bit more complex from a bus routing standpoint. You tend to have two different routes that so would have to be routed. But it would make it a bit more difficult to develop the block across the street from there, having a ramp go, going across that block versus a single at-grade road. Mr. Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I thought one important category, too, from the, from the public survey was safety. So can you talk about safety in both of these options? Sure, absolutely. In the Concord. So certainly any option, we, we build a new transit center, it's going to be safe and secure. I think what it comes down to is like how uh, simple or efficient is it to maintain that safety and security. Uh, with the two level options, you have two levels that you would have to keep some, some eyes on. So 
uh, from an efficiency standpoint, that's not as efficient as a single kind of point of area to maintain uh, more entrances and more uh, opportunities for people to come in. Uh, one thing very clear we heard from outreach from our operators and from the, from the passengers is like, people only need to be in the transit center that are using transit. Right. And so the, the less opportunity for people to access the site, uh, it would could help uh, move that forward, so. Thank so you, who's responsible for safety? Is it CMPD or uh, in, in practice, how do we ensure that we get the outcome we want? So, so we have our on, on-site safety and security officials and then CMD also in partnership, we work together with, with them. So do we have any input from CMPD as to the comparison from a safety standpoint? We have an excellent partnership with uh, the police department in that. And uh, one of the early stakeholders that we discussed this with as we were talking to the uptown stakeholders was CMPD. And we have an excellent partnership with them to maintain safety and security. And throughout. did they indicate uh, between those two a preference or did they just say that we could we could deal with both of them or what was their position? What they heard from, from them is anything that limits the ability for people to just kind of free flow walk through the center and certainly with the condition that we have today, creating a space that is ticket controlled so that you're in that space, you need a ticket to be in that space, that gives them some ability to help uh, that monitoring. Ms. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. J Thank you, Mr. Chair. In other cities, um, there are parking garages that have levels for ride share um, options. Is that a consideration in this transportation center? So, Councilmember Johnson, if I understand your question, you mean like for like park and ride at this location? Not park and ride, but like Uber or Lyft. So as, as we look through, you know, that, that's, that's a good, really good question because I think that's, as we move forward with a preferred design concept, those are the things that we can really start to dig into because if we think through all the other kinds of mobility that exist today that didn't exist when this transit center was constructed in 1995, think about your scooters, think about your ride share, think about your on-demand providers. So th those are things that would have to be included in, in the design, but Picking a, low, picking a design helps us move uh, and start thinking through that more succinctly. Thank you. So on the, if we can go to the, the next slide, uh, just a, a simple kind of a diagram to, to sh the path to a recommendation. You know, we came to you in September 26 with an overarching presentation. Uh, we did engagement in October, we're here, and then we came back in November with an update of that engagement, and then we're here today uh, with the Transportation Plan to develop a community to seek your endorsement for our recommendation, and then we will go to the MTC at the end of this month uh, for a formal action by the MTC. Next slide. So, you know, by the numbers, we did a very intense uh, public outreach effort throughout the entire month of October. We engaged over 400 bus riders at, at the pop-ups at CTC. And if you really want to get a true perspective of the transit center and really understand how it operates today and what needs to be improved, spend some time in the transit center, talk to our customers, you know, experience that connection from, from Bavard Street all the way up to the Lynx Blue Line and see how that, we, if, you, if you had to do that each and every day, how that experience would unfold for you. And what we certainly heard from them is that there's, there's their sense of urgency to do something to improve that rider experience for them and how to make that better. What was most important to them was visible security presence we heard, but also more climate control and more shelter from the elements. Uh, we did a lot of public outreach through, through virtual. Uh, we have just, just under 500 at a virtual public meeting, not as many in person, which is what we're seeing, experiencing across many of our public outreach efforts. Talk to our bus operators. We went to shift changes in the morning and the afternoons to talk to our bus operators at the South Tryon and North Davidson bus garage, catching them as they go out in their shifts. And what they heard from them was like better amenities for their air, what, what their waiting area, their break room, more quiet space. You know, they, these guys are experiencing a lot of interaction with the public. Uh, would like more quiet space and understanding and better opportunities for transfer between routes. And we had just under 350 uh, completed surveys throughout the multiple efforts. Next slide. So the two options that we did Mr. take Andy, to Mr. Mitchell. Yes, sir. I apologize, Mr. Chair. Can we go back one slide? Great input, but I know we have a transit committee, part of our board of commission. Correct. Did they weigh in on a preference? 
Sure, the Transit Services Advisory Committee, yeah, we, we, we have presented them numerous, numerous times. They have not made a formal okay. uh, a, a action or approval of, of either design, but we will meet with them in, this month in January with, with this similar presentation. Are you expecting one from them? Uh, we have not, typically we have not asked them for that, but, but I, that the chair has indicated uh, a preference for making a, a option pre preference. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so the, the two options, as, if, as we've just discussed, that were presented to the public, the, the two-level terrace option, which is represented here, uh, you can see there's that where it says transit terrace, that would be kind of the street level opportunity with the gold line uh, there on Trade Street. This is looking from the spectrum blue line up on the right-hand side of this image. And then the second level, which would be at level with uh, the, the Lynx blue line. Uh, more natural light, obviously, with, with one level being above. Uh, but, uh, you know, less climate control space than you would have in a, in a more contained kind of environment. I'd also would note, too, that, you know, the ability, you know, it can be integrated within the mixed-use development, but doesn't have as that kind of more seamless kind of interaction uh, in between, you know, from a retail uh, standpoint. Next slide. So to kind of list out, this is the same information we showed to the public at the pop-ups at CTC and our public meetings. That transfer between bus routes would be a bit more challenging with two levels of bus routes. So each and every day, if you're coming in on the Route 2 and you got to go to the Route 9 and on two different levels, you would have to, to make that uh, transfer. You would have to also know that each day when you come. Uh, but it would make it somewhat easier to transfer between the Lynx Blue Line because at least one level of those 14 bays, eight of those would be at the Lynx Blue Line level. Higher amount of natural lighting, but less climate control space. From an operation standpoint, this would require us to do more circulation on street because we would have one, uh, the, 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 the uh, level at the blue line would have a ramp from 3rd Street, and then the other option would have access from Trade and 4. So you would have two different kind of entry points for routes, so the, the routing would be a bit more complicated. Uh, less efficient on the integration and mixed-use development, and at a high-level environmental uh, uh, screening, low potential for negative human natural resource impacts. Next slide. Now on the next slide, we're showing the, the concourse option. Now, of course, you know, the concourse option, this image is where the entrance through which you see concourse there to go just below street level. Uh, but you can see the, the Lynx Blue Line on the right and the City Lynx Gold Line there in front. And, and more opportunities to have that kind of integration with the Lynx Blue Line uh, at, at, at the platform level. Uh, and real opportunities to, you know, really physically, you know, integrate the Lynx Blue Line, but also improve that connection with the City Lynx Gold Line. Next slide. Uh, but from a bus transfer standpoint, very simple uh, transfer between bus routes. You're all on the same level. It's basically just going across uh, the, the, to one side of the bus space to the other. More consolidated climate control space. Single platform, more secure, reduces pedestrian conflicts. We would be able to create a more ticket controlled environment in this option. Uh, more efficient bus route, routing options and also maximizes integration with mixed use development. Similar environmental considerations as the two level, uh, but we do, you know, recognize that you know through the design process we'd have to pay you know kind of careful attention to air quality, but that will be I mean, we feel it mitigated by our electrification of our bus fleet. Next slide. So as we summed up that public feedback and started comparing those two options with one another, they're similar in many ways, and, but, but I think the key differences are the bus-to-bus -bus transfer is clearly a winner with the concourse option. Uh, the bus-to-rail is, is a bit more better on the uh, two-level terrace. Both options we feel will be safe and secure, but higher and, and better, more climate-controlled opportunities for the concourse and more natural lighting on the two-level, but we do feel we can mitigate some of that uh, natural lighting uh, through design for a concourse. The green check marks there indicate where the public weighed in on this. Uh, public was fairly evenly divided between two, two options, in, in the bus operators as well, but there was a slight advantage and slight preference, you know, somewhere around the 52 to 54 percent range for the concourse option from the public surveys that we received. Next slide. So before we go on to that, um, we have experienced in the last you know, year or two through COVID uh, uh, declines in ridership. Uh, operations, but we don't currently have a CEO at CATS. A, a certain very tall local reporter has uh, extensively covered these issues, who's looking at his phone. Uh, <laughs> hi, Steve. So, um, 
Are there any questions about our bus service that need to be answered before we can confidently choose between these solutions? Are there any implications for the work that we may still need to do uh, on our bus service for the correct solution here between these two options? Sure. Well, I certainly from a ridership standpoint, I mean, every transit agency has certainly experienced declines throughout the country. You know, certainly we've, we've experienced our own challenges with that here. Uh, our rail ridership has, has improved uh, to a point that we're somewhere around 60% recovery, buses hovering around 50% <clears throat> in recovery. We've seen some slight improvements over the past couple of months, and we do that. We think that's in large part to the changes we made in August to improve reliability of our services, because we were missing a lot of trips prior to August. Um, I think to really improve the bus experience is to improve the passenger experience. And I think with the plan that we have in place to focus on high frequency corridor routes that, that come to mobility hubs, that, that serve on-demand services, that, come, that bring people to high frequency services is the vision that we need to move forward with and one that has been adopted. Uh, I think improving the transit center is a big piece of that by improving the passenger experience there. Uh, putting the power of technology and trip planning and fare payment, all those things in the hands of, of our customers through our mobile apps and other technologies will be really important going forward. But I think it's improving the reliability, improving the quality of the service is how we also improve our ridership overall. Right. And I think we need to continue to work on that. But specifically, I'm just saying as we choose between these two design options, <clears throat> Is there any chance that later on, when we've done more work on the bus system, we think different about uh, which of these two options? Or, or can we confidently choose now and know that nothing that we're going to do uh, to you know, change our bus service would have been better if we'd done it the other way? I think it, in, in that context, I think it comes down to the operations side of it. The, the concourse is simpler from an operations standpoint. Uh, as a single point of entry, it, it has a, a one road that connects into a better ramp, less circulation that we have to experience. Uh, we have we have opportunities to kind of control the, that single space a bit more efficiently. I think from from that standpoint, I don't think the, the, that's not a differentiating factor between either two options. I think it's important to pick a design and move forward. Uh, I think both options can achieve our vision, but we do think the concourse one, you know, from and that and from the public standpoint, does. Lean. At the center, uh, I think there are 12 or 14 bays in the concourse solution. But both options are 14. Today we have around 21 bays at the current center. But you know, our vision already today is starting to disperse that transfer. And we have transit centers at South Park, at Eastland, at Rosa Parks. And then we think each light rail station is in effect its own transit centers, 26 stations throughout. This just happens to be the largest one throughout there from a transit standpoint. So I think the the dispersing of the network to bet what well, we certainly have heard from people. Some people still need to come downtown, but that first survey we did with the public in early October indicated that somewhere around 30 percent still indicated places outside uptown that would they would prefer to do their transfer. And that's completely consistent with our with our vision. But in fact, these two solutions are similar <clears throat> in terms of capacity, like the number of bays and so on. Yes, correct. So, so uh, uh, as we move ahead and decide how much to concentrate uptown, uh, the choice that we make between these two is not going to make a big difference. We, we could handle any conclusions we reach at either outcome. Yeah, yeah. From a from a just purely thinking through how uh, from a capacity of bays, the two options are, are similar. Right. Uh, but how efficiently we operate and circulate through Uptown, which has impacts to other things as far as like street activation, the two level option does require more uh, bus circulation, more routing throughout Uptown, whereas the concourse has a more simpler uh, single point. Okay, if there's nobody else, uh, Ms. Dodson, are you going to talk about the next slide? You want to keep going? Or you wanna, <coughs> I'm going to chime in a little bit. Yeah, so, well, we <coughs> wanted to, if you go to the next slide, and I'll, I'll kick this off and hand over to Trace. I just want to give you a frame of, of how this will be, because we have to solve the funding piece for this, too. Yeah, there's been some question, what would it cost cats if we were to build our own, you know, just go alone, build our own transit center? Uh, I think it's obvious that that would not be integrated with the development. It would be similar to what we have today. Unlikely that we would receive a grant like the raise grant because you know part of what we got that for was this integration piece 
Uh, and the land value would not be a funding source, so that land value would be locked into that facility because it would still be a publicly owned piece of property. Uh, but the integrated uh, transit center, and it just to go back, the, we estimate that would be somewhere between 45 to 55 million for, for a new transit center, just, you know, early estimate. We still would have to find a temporary transit center location. It would need to be near a Lynx Blue Line station. So that's very complicated as far as finding like a parking lot or a space that we could do that because then, then we would have to go through a lease or a purchase to accommodate that. Uh, an integrated transit center, the concourse of two level are estimated somewhere just, you know, just under 90 million. Uh, but we get to leverage the land value, we get to leverage uh, the raised grant, and then CATS is, you know, putting 12 million towards the temporary transit center and other uh, operating needs. So th what I'll add to that is um, what you would not see, and just to hit on this um, a little bit more directly, the new transportation center, if you just did the transportation center, you most likely would not leverage the raise grant at 15 million, the land value at 27 million, and the developers intended on paying market rate for the land value, um, as well as the tax increment grant. So you have about 62 million right there that would not be realized in that capital stock if you did just the transit center by itself. <clears throat> With the integrated, you then are able to, to leverage those three additional items. So some say, why would we spend more? But again, to what Jason has been hitting on, we can accomplish more, and we also have other revenue sources by um, doing something that's vert vertically integrated. I think there's, uh, yes, Mr. Mitchell, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. So, so Tracy, the land value, you mentioned that uh, a developer would not allow us to put our land value part of the deal? No, 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 it would be. Oh, it would They're, be, okay. They would pay market rate, yes. Got it, okay, <laughs> okay, I'm glad for clarification. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank but, you. But also, uh, for this meeting, we're talking about the comparison between two options, right, yes. design options. Correct. The comparison with the first point up there is part of a subsequent conversation that needs to incorporate uh, the practice facility, the naming rights, and uh, so just for the benefit of the committee, I've made it clear that uh, we are not there yet in right. terms of uh, having everything we need for a decision about the overall P3, the project. Uh, what we want to try to establish today is which of the two options that are the finalists uh, uh, we would prefer if we go ahead so that the design work can proceed while we still consider to evaluate the other aspects of the transaction. That is correct. And in a couple slides ahead, you will see, I will walk you through the steps of okay. kind of where we go from here. Right. Mr. Graham. I don't, want to get, I don't want to get ahead of you, but again, going back to the practice facility, can both options accommodate both? Done more study on the practice facility being incorporated into the concourse. Um, <clears throat> Then we have the um, terrace option. We have looked at it with the terrace option. It gets a little bit more complicated, but I believe that it can be incorporated into both. And considering that the practice facility may be in both, um, does that enhance the, the type of security preparation for the building? It's, I would say for either option, it's about, this, it's about the same. What we have looked at with the practice facility or what are their, are their needs, separate, separate entrance, that kind of thing, secured yeah. parking. But I think overall in terms of the security is the way we're talking about it for a catch ride or things like that, it doesn't increase. So I, I guess that's my, my question. Have, we, uh, have they been approached about both options and talked about those issues, which is, you know, <clears throat> We have not gone extensively with them through the terrace option. We have spent time understanding their needs as it relates to if they went onto the site and did that fit within the concourse option because that was the one that we were kind of leaning towards at the, at the time. What we've been doing since this summer when you worked on and voted on the Hornets deal is really trying to lock in on a footprint. So it's been more internal focused of what is, what is the size of the <clears throat> footprint that they need. And both, both takes into consideration that question? Yes. So the terrace option, you would have two levels above ground that were devoted to, to the buses. Mm -hmm. And then whatever development occurred above that might or might not include a practice facility. There could Correct. be development above that, and it could include a practice facility. 
but that's one of the things that we will talk about when we get further into the uh -huh. other choices we have to make. Yes. All right. So if you remember when we did the when we did the Hornet still last summer, we always said there was option A and option B. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> that if we wanted what I was asking to do was to pursue option A first and if for some reason that does not work or council's not comfortable with the CTC project moving forward, we always had option B and we can pivot to option B. Um, and then you remember in that conversation, we've always said that this was a transit project first. Mm -hmm. So we, we kind of separate them and now we're about the, at, almost at the time where we're bringing them back together. You, you, you're going to have to, right? Yeah. 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 We will. So if yeah. we can go for, I think we can probably skip yeah. the yeah. next right. slide in the interest of time. There we go. Um, and as Jason said today, and please chime in, Jason, mm -hmm. um, what we really need the discussion on today is a recommendation on the location of the bus so that we can continue to build out that broader vision. Um, the terrace concept as well as the concourse concept, you know, they both impact the, the overall development, the overall district, all of these components that we've been talking about. And so we're at that place where if we can understand that, we can continue to inch along um, with the project as, as a whole. It's a great point, Tracy, and I think that, you know, I was, me and my family took a walk down south in yesterday, and it was just amazing the type of integration of development that's happened there with the Lynx Blue Line. I think at East West, they're actually attaching the wires to the building. You can't get more integrated than that. But if you look in Uptown, they're outside of the Weston, you know, the, the Brooklyn Village Station, not many of the stations have had that opportunity to really integrate with the Blue Line Station. The Ninth Street Station has the university campus. Seventh, most of those stations were already, there's development was already built around it. So here there's in the recommendation, you know, we feel from a transit perspective must also solve those needs, but it must also support that broader vision as well to, for, and, and give the most opportunity for integration with the mixed use development. So on the next slide, we have our staff recommendation that we recommend the concourse option as the preferred design for the redevelopment of the Charlotte Transportation Center based upon it has more climate controlled space, more efficient secured space, seamless transfer between bus routes, provides that maximum integration with development, and the access, you know, I talked about that road that would connect third and fourth uh, compared to the two level where you have to have a ramp in that space. That ramp would potentially cause a barrier between development between uh, parcels and the blue line. So a simple road certainly helps with that place making opportunities and we do believe that the concourse option best supports the goals of the surrounding development opportunities because it's not just the customer experience, it's the, everyone who experiences everything around that, that space in that future district. Uh, we also recommend that through the design process that we can continue to incre increase the climate control space and natural light. And then in include emerging autonomous vehicle technology to assist operators. Now, I'm not talking about on the street, but as they enter the facility to help them navigate and go to the bays, there's a lot of new technology by the time this building would be complete that could help them like operate that kind of like the turning movement set in there to kind of free out any kind of error that would occur inside the facility. There's a lot of good technology occurring in the test environment. And we'd like to continue to explore that with this development. Uh, we also inc incorporate sustainable design, electrical vehicle charging, are all things that we recommend to continue to be evaluated as we go through design. Mr. Mitchell. Staff, I, I, I totally support the recommendation, but I, I think there's a bigger win for us. And word, in words matter how we communicate this to our, our citizens. And I think we're leaving out customer. Mm -hmm. This is input from our customer, from our passengers. So I think this is a good opportunity to extend the Olive Branch to our ridership. We appreciate you. Thank you for riding our bus. And because of your input, this is the recommendation. So can we make sure Absolutely. we capture that as well? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so with that, if we want to go to the yeah. next slide, Tracy, can I have the next step? So this kind of hits um, Council Member Driggs to what you were talking about is what we're really looking at today is, again, that recommendation on the transit center design concept. The next step we would then go into with you all is to talk about the framework for a public-private partnership. This looks at the financial structure for the public infrastructure. It looks for the opportunity and the need of the district and the Hornets practice facility. It also looks at the larger community benefit. Jason did a great job hitting on it, but if you think about what's um, poised to come online in the next several years um, and, and that aerial that Jason started with, there's a, there's a void of development here, and you have the pedestrian bridge over 277 
um, that is, you know, in the works, in design. You have uh, the Pearl and the Innovation District in the work there, and Second Ward um, Public-Private Partnership um, there. We will all start to see some of these things come to fruition, and so um, the ability to be able to talk about what that can do, not just for the arena across the street, but this larger area and what Brevard Street can become, um, I think could serve a larger community benefit. <clears throat> From there, we would then talk about the process for council approvals. Take the framework for the public-private partnership as we've discussed that with you all and st other stakeholders, then shaping that into a memorandum of understanding. That would come back for a council vote. And then taking that as we're also doing um, some of the environmental work and advanced planning on the design, really locking into our cost and the process and what all is included in it, and then working towards a master development agreement, which again would come back for further discussion to committee and council. So really what this shapes up to be is a conversation with you all throughout 2023. Um, this is not, I just, I really wanted to spend a minute on this because this is not a one and done. These are baby steps towards the larger project and how we build out the larger project. Mr. Mitchell. Tracy, thank you. Uh, so let me just, I, I agree with kind of Council McGram, uh, just making sure whether they're separate projects, but they got to be integrated. So Tracy, the Hornet practice facility, uh, is there a deliverable date we have to have that for our stakeholder? So the way that their LOI um, was stated and kind of the framework of which we brought something to you all, um, was that they really wanted to see a practice facility in, in 2026, but the end of 2027, fourth quarter 2027 was kind of that, that, that drop dead date. What we have looked at in a schedule here is really a delivery in 2028. So we're pretty close okay. within a couple months. Now I'll be honest, I was on the, on the phone with the Hornets the week of Christmas, right. having a very similar discussion. And until we can start to move some of these pieces along, I can't really give them a schedule. Okay. Um, what we had really hoped was that as we finalize the agreements with them, um, which we have been doing, we're still in the process of doing, as we work through um, answering a lot of the questions of what did they want in a practice facility, okay. then we would have more clarity on the CTC project and understand more if we needed to take that footprint and pivot it to plan B or that we could pursue it with um, the CTC site. Follow up, May. Yeah. So if we take the Concourse Transit Center, your construction schedule is 2024 through 2029, temporary and permanent. And Trace, I just want to make sure, so we're going to have two construction projects going on in that same space at the same time. I just want to throw a little caution. You all got to really work together and coordinate those efforts. Mm -hmm. um, is, and I'm Trace, I'm actually a softball, but, so you got to help. Would it be your desire that we have one, one construction team to do both, or are you okay having one construction team do the transit center, one to do the Hornets? Ideally, you would have it all integrated because if the way you thought about it, it it's essentially the same core and shell mm -hmm. for the whole building, right. a different interior of it. Okay. Um, and that was it, part of why we actually looked at that because that's some of the efficiencies <clears throat> with integrating it into a larger, a larger development. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Graham, Tracy, uh, understanding that you said this is going to be a year-long process, what, what, what's in store for the first quarter in terms of some of these decision-making metrics? So if you go to the next slide, what I'd love to do is, and, and this is totally um, up, to, up to committee, is have this discussion come back in February and have this discussion for the framework and the public-private partnership. What are the things we've heard from you all that are still questions? really diving into some of those things like the Hornets. Um, you know, I think we've heard uh, the public safety component, how would that be addressed in, in the overall project? Some of these other kind of open-ended questions that it's been hard for us to really answer because we haven't had a set location for the, for the bus facility of how it all integrates. So come back and have that discussion and then start to talk about a framework. Ideally, you do an MOU yeah, as we talk about the framework that leads to the framework for the MOU, you do that in first quarter. And then you spend, I would say, second quarter, maybe most of third quarter, working through the design, trying to get to the MDA. 
Okay. So well, we yeah. want to make it a consistent yeah. discussion. Yeah. Just a quick com comment. Um, I, I support the staff recommendation uh, as well. Um, I, I think there the devil's in the details mm -hmm. on a lot of this for sure. Um, but just wanted to um, ask a quick question, and it's about the Charlotte Gateway Station in terms of the timeline for both, right? The completion date for both. Um, I'm, I'm looking at this thing at 30,000 feet, and you got this happening over here, and you got the gateway station. Is there any synergy in terms of completion dates, timelines? They uh, should line up pretty closely um, together. And again, it's, it's a matter of getting both projects going. Um, but they should they should line up pretty pretty close. I, I think you know again I'm again I'm looking at it at thirty thousand feet, not just one project. Looking at our whole transportation network uptown as we talk about where the train comes in and stuff like that. I, I think now that the state has actually beat us in terms of getting the train to the station, there should be a station, right? And so <laughs> yes, there I, should. <laughs> I, I just want to kind of make sure that somehow that that we're looking at this thing at a 30,000 feet and there are a lot of moving components as relates to transportation all um, emerging with uptown and I just want to make sure that there's some synergy between all three of the projects so they're huge impact projects. Yeah. And if I could just comment on that, one of the advantages of the LPA is that it avoids a delay at the gateway station uh, because of the For fact sure. that we had progressed so far much further. We allocated $50 million to design, uh, and uh, so if we did adopt something other than the locally preferred alternative, a whole bunch of stuff would have to be rethought, and there would be more uncertainty because there's work that we haven't done on the alternatives and, and yet. And that's, that's my 30,000 feet, right? Yeah, I, so I, I think that I, ties in. I kind of made that support your recommendation because we can continue to move forward without <laughs> literally stopping it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's track, and it's also there's a bigger picture that I'm looking at. Hopefully, the council is too, uh, in terms of how all these puzzle pieces fit and when they fit. It's a puzzle, is for sure. Yes. So uh, I do want to recognize our uh, honorary committee member, Commissioner <laughs> Altman, and I will note uh, Miss Altman is a member of the MTC and of CartPo and handles transportation for the county. So you are welcome here. If you have a question, please let us know. Thank you so much for indulging me. It's really helpful to hear it here before we go and hear it at the MTC. And you know, I uh, we all have the goal of increasing ridership, and I really you know want to do everything I can to um, create a culture that that encourages all of our residents to use mass transit, not only people who need to depend on public transit, but everybody. That's the goal I think we're all sort of driving towards. And I, I look at both of these decisions that are upcoming through that, that sort of lens, and I guess I would be interested to know, you know, although transit is the primary goal, making this an attractive destination that people want to go and hang out and, 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 and travel through and there's other things there they're going to want to do. When you um, look at the, the decision about the two, t two level terrace or the concourse, do you, back to Chairman Driggs's question, do you feel like one of these is more likely to create an environment that is sort of vibrant for other commerce and amenities that you know, that's one of my questions. So, so based on the design between the two, um, and I'm putting my economic development hat onto it, the concourse option, and I've said this in previous committee meetings, if you think about really trying to limit all the interaction on two levels between street level, pedestrians, bus, train, and anybody just passing through, if, if it's a hotel, a visitor to the hotel, if it's an office, you know, the office user, um, Pulling that between three levels um, and having you know the, the blue line where it is, having the street level with the pedestrian and the gold line, and then having the bus below grade really does create this unique opportunity to integrate retail into it. And so, the way the concourse design is done is that if you're a, a bus rider, the retail is a, is above you. You can pass through that. If you're an office worker that's happened to be there, you can pass through that retail on the way to the train or from the train to the bus or to the train to the street level, um, that you have this, that integration into that. We also think that when you split them between the three levels, it creates more square footage for that retail 
to be, which creates a bigger opportunity for this kind of district and this destination place. Um, Commissioner Altman, I don't think you've heard me say it, but when this started, this conversation started several years ago for me, I was having a conversation with the Hornets about concerns that they had around the arena and the outside of the arena. Um, it wasn't that it was coming from CTC, but there was a lot of loitering going on and things like that. So what one of the issues they were having is people were coming to the arena, they were going in, and then they were leaving, and they weren't using the plaza space or things like that. Um, simultaneously, there was a discussion between the former owners of the epicenter and CTC about similar concerns in the area. And so what we see with some of these designs um, and the opportunity is to really try to create something that's more of a destination for the community rather than just a bus facility or just a transit facility, that the arena will now start to live beyond its walls out into um, this district concept. That's very helpful. And then just last question. Do you, you know, as I try to imagine what the uh, concourse experience would feel like, how would it be similar or different to the experience of, for example, being in the subway in New York City, which I've, you know, all of us have, a lot of us have experience with. It's underground, it's ticketed. I, I don't know if it's climate controlled, you know, I don't know about the security, but how would you say it's <laughs> similar or different? than that experience, which we may all, many of us may have, you know, experience I, with. I, I think the similarities may end like that they're both maybe below street level. I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, the, if you think about the ceiling, you know, you almost, people might be more much shorter back then when it was 100 years ago it was made, but it's a very short ceiling when you're in there. It's very, you know, uh, in some places kind of confined. Uh, this would be more open. You, you would have, you would be able to see the street. Uh, once you go into the facility, you know, there'll be interest from trade and be interest from forth. Uh, so I, I, I don't, I wouldn't think they're very similar in that concept. And think about this would be in kind of an open kind of plaza below ground and then bus bays on the outside of that uh, versus just coming into a platform area. Thank you very much. I noticed our New York colleague nodding vigorously at that question. <laughs> it's a hundred year old system, okay? Um, so uh, with the original I, I, I'm going to just comment uh, in my conversations with staff, I noted that uh, going forward we're going to we still have to talk about things like the turn, how the are the wood point relationship came about, uh, what the temporary facility would look like, the hornets financing p three terms, naming rights. so there are a bunch of things that, that we have heard about, but I don't believe we are really kind of informed enough about or have have thought about coherently. So right now, what I'm wondering is, is there a motion by a member of the committee that our future work on the CTC include only the concourse option for the bus station. So move, Mr. Chair. Second. Okay, all in favor of the motion. Any discussion of the motion? All in favor, please say aye. Raise your hand, actually. We got two online. And uh, two online. Ms. Anderson is not with Yes, us. and Ms. Anderson, Ms. Anderson is, is not, not here. Okay, so that's, that's four, I guess. Uh, is she properly excused? I guess that counts as a 4-0 vote, right, with her not voting? She's a yes vote. Uh, well, it is in full council meetings. Oh, I'm not right. sure in committee. So we'll, we'll figure out what that means. But we have the votes we need anyway. And so <laughs> I don't know that we need a, a full council vote on this one. Um, so I will simply report to the council tonight that the committee recommended it and ask if there's a... Uh, if there are any objections, or, or we can talk about how we communicate with yes, the full sir. council yes, later. Yes, sir, and we're prepared to come and, and discuss this with council and give them the presentation that the committee just heard. Uh, Commissioner Altman, I'm afraid honorary members don't get a vote, but we appreciate your uh, participating today, nor do reporters. Um, and with that, uh, is there any other business for the committee? Move for adjournment, Mr. Chair. All right. All in favor, stand up and leave, please. Yes.
beans. Studio, I believe we're ready to go live. Okay. We're live, Madam Chair. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I hope your New Year is starting off pretty well. Uh, we do have a packed agenda. First, I'd like to pause for introductions. Uh, starting with committee members, I'll start. Dimple Ajmera, committee chair. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. James Mitchell, Vice Chair. Luana Mayfield, committee member. Other committee members, if, if others have not joined, let's go ahead and start with uh, our staff who is in the room and then we'll introduce the ones who are attending virtually. Dana Fenton with the city manager's office. Lena James, deputy city attorney. Patrick Baker, city attorney. Ryan Bergman, budget director. Braxton Winston, mayor pro tem. Marie Harris. I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Marie Harris, strategy and budget. Talia, strategy and budget. I see we have Mayor Mar Laos. Uh, she has joined. So I just want to recognize um, that she's she's listening to the committee's conversations. Anyone else uh, virtually that we have missed? Okay. Well, if not, let's go ahead and get started. For today's meeting, the committee will discuss three topics. Uh, Mr. Fenton will present the first item on our legislative agenda for consideration of the proposed federal and state legislative agendas and the next steps for our engagement planning with the General Assembly. Well, depending on the committee's feedback today, we will ask full council to consider our recommendation uh, tonight and ask for approval from council later this month. And then second topic we have is continuation of our discussion on governance from our last committee meeting, where city attorney, Mr. Baker, will um, walk us through our discussion on uh, changes to form of government. And depending on the will of the committee, we can take an action today to move it forward to the full council. And last item that we have, uh, we have our budget director, Mr. Bergman. He will begin talking about our budget uh, process and uh, populating our upcoming budget planning agenda. So that's so. As you can see, we have a fully packed agenda. So, Mr. Fenton, uh, if you would like to go ahead and get started here. Thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. Good afternoon. For the record, I'm Dana Fenton with the City Manager's Office, and uh, we're going to be. Uh, uh, going over the uh, proposed legislative agendas and we're going to be asking the committee to take action to propose agendas to the City Council. Uh, but just a little bit of uh, background here. Uh, since you started meeting in October, the committee has received legislative updates and of course last month we received the staff proposed legislative request. And the focus of, this, of the proposed positions is squarely on your adopted city strategic priorities transportation, public safety, immigration, sustainability, and resilience. Uh, you've done a lot of work in the last several years um, coming up with some uh, uh, very wide-ranging strategic plans, and that is what uh, this is focusing on. We also looked at the potential of recommending for inclusion issues that had, that had been raised with the former Intergovernmental Relations Committee, but were not advanced for various reasons. Uh, when he was a co-chair of that committee, uh, Councilmember Bakari referred to these issues as the parking lot. And uh, we'll be watching some of those in the weeks ahead 
because I know that there's a few other council committees that are looking at some things. The housing is meeting today, uh, talking about some potential issues. And then also the county's intergovernmental relations committee will be meeting later this week or next week to discuss their proposed legislative request. Uh, they have not actually, their staff has not presented anything yet to the committee. So uh, it'll be sort of a, um, a surprise perhaps to see what they have to come up with. Madam Chair, I have a quick question for Mr. Fenton. Yes, Ms. Mayfield, go ahead. Thank you. Mr. Fenton, can you share with the committee via email when the county will be having their meeting in case any of us want would like to attend? I will do that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And also, we'll be watching the county as well to see if there's any issues that, uh, that are common to both the city and county uh, where we can be joining hands to work together. And overview for today, uh, the, um, again, uh, we'll, we'll start off with the proposed legislative agendas and then get to the engagement strategy. Uh, next slide, please. And next slide, too. Uh, this is the committee motion that we would uh, request that you consider later today, and we have all the different uh, positions uh, outlined below, whether it's federal or state. And also, before you take up the motion, it would probably be beneficial for me to review each of these issues with you. I know last meet, month's meeting uh, uh, was a little bit rushed, so <laughs> I'll be glad to. Next slide, please. Uh, let's talk about the federal legislative agenda items that are proposed for you. The first is Destination CLT, and this is the, this is the uh, airport's capital improvement program. And this is, uh, this is consistent with the airport master plan that was approved back in 2016. And over the last city of several years, the city council, aviation staff, and the city's lobbying team have been working together to advance these airfield projects. And we think we're getting pretty close to uh, having the airport submit a letter of intent uh, that would uh, assure that federal funding for construction of the fourth parallel runway and the north and north and south and around taxi ways, air, taxiways would be provided. And we expect that to be filed before March 1 of 2023. And then the bipartisan infrastructure law has uh, the airport terminal program uh, for competitive grants for terminal facilities at the airport. And uh, Charlotte Douglas has been very active in that. They submitted one for 2022 and have just submitted another one for the 2023 round. Next slide, please. Uh, the next position is the 2030 Transit Corridor System Plan, and this is a uh, this is a a regional position in, in for the MTC. The members uh, have adopted this as their um, as their legislative statement uh, over the last several years, and uh, what it does, it, we we do cover the the rapid transit projects that are in the 2030 Transit Corridor Plan. The, whether it's the gold line, the um, silver line, the red line for funding. And we will continue, of course, working with the delegation to advance these projects so that they're in a position to get federal funding at some point in the future. Of course, uh, I'd be remiss to say that we would still need to get a, another local source of revenue uh, to match those federal funds. And so that's, that makes the uh, work at the state uh, this coming session uh, that much more important. And then also, uh, CATS is always looking at uh, grant opportunities. Uh, and they have, uh, they, there's a wide range of, of grants they can apply for from the federal government, whether it's the uh, ones that are devoted just to transit or to even to multimodal projects. Next slide, please. Immigration. Uh, this is the position essentially you've all had in effect since uh, 2019 or 2020. And uh, a lot of the work that was done on, with the ad hoc Council Committee on Integration and also the uh, Charlotte Compact on Immigration passed in 2019 is incorporated into this agenda statement. Uh, the, really the big thing here to point out to you is that bottom bullet, support increased funding, support of resettlement organizations as they work with refugees in our community. There have been a lot of refugees coming through the last couple of years and uh, a lot of the resettlement organizations really need to have additional federal funding uh, to help uh, with that uh, cost are going up around here with housing and transportation and things like that. Uh, and then, but also just to let you know that uh, two weeks ago, the 
in the final appropriations bill that the Congress passed and the President has signed into law that uh, there is uh, an $800 million program established uh, to help with uh, uh, refugee resettlement around the country. A lot of that funding will go to the larger cities that have borne the brunt of the refugees, but there certainly is uh, a possibility of uh, being able to secure some funding through that. Madam Chair? Yes, Mr. Mitchell? Uh, I have one question, please. Sure, go ahead. So, so Dane, I know in the past uh, this has been kind of a bill that we have made a top priority for years, mm -hmm. but has the climate changed now? Do we have bipartisan support uh, for immigration? Yeah, at, at the end of this, the Congress had just adjourned uh, last month. Uh, Senator Tillis had said that he thought that, that the last quarter of 2022 would have been the best time to have gotten some of these changes. Unfortunately, they were not able to get those changes in. There still is a lot of bit of uh, rancor between the two sides. Uh, you have one side that wants more border protection measures, the other side, uh, you know, providing pathways to citizenship for, for, uh, for immigrants. And uh, that, um, and his, his thought that, that uh, the incoming Congress would not have been as, um, uh, in fact, the incoming Congress is taking office right now as we speak, that they, they would not be as amenable to addressing these issues. Thank you. Madam Chair, uh, Mayor Pro Tem has a question. Yes, Mr. Winston. I think it's um, just more of a comment, just piggybacking on you, with the questions you asked, Mr. Mitchell. Um, uh, we sat with Mr. Tillis's uh, staff uh, in Washington um, last year, and we had a long conversation about immigration. So I was very pleased um, that he led that bipartisan effort. Um, and he, and if you just kind of paid attention to his comments in the press, it was in relation to feedback he was getting from his constituents. So. I certainly want to attribute specifically to the work that we did. Um, I, I would just um, provide that context um, that the, this legislative agenda is very important um, and the way we present it seems to have an effect. So I was pleased to see, even though it failed, um, that effort um, was, was made. Yeah, and thank you, Mr. Winston, for highlighting that. Um, I certainly appreciate the work Senator Tom Tillis has been doing on the immigration in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, we have received, at least our office has received number of requests on H-1B visa program and the delays. And I have forwarded some of those requests over to his office and they have been able to assist in advocating and also addressing some of the concerns. So I really appreciate the work he has been doing in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, and certainly I appreciate the additional funding that was approved. Uh, Mr. Fenton, keep those updates coming. Um, I know some of the additional funding was approved to help organizations uh, with uh, resettlement um, efforts, especially with housing, uh, housing cost going up, uh, those that funding is much needed. So that's where the federal and state legislative agenda item is so critical in the work that we do to create a safe place for everyone and also to move our mobility plan forward. So it's just so critical. I appreciate the work here. Thank you. Uh, the next slide, please. Sustainability and resilience. Uh, this is, uh, this is a relatively new position. We had it as part of another part of the agenda in the last couple of years, but we've separated it out to, to highlight its importance to us. And the federal government has put a lot of funding into uh, sustainability and resilience, whether it's through the bipartisan infrastructure law or the Inflation Reduction Act that has a lot of tax credits in there for, uh, for, this, for these issues. And, and we'll be looking at fleet electrification and Okay, uh, take a look at energy efficiency issues, environmental justice, of course, and workforce development. Councilmember Mayfield. Ms. Mayfield. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dana, when we're looking at environmental justice, do we have an opportunity in this conversation to also review landfills 
and locations of landfills. Councilmember Mitchell and I were able to attend a meeting where, which we didn't know, we didn't realize that landfills can be associated in relative close proximity in residential R3. And we have one particular area, even though it's in the ETJ, there's already two landfills and there's conversations of a third landfill. If we're talking about environmental justice, Mm -hmm. Somewhere in there, we need to be able to have the conversation around the placement of landfills based on the needs of today. Do we have the bandwidth to have that specific bullet added into this conversation? Uh, I, th I think what you're just getting to the issues of landfills in general, I think, I think the equity and governance framework that you all adopted last month may be of help with that. I'd have to take a closer look at it. And certainly the location of, of landfills has become uh, a very high level issue, high visibility issue, I should say. So I think that definitely uh, things like that, uh, uh, what you have your, for your framework would, would be very helpful to that. And Mr. Fenton, while you're looking at that, also if we can look at adding that for our state legislative agenda, if that is appropriate. Um, and. Uh, as you know, that council adopted and approved CAP a couple of years ago, Strategic Energy Action Plan, and we are making strides in achieving some of those goals. However, we did see a recent uh, significant cost increase in our energy generation project that we have, Green Advantage Pro Program. And I was wondering if there are additional federal or state resources that we could look at to fill that gap that we currently have to meet our 2030 goals of going carbon free for at least our city operations. In terms of the, uh, uh, the CAP and trying to meet our goals, the federal government has far more resources than the state of North Carolina does. Um, the, the, uh, the state is, is trying to grow economically uh, and uh, and so their, their focus is on that, whereas the federal government is focused on the, uh, the things that we're talking about here. So I don't think you we would have as much luck if we added something like that to our state legislative agenda, but it certainly is something that we can watch for. And whenever uh, grant proposals come along from the state uh, that I get a, get a hold of or our team at KTS Strategies does, we always do send those to the relevant departments. Also, I would say that uh, the, uh, that, that of course, the, also the environmental programs that the bipartisan infrastructure law has, a lot of those are being uh, administered by the state and our, for, for example, Charlotte's, Charlotte Water already does a pretty good job of, of accessing those, those loans. Great, thank you, Mr. Friend. Thank you. And uh, turning to the next slide, um, We'll start with the uh, uh, first item in the state, proposed state legislative agenda having to do with mobility. This is essentially the same position as the council adopted two years ago. And we were stressing that uh, we want to enable the voters to make a decision on a new source of funding for transit and for roadways and greenways, bicycle, uh, pedestrian systems here in the county. And also, we have a second bullet. Uh, you may have heard about the issue about the bonding issue. And uh, we really use that uh, authority to issue revenue bonds because the bonds we issue now will be a higher rate of interest and they're less attractive to the marketplace overall. So this would do a lot, uh, do us a lot of good if we were able to get this as well. Uh, next slide, please. State transportation funds. Uh, we're focused here on the fair allocation of state transportation funding, whether it's for the Strategic Transportation Investments Program or for the Powell Bill Program. Uh, you know about the issues we've had with the Powell Bill for the last few years. Uh, in terms of the Strategic Transportation Investments Program, the actual formula now is in great shape. They have a problem with money, getting money into the system. That's why you've seen a contraction of projects in the last couple of years, because they don't have enough money overall for the projects that they had uh, previously chosen. But our, our staff believes that, um, that uh, there were more projects selected 
for inclusion in those plans than had been before because of the new formula, which uh, favors uh, data-driven things like uh, uh, the cars, the <laughs> number of cars on the road, uh, and that type of thing. And uh, next slide, please. And the final position on the state side is Safe Charlotte. Uh, support, this is based on your uh, Safe Charlotte plan from 2020. And support policies, increase resources, the further initiatives to lower crime, increase public safety, and redeploy resources to their highest, best, highest and best use. And an issue here that uh, has been, a lot of work has been done on this already this year is to uh, provide police departments with the authority to establish uh, non-sworn units to investigate uh, traffic crashes. Uh, the cities of Wilmington and Fayetteville already have this authority. They've had it since 2007, I believe, and it has worked quite well for them. Uh, a lot of work, again, had to go into this. There, uh, earlier this year, uh, actually last year now, uh, in the short session, there was legislation that was filed for the city of Greenville. Uh, it was not passed. But as you heard some things from folks out there. They're, they talked about this fire being defunding the police. So a lot of those issues had to be dealt with, and we think they're taken care of now. Mr. Fenton, uh, while we are discussing Safe Charlotte, uh, this aligns with our safety initiatives. I know Mr. Uh, well, Chief Jennings had submitted a request, and uh, they were going to initiate a bill on working with our judicial system. Uh, is that something we need to add to our legislative agenda or that would be independent of our legislative agenda that he's working on uh, while collaborating with other municipalities and our judicial system? Yeah, that's a great question. At this point, uh, Madam Chair, I, I spoke with the Chief Jennings uh, the week ago on Friday, right before the holidays, and um, and they're not at a point yet where they can say that they have consensus. They've been, they have um, draft legislation prepared that they're shopping around. There's a lot more work to do on it. And if they get forward, if they move forward with it, um, they, uh, this is something that you could possibly add to the, the agenda. And uh, that's, that's very easy. We could put another bullet in here for it. But at this point, they're not ready to go. And we don't even know whether they're gonna be able to gain consensus on this or not. Got it. Okay, so we can amend it later if there is a consensus um, with other municipalities and judicial system. Yeah, and also, speaking of the judicial system, Madam Chair, um, is that uh, there's going to be a lot of discussions with not just the local judicial system, but also with statewide groups like the administrative office of the courts at the state, uh, the conference of district attorneys, uh, the Police Chiefs Association, the Sheriff's Association, and, and, and other groups like that. So uh, at the point when I talked with the chief a week and a half ago, they had not gotten to that point yet. Uh, no. Madam, Madam Chair, uh, Mayor Pro Tem would like to uh, speak. Yes, Mr. Winston. Uh, I was, I was going to try to um, save it to the end, but actually I'm glad to be recognized because I will probably leave, um, excuse myself, in a few minutes. Um, during the uh, Comp 2040 plan discussions, um, as well as the UDO discussions most recently, um, there was questions about regulating um, short-term rentals, Airbnbs. Um, and it, uh, I think the, the answer was to, 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 uh, through the courts, it was determined that was, municipalities have no, um, we, we have very limited ways that we could regulate um, um, short-term rentals outside of zoning, um, strictly zoning districts. So, uh, so I don't want to get into those weeds. But long story short, that there was some, there would be a legislative fix that was needed, and I know that was something that was pretty high up on the the public's radar during those two processes, and it was actually an important point to many council members. Um, uh, I, obviously, I don't think we have a position on that to ask to go up to Raleigh, but I, I just wonder if there has been any consideration um, um, from a legislative agenda point of view. Uh, also, you know, realizing that this is the long session, mm -hmm. we probably wouldn't have an opportunity to kind of broach that question for another two years if we don't do it this year. Um, mm -hmm. Has there been any kind of consideration uh, put to that to that question? Yes. Um 
what I recall is that uh, after the UDO was adopted, shortly before that, the planning department had removed it from the final UDO for consideration of the council. Uh, so they could take a look at the legal issues and other ways of trying to skin that cat. That uh, understand that they're still doing that work. And uh, what I understand too is that we currently have the zoning authority over those places. We just can't have standalone regulations that just affect uh, short-term rentals and, and other type of rentals. Um, and I think that's, that issue is still being uh, considered by planning. And I think there's probably a lot of uh, legal studies that have been, been, been done on that or are being done on that across the state, not just here. So uh, it may not, it's probably an issue that's not ready to go. Also, I would say that with the current, with the incoming General Assembly, it's going to be a very friendly place to, uh, to things like that. I think you answered my question. I just wanted to make sure that that's still being thought of on our side of things. And like, I think that you said, yes, it is. It's just not ready for prime time as of yet. Right. Thank you. Not right. That's a good way to put it, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Pro Tam. Thank you. All right. Well, not ready for prime time. Not yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so do we uh, have anything else, Mr. Fenton? On the legislative agendas, there's nothing else. And if the committee would uh, desire, then that would be a time to consider a motion to adopt these as your proposed uh, committee proposed. Yeah, so federal state before we do that, I, I have a question on our um, transportation. If we can go back to that slide, Mr. Fenton. Yeah, oh. I think it's, uh, is it uh, the Powell bill or is it the mobility issue? The mobility. Well, it's great to hear that formula is going to be data driven based on the usage, uh, which certainly helps. Um, I know there has been a recent allocation to address some of the transportation gaps, um, especially in road widening projects. Do we know how um, how City of Charlotte's uh, several uh, projects that we have underway would get funded or would be expedited as a result of that uh, allocation, recent reallocation? Yeah, are, are you speaking about the um, uh, sales tax transfer yes. the state general fund to the state yeah. transportation funds? It's a great question, thank you. The, um, I can tell you that that transfer, when it's fully implemented in about two, three years, will provide 600 million more to transportation, both to their highway construction and to the highway maintenance funds. And um, NCDOT is taking that data, those numbers, in plugging it into the available revenue for the state transportation investment program projects. And what I understand that right now, that that um, that uh, the CARTPO, Charlotte Regional Transportation Planning Organization, is and all the other MPOs around the state are working with NCDOT on that, and that there may be a draft list coming out pretty soon for folks to see. So that would give you a better idea about the uh, about how um, how our projects fared in the statewide plan. And that plan is not scheduled to be adopted by NCDOT until June of 2023. Got it. So that would be a different formula, uh, or would that be the same formula that is currently uh, being considered for this other mobility projects? Yeah, this, this um, in terms, go to the next slide, please. Uh, the, under the state transportation funds, this funding, this additional funding would be uh, distributed around the state through the Strategic Transportation Investments Program. All right. Well, that's all I have. Uh, committee, uh, any feedback before we move this forward to the full council? Any changes that you'd like to see being made to our federal or state and our state legislative agenda. Mr. Mitchell and Ms. Mayfield. Uh -uh. Uh, Madam Chair, if you'd like to make a motion, uh, I'd like to uh, move forward that we adopt the federal state legislative agenda. Second. All right, all in favor, raise your hand. It looks like it will be unanimous with the committee members present. 
So we'll move on to our next topic here. Thank you, committee. So the next topic, uh, as I uh, mentioned earlier, this is just a continuation from continuing discussion. Member Ajmira. Yes. Um, Mr. Fenton actually needs to talk a little bit about the engagement strategy first. Oh, okay. Mr. Fenton? Oh, thank Sorry. You, thank you, Madam Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you, may, you all recall the engagement strategy. This was the uh, directive that the committee received from Mayor Lyles to develop uh, uh, to, in order to enhance and preserve our legislative authorities. Uh, we need to develop a, a, an engagement strategy to help uh, guide mayor and council in developing stronger relationships with the General Assembly. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and, if, um, and if you accept um, uh, what we have presented here, then, then the details of the strategy will need to be worked on with our local and regional partners as it does focus on mobility, which is uh, a really, truly a regional issue. Uh, mobility, as I said it before, mobility is a regional issue. <laughs> so when we look at our region, it might be helpful to look at the, at the coverage that the Charlotte Regional Business Alliance has uh, throughout the region. And of course, uh, the Business Alliance is essentially the <coughs> consolidation of the prior Charlotte Chamber of Commerce, which was citywide, and the Charlotte Regional Partnership, which was regional. So, um, so their delegation includes uh, 11 counties, not just ours, 46 members, and their political balance is almost identical to that of the incoming General Assembly. 28 Republicans, 18 Democrats, and I think that's, uh, that's about 60% Republicans, which is the same uh, number that we're looking at up in Raleigh. And those members, uh, next slide please, those members, now these are positions of leadership from 2022. In a couple of weeks we're going to find out who's going to be chairs of which committees, who's going to be, uh, become Speaker of the House, uh, who will be the Senate Majority Leader and so forth. We have quite a few members who are coming back who have been in those leadership positions, whether it's uh, Senator Newton in Cabarrus County, he's, he, he's the incoming Senate Majority Leader, and uh, Tim Moore from Cleveland County is the Speaker of the House. Then you have all those committee chairs underneath. And when you look at the committee chairs, uh, look at the committees of appropriations, finance, and transportation. Uh, in 2022, we had coverage in all three of those committees. Uh, well, between the, two between the two chambers, you put them all together, we have a chair of transportation, we've got a couple chairs of appropriations, a couple chairs of finance, and so forth. So that's, uh, we have the people in this region, uh, the legislators in this region are in position to get something done on this if we can get their support. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the second, the second uh, uh, part of the strategy is develop a communication strategy, and we'll have to work on this with our regional partners, at the, whether it's the Metropolitan Transit Commission or the Business Alliance or even the Central Line Regional Council. And something uh, that uh, Council Member Mayfield said at one of our previous meetings is we need to have a common set of talking points. And I agree with that, but we also need to come up with the points that illustrate the benefits of this to all parts of the region. For example, legislators from the out, outside counties, outside of Mecklenburg, mm -hmm. can be more interested in what it does for their counties as opposed to what it does for Uptown Charlotte, for example. Mm -hmm. And next slide, please. Uh, and then we'll, we'll be scheduling visits to the North Carolina General Assembly. And again, uh, there's a lot left to do with scheduling because we're, we, don't even, we don't even know some of the big things that are going to happen. <laughs> like, we don't know who the committee chairs are going to be. Uh, we don't know when annual events like the North Carolina League of Municipalities Town and State Dinner will be scheduled because they have to work with the new leadership on scheduling that. And we don't even know about the bill drafting and introduction, bill introduction dates uh, and then even when crossovers going to occur. So there's a lot still up in the air here. But we did identify some potential dates that may work for the city. And um, just wanted to put this out there to you. I, I picked... I picked two days in each month, uh, a, all of them are Wednesdays of the week. You have your council meetings on Monday night, Tuesday might be a bad day to get away up to Raleigh, so we thought maybe Wednesday might work. And actually when we talk about going to Raleigh, only Tuesday and Wednesday will really work for you because those are the two days that the members are there 
for business. They're there part of the day on Monday and part of the day on Thursday. So, so I just wanted to throw these out there, and we made sure we've been checking all the calendar updates that have been coming out from the city council. <laughs> we want to make sure we don't double book you on a day like that. Madam Chair, quick question for. Yes, Ms. Mayfield. So I know, and for the committee, I know Wednesdays would be difficult for me, but mm -hmm. I support any of my colleagues that's able to get up. Just I've already blocked out my school, my class schedule okay. for this coming semester that starts next week, and Wednesdays would be a difficult day for me to try to go up to Raleigh. Thank you for letting me know that. So we have Ms. Mr. Mitchell holding the fort down for us. Uh, Mr. Mitchell I, and Ms. Mayfield, I'll be out in March uh, with my delivery scheduled. Uh, sometimes in March, well, obviously, I don't know for a uh, fact right now as to, because things could move around. But for now, I would probably need uh, uh, one of you to hold the fort down uh, when I'm gone in March. Uh, along with some of our other colleagues. Uh, but once we present these dates to the full council, I'm sure we'll have a few more sign-ups. Uh, Madam Chair, I totally understand, but I will be eating your budget and Lawana Mayfield budget while I travel. I'm just <laughs> you know in advance. Uh, so, so, so you will be there <laughs> at mealtime. Uh, so, so one serious question, if I can, Madam Chair. You know, in the past, we've always had a, a great event, like a breakfast with uh, our Mecklenburg delegation before they head back and we kind of share our priorities. Dana, do you think we can, is that doable this year um, before they head back? I'm very optimistic. Um, I'm not sure, we're, we're looking at adoption or going to council for adoption on January 23rd. And they go back into session, uh, well, actually next week, they go back for one day on the 11th and then two weeks later on the 25th, they go back in earnest. So uh, we were targeting uh, early February for a, uh, for a, a sit-down meeting in person with them, whether it's a breakfast or a lunch. And also, if, just so you, let you know, is that uh, Representative Mary Bilk has been chosen to be the chair of the delegation for the next two years, and we'll have to work with her in getting, getting the schedule because there's a lot of other groups out there who are calling her up probably <laughs> uh, to, to try to get something scheduled for their own organizations. But we are targeting, um, I think I have that calendar coming up here, uh, February 6th to the 17th. And of course, these are all kind of floating dates because uh, I know we understand that you have a, a, a retreat coming up at the end of the month and we want to make sure we don't, again, double book or even triple book in some instances. So, uh, Madam Chair, that completes uh, the presentation on the engagement strategy. Um, is, is this something that the committee would like us to run with to try to start working on? And it looks like, uh, Mr. Fenton, you, uh, we do have consensus here. And obviously, some of these dates will be subject to change as we get final schedule. It looks like you do have consensus here. So, um, and I appreciate because appreciate the work that you and our uh, and our uh, lobbyist team have done to get us to this point uh, to ensure that our both state and federal legislative agenda includes our council priorities, uh, especially mobility, safety, and sustainability. So I, I don't see any objections here, um, committee members. If are you okay with the just sort of uh, giving a head nod so that Mr. Fenton can proceed with this for now? Thank you, committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Madam Chair, uh, and, and I apologize, Dana did a great job saying next steps. And Dana, I just want to make sure so we all could put on a calendar. The March 26th and 29th, that is National League of City in D.C., correct? Yes, sir. Okay. That's what, uh, they're actually scheduled for March 26th or 28th. Okay. Uh, usually Wednesdays now, they do not have anything so that you can go up to the Hill for that day. So I added that date in there as well. And in terms of uh, meetings with our congressional delegation, uh, we're gonna, our team from Holland and Knight is going to need to uh, work with their offices to schedule times and 
we, we do try, we have tried the last several years to get the dates for these meetings on one or two days um, so that uh, you, can, you can go to the conference and learn. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Frenton. Well, uh, next item, Mr. Baker, if you could just walk us through and just um, uh, first, if you could recap our conversation, uh, obviously a month has passed since our last meeting and uh, and I, there were a number of requests and I know committee members, uh, Mr. Mitchell and Ms. Mayfield had requested additional time and they wanted an opportunity to review all the recommendations from the previous committee and options before moving before moving forward. So if you could just sort of recap uh, what we discussed at our last meeting, and then um, and then committee can decide whether to take an action today or uh, defer it further because we don't have a full committee here present. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair uh, and members of, of the uh, committee. I'm happy to do that and Happy New Year to you all. Um, for the record, I'm Patrick Baker, City Attorney. Uh, seated to my left is Lena James, Deputy City Attorney. Uh, we're happy to sort of walk you through where we left things off at our December meeting. Uh, we went over the slide and I'm happy to go over uh, the slides with you all again in terms of how we got here. Uh, and, and just uh, for, for the record, again, this really started with the Citizen Advisory Committee uh, that's appointed every 10 years typically to deal with redistricting, uh, but then any other issues about governance that want to be uh, discussed. And I think uh, in 2000 um, and, and, two, and 2010, uh, the issues of uh, four-year staggered terms has been a recurring theme uh, that hasn't, uh, I don't know that it's moved forward from the city side at least uh, to a voter referendum, but the Citizen Advisory Committee did take that up uh, back in 2020 uh, and made a number of recommendations, some of which have already been uh, adopted. They, they, they set forth the guidelines for the redistricting process that's already uh, taken place and successfully uh, uh, passed with the, um, the council, and we've actually had an, an election based on uh, the, those recommendations and those guidelines. Uh, there are some recommendations that have been uh, sort of put in the proverbial parking lot by the council, uh, sent back to the committee a couple of times in terms of well, what, if anything, uh, else to do with the, um, the recommendations uh, from the committee, and specifically uh, the issues uh, that, that have had the most traction is uh, potentially going from your current two-year, everyone is elected at one time uh, uh, situation to four-year staggered terms uh, for the council members. Uh, there's also been discussion about potentially moving uh, and been, been, it's really been twofold, uh, but moving to an eighth district uh, and basically taking one of the at-large seats and converting it to uh, an eighth district, which would then require redistricting uh, after, uh, so if you went forward and, and it was passed or, or adopted by the council, depending on how you do it, um, there would be a, um, another redistricting process to, to balance out the districts to create an eighth district. There's also been discussion about uh, the possibility of simply adding an eighth council member to where you would have 12 council members plus the mayor, um, and those things have been addressed. Uh, council member Mayfield, you did bring up the issue of full-time and part-time. Uh, that's really an essence of how you're going to compensate yourself. Uh, in looking at uh, in some of the largest cities in the country, for instance, Los Angeles has the, the highest salary for council members uh, coming in at $207,000. Uh, watch two hundred and seven thousand um, uh, dollars, and there are other uh, in terms of uh, city councils that are uh, paying their council members over a hundred thousand dollars. You're talking about really the largest cities. New York is comes in at a roughly one hundred and fifty. Uh, Washington D.C., Philadelphia are also in the one hundred and fifties uh, as well. Um, and I'll stop there. Madam Chair, may I ask a quick question? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Baker, for providing this information. What I'm thinking about based on the numbers that you just shared is cost of living. So are we, the numbers that <coughs> staff have identified, was there a comparable of the cost of living, not just the size of the city, mainly because the city of Charlotte, a lot of our growth has come from individuals that lived in those areas that has changed our housing market, changed a number of things. 
for us locally, it, was that a consideration when looking at these numbers? So to try to be as comparable as possible when we're talking to the community. Sure, sure. Uh, to be candid with you, as I recall the conversation, uh, the, the committee was more focused on where the Charlotte City Council was vis-a-vis -vis Mecklenburg <coughs> County Commissioners. And that was really the focus, and it was really more of a statewide review. Uh, we did provide them with information across the country, but their focus was really to make sure that, that as it relates to uh, state local governments, uh, and in particular, the difference between Mecklenburg County and the city of Charlotte, that there was uh, more equity there in terms of uh, where those numbers were, and that was really their focus. And Ms. Mayfield, just to follow up on that, I think you bring up a great point. Uh, when we did our, when we had this conversation and discussion uh, in 2020 and 2021, uh, we didn't really look at it holistically. Uh, because we had a lot of moving parts with redistricting and other items. Uh, but I think this is an opportunity for us to look at this holistically and really look at the large cities of our size and look at the cost of living and see how we need to consider, uh, whether we need to consider uh, changing our form of government. Um, so we really have three action items today. Uh, and Ms., uh, Mr. Baker, thank you for sort of summarizing this on, on one slide, right? Number one is um, whether we want to move forward with four-year term or not, and that would be on our referendum. And then second item we have is just adding an eighth district, uh, whether we want to keep four at large um, or remove one at large while adding eight district, Either option, uh, well, both options do not require legislative approval. So if the committee says we want to add eight district while keeping four at large, we could do that. Or we could remove one at large and eight, add eight district, either option. And the third item that we have is uh, changes to the council compensation to the full-time status. Um, so those three action items that are needed, I would like to hear from you both whether we are ready to move forward with this three or one or two, or do we want to defer this to our next committee meeting? Madam um, Vice Chair, so I believe there's an additional slide, Mr. Baker, that you're going to go over the procedures to change the form of government. Madam Chair, if, it's, if you're in agreement, if Mr. Baker can complete the rest of the slides and then we have the discussion unless vice chair you want to jump in now because we only have two more slides to go through uh madam chair e e either way I, I think staff would you rather go through or can we have to madam chair can we have discussion on these three options right now I, I'm fine either way if you want to have the discussion. Uh, just very quickly, the, the main issue is going to be whether or not you're going to do it as a council or if you're going to pass it off uh, for a voter referendum. And keep in mind that even if you decide to take it up as a council, uh, a, a 5,000 signature petition, I get that wrong for whatever reason, um, uh, could force a, uh, a referendum even if you wanted to make a, a council decision. So I have I have made this very clear in the past that I would uh, if I will support four year terms staggered elections subject to a referendum uh, thousand signatures could trigger a referendum regardless. So I would like us to just get it right from the get go if you're going to go that route and really um, then we will need to develop a strategy. Um, around how we educate uh, residents on why the four-year term staggered elections are needed, mm -hmm. especially when we look at continuity and the big capital projects and big plans around mobility that we have underway. But there, will, there needs to be some strategy that we need to discuss uh, afterwards um, as to how we educate. Uh Madam Chair, I totally agree, so I, I'll make a motion so we can... We don't want to go let him get through oh, oh. the full presentation first. Okay. I'm good either way, Ms. Mayfield. If you, wanna, okay. if you want to uh, sort of 
uh, go over the remaining slides and then make a motion, that's fine. I'm good either way. And Madam Chair, members of uh, the committee, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Deputy City Attorney Lena James, who has uh, uh, a proposed timeline, uh, and it really depends on when you want to move this forward, uh, but there are some, some absolute requirements that, that have to be done. I'm going to turn it over to her to walk you through that. Thank sure. you, Mr. Baker. Um, in fact, it might be helpful if we could go to slide four, and a lot of the information is in slide three as well, but just as a visual, it might be a little bit easier for you to see that, to follow what that timeline is. And this, these are the steps that are legally required, whether council decides to adopt that resolution of intent and the ordinance on its own, or with a uh, subject to a voter referendum. Uh, I think I'll just point your, um, your eyes and your attention to some of the dates that I think might be most critical. We obviously back this timeline up from when the general election date is, which is November the 7th for 2023. Uh, just for reference, not that it would necessarily be relevant for the decision that you make, but your primary election date is in September and, and the candidate filing period is in late July. Um, I think those dates are just helpful to understand so that if it is adopted, then the following year in 2024, as you go through redistricting and things like that with an additional district, that's sort of what that timeline looks like to keep in mind, but obviously not, not critical for 2023. And so um, I believe the bubbles sort of speak for themselves, and I think it might be if you have questions, we can try to answer what the different steps are. The, the key piece, I think, to understand and to keep in mind, and we shared this information at the December meeting, the last possible date, I think, for council to take action in 2023 this year would be at the late August council meeting, the August 28th, and that still allows the statutorily required time frame uh, between the August 28th council meeting and the November 7th elections if there was a voter referendum and a petition surfaced. This is very helpful, uh, Ms. James. Madam Chair, uh, Councilmember Mayfield has a question. Well, actually, I was going to ask now, because I was reading through this, the language today, if we were to make a recommendation, would be for committee to move forward to full council, the recommendation of the consideration of changes to government to four year staggered terms, adding an eighth district representative and keeping four at large, 12 council members plus mayor. If that's the direction that we wanted to but go. But is yes. that the correct language, the I, way that I said it? And we can break it down. Uh, so first we could do four year term uh, and staggered, or we could even further break it down. It doesn't have to be all combined. Is that right, Mr. Baker? Um, that, that's correct. You can you can do it all in one motion, or you can break it down into in, individual motions. And, and I need to check with, with Lena in terms of the eighth district. I thought that what we were talking about was keeping eleven, but switching, um, uh, reducing the the at large no. from four to three. So when new count, so the right. December fifth mm -hmm. discussion that we had, that's why we have the bullet in there for adding a district representative and keeping four at large because once you all verify right. according to the language that it is 12 members plus the mayor that we had the ability because that was where we had okay. more of a debate was determining between that three and four so that's why the recommendation i just made was a clarification okay. four-year staggered terms with adding a eighth district representative and keeping for at large, which would give us 12 council members, including plus the mayor, which is legislative approval is not required, but to put this on the referendum for the community to keep it very clear. Correct. And that would be, if you, if you went with that motion, that would be the discussion that the council would Correct. have. Correct. Yeah. That this is the discussion that I'm proposing through the motion to go to full council. Yeah, and I so, just want to add to... Quick question um, to Ms. Mayfield's motion. Do we need a referendum for adding uh, an eighth district? No. no. Yeah. We don't need, yeah. do, we'll if, need to put that part to, oh, thank you, Madam yeah, Chair. Yeah. So the only thing we need to put to the referendum only to, yeah, is four year down. staggered terms. We don't need to put yeah. the eight, That's four. Right. 
referendum. That's right. the, yeah. on the referendum. That's my understanding. So now I understand what you were saying, Madam Chair, as far as two separate yes. bullets that I, we're going. I, Thank you very I, much for the clarification. I just wanted to add that the cleanest way to, to do it might be to say <laughs> four-year terms. That's one item. Staggered elections is actually a separate one, so it may be cleaner to say we recommend X terms. We recommend okay. or don't recommend staggered elections, and then the recommendation of the adding an eighth district, keeping at large as it is, and then you could make a decision on whether you do it subject to a referendum or not. So it will be in my motion of A, B, and C. A will be a motion to move to full council the discussion of four year terms. B would be a discussion of staggered terms, and C would be the discussion to full council of adding an eighth district and adding an eighth district that includes four at large members. Yes. Okay. Did, okay. Marie, did you get that? So that is my motion. Okay. Uh, just to clarify so I understand, when you say um, four year terms and staggered going to full council, do you mean under the premise that that would be a referendum? No, no, that's what we just clarified. No, we're, we're, we're moving that to the, the council for, for that discussion at, at that stage. Okay. So for full council, it will be an A, B, and C. C. Right. So A would be four year terms, four year terms right. which we will, that count full council will be discussing going to a referendum. Mm -hmm. Item B will be staggered terms, which is the internal conversation with full council. And item C would be adding an eighth district keeping. while keeping four at large, which will also be an internal count conversation with council. Right, so what you could make it subject to referendum or not. That one may be. If you, if you chose to. So if we chose oh. four, if we chose adding an eighth district, which would maintaining the current of four at-large members by adding an eighth district, that potentially can go to referendum. Yes, under so the then, same. So then we should switch it because that should be B then, if it potentially can go to a referendum. Okay, well. Because that's where I think I misunderstood what you were saying. I get A, B, and C, but the order of it is important. So if A and B potential, A definitely is going to a referendum. Right. Are you saying yeah. that if we move the four-year, if we move the adding an eighth district and keeping the four at large, that potentially can also go to a referendum? That's correct. Oh. That doesn't have to, yeah, from what I have to. According to what you have, have to, you said right. legislative approval. But, but in terms so, of, yeah. Okay, so Madam Chair and Vice Chair, I guess the discussion that we need to have as a committee is, is if that eighth district with four-year terms, is that something that we would want to send to full council to discuss whether or not it should go to a referendum or whether we make the decision. Exactly. I think we make the decision. So I, so here is what I would recommend, Ms. Mayfield, mm -hmm. um, where we make three different motions to Ms. Um, James' recommendation. Mm -hmm. First motion would be uh, moving to the four-year term subject to ref subject to the referendum. Mm -hmm. Second, uh, moving to staggered election, and that doesn't require a referendum. Is that correct, Ms. James? Again, I want to be clear when we talk about requiring a referendum. I mean, if you wanted to do that, you could. Five signatures, could that trigger Oh, could, could that trigger uh, oh, reference? Yes, yes. yes. So any, any of these changes to governments that you're talking about could potentially, um, with, with a successful petition, uh, require a referendum. So all or even the adding the eight district uh, while keeping four at large, that would also, if there is 5,000 signatures? If, the, if they chose, if, if the citizens chose to file a petition, right. yes. Wow. Okay, so all three could be subject to referendum. Then, okay, so in that case, if that's, I mean, if that's the case, we might as well do it right from that's the beginning and just have and put that, this will be subject to the referendum. No, it's, it's the law tied to changing the form of government. So I think if you look at the statutory law, changing the form of government, here are all the ways to do it. Here are the things you can change. You can change the size of the body, you can change the term, and you can change when those terms are. That's the staggered piece. All of those are subject to the council can adopt it, and all those different ways of changing your form of government are also subject to a voter referendum. So can I do a can I do a, 
Can I do a okay. follow up, Madam Chair? Yes, Mr. Mitchell. So even going, oh, okay. So we're at level now, so we wouldn't be changing, we would not be changing the size. Mm -mm. We're just changing uh, one at large is gone. So that would not be subject to 5,000 signatures. So no, we, I think we're getting we across because you're, it would. what we're talking about is, is 12 council members. Right. Right. Keep the mayor are, out of right. this. Right. It's either 12 council members or reconfiguring how the 11 are going to be in terms of at large right. and district. district. And what I'm hearing is you're talking about going to 12, which is expanding the size, which you have the authority to do, which is subject to a, uh, a, if a, there were 5, a petition. Signatures. Exactly. Sorry. I personally okay. don't think there will be 5,000 yeah. signatures because just like the county did made the adjustments that they needed to meet, but I respect the fact that we want to make sure that the community is engaged. Mm -hmm. So what for this conversation, I just want to make sure that the recommendation, because I thought initially what I said mm -hmm. was what we're saying now, that everything could be subject. And I'm sorry, to, I'm getting confused. Um, yeah. Being challenged, but what we're saying is what we're what my recommendation is, is for A, B, and C to move from this committee to go to full council, for full council to have the discussions. And at that point, you all will be able to come back mm -hmm. and break down. Yes, you can have this discussion. It may, tri it could trigger. If it triggers, what you need to decide is whether or not you want to move forward on all three, or if you want to send all three to part as part of the rep referendum and clearly have it identified. Correct. So we're all on the same page. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Madam Chair, you were saying the way you looked at it was one, which I just have as A being four year staggered terms, B, add the eighth district and keep four at large, and your third was. Staggered, St staggered terms was actually the B. Staggered terms was the second, yeah, and then oh. C. Right. But I guess I agree with um, Ms. Mayfield's motion. I would just like to add that if we can recommend to the full council. Uh, all of this is recommended by the committee subject to the referendum. Yes. Yeah, so I, I support, I guess I just need to make sure we add that language that committee recommends all of these three items. Number one is we add four-year terms, we move to the four-year terms, okay. second election, and number three is adding eight district while keeping four at-large districts all of this subject to the referendum. So there is no confusion when we go to the full council. Mm -hmm. So I just need a second. I second that motion. Okay, I'm also in favor of that. So we do have unanimous uh, approval of this with the committee members present. So we will move this to the full council and then we'll have a discussion on this later tonight. Anything else on changing form of government? We well, we do have one more item, which is the uh, um, full time versus part time discussion. Do we have any more slides on that, or is that something just up for discussion by the committee? Madam Chair, I would like to ask staff: Is that a conversation? that full council should have now that this committee has recommended and it's been motioned and approved to move this discussion to full council should the full-time part-time discussion and as far as compensation and all of that should that be full council discussion or should that be we got our, our retreat coming up is that a budget because i feel like that's more of a budget conversation which in previous years that's where the conversation has been had yeah that's a that's more of a policy call, but I would recommend that that discussion occur in your budget conversation. Okay. Madam Chair, do you agree with that part of it being I, I think that, yeah, so our committee, Ms. Mayfield, was charged with looking at changing form of government from the policy perspective. So the budget discussion could occur later on, but I think from the policy perspective, we, uh, we need to make a decision and uh, provide recommendations to the full council, and then full council can decide uh, at least on the policy, and then we still have additional time to discuss that at the, at the budget uh, workshop. Because what I'm concerned about is that if, uh, if we don't make a decision on the policy today, a budget will uh, um, 
kick it back to the committee to decide on the policy before even the budget discussion happens. So uh, is maybe uh, if we need additional data, I, I personally need additional data um, in terms of what are the 15 largest city, uh, can we look at can we look at the city of our other cities of our size? Can we look at the form of government in terms of the council manager form of government so that we are really comparing apples to apples? Mm -hmm. um, because if we look at cities like Los Angeles and other large cities, they actually have different form of government. Mm -hmm. So, and obviously as a result of that, they're uh, full time and and the salary is adjusted accordingly. So if we can sort of take a look at that before making a policy decision on full time versus part time, that would be helpful for me. Um, but I'd like to hear from you both as to uh, do you need additional data to look at part time versus full time or are you ready to sort of take an action on the policy side today? So, Madam Chair, if I can jump in quickly, if I'm understanding correctly, we just made the um, approval for the policy discussion. So we've just motioned and approved that to go to full council. So that discussion is done. Now what we're talking about specifically is the budget of which this is also our committee. That one is one based off of what you asked and what I asked earlier regarding the comparison and cost of living and all of that. That is the information that I believe that Mr. Baker, that staff is going to be bringing back to us to give us a true comparison, as you mentioned, of apples to apples. But the policy discussion piece, we just approved that. So we got that part done to take it to the council. So, I, Mr. Baker, I, I thought we, we did not approve any policy when it comes to full time versus part time. We just approved the other items that was staggered a four year term and the eighth district, adding eighth district while keeping four at large. I, I, I didn't think we approved policy for anything to do with full time versus part time. Correct me if I'm wrong here. So um, I, I think you're, you're, you're correct, but I want to add some clarity to that, which is uh, the charge that was sent to the committee was dealing with the change of government. Uh, and although when you talk full-time, part-time, it sounds like a change of government, it's really a budget issue and not a change of government issue. So that's, you know, the salary uh, that, that's compensated uh, for council members is set by council in the budget process. And that's why I, I would recommend that that would stay in the budget process. That doesn't require a separate uh, policy issue, uh, particularly given the, the charge uh, of this committee to talk about change of government. I hope that makes sense. Uh, I, okay, so I understand that will have budget implications going from part time to full time, but certainly it's more of a, also a policy discussion. If you're going to full time, uh, what I, I guess from the policy perspective, what does that look like? Right, not just from the budget implications, but from the policy perspective, what does that look like? Um, it, so, you know, I, I just, I think we need to have a policy discussion separately on that from the budget, but I, it looks like the committee is not ready right now to discuss that item. So we can defer that. Hey, hey Council Member Ajmira, uh, let me see if I can help here. Um, as it relates to North Carolina, Part-time or full-time are um, not really a thing that's defined, so this is really about more a compensation issue, which is why I believe they're talking about having it be discussed at a later date, either in a retreat or a workshop or something as it relates to the budget. Okay, got it. So, well, that's a perfect segue because I know our next topic is our budget planning and our planning for uh, future budget workshops that could be added to one of our budget workshops. Is that right, Mr. Bergman? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk about the uh, the three workshops and how you guys may want to populate them in the next um, agenda item here. Ma Madam okay. Chair, Ma Madam so, Chair, Mr. Mitchell, go ahead. I, I, I do think you're bringing up one good point that if we can still challenge staff to bring back is what Madam Chair said, look at the 
salaries, and so we compare an apples to apples, weak formal mayor of government, just so they give us at least a foundation, and then we can make a determination from there. But I do think having those salaries before us helps the conversation. So I agree with Madam Chair, we can have that data. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mitchell. And I think having that data of uh, that compares to the form of government we have, which is a council manager form of government, uh, so that when we do have a budget discussion on this, we can share that with the full council that this is what the committee looked at. This is what other big cities are similar to our form of government uh, compensate their full council and their mayor. Um, so that we are not sort of having this budget discussion in vacuum uh, without really looking at other uh, other large cities. So is this something, Mr. Bergman, you could provide or with Mr. Baker at our next uh, at our next committee meeting? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that as a request uh, for information from the committee and we'll do the research and provide it to you guys for future discussion. Yeah, that would be helpful. And I know Mr. Bergman in the past, we only looked at North Carolina cities. Uh, uh, when we were looking at sort of form of government, but now if we can sort of open up this discussion to other large cities, because in North Carolina, Charlotte is the largest city, and we don't we don't really have a city of our size to compare against. So I think it would be use, uh, helpful to have that data, a uh, nationwide data. Okay, and if I'm hearing you correctly, nationwide council manager form of government cities. Right. Got it. That's. That's correct. With with uh, and the size of their council, and obviously, and also if you could include uh, uh, information on district at large, what is the makeup of their council versus ours? That would be helpful. Okay. okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mitchell. I we will have that data at our next committee meeting, and that shouldn't take much time from our other agenda items. I think it would be important uh, to prepare for our budget workshop. All right, so if we don't have anything else on this, uh, we can proceed with our third item. That is our upcoming budget development. And Mr. Bergman, uh, are you ready to proceed? I am, and so uh, I only have one slide. You'll be amazed at how much I can <laughs> talk on one slide. Um, but we did this in the past, the last couple of years, and it was fairly successful of council kind of understanding um, what we're trying to accomplish, making some changes if they like, things like that. But we have uh, three city council budget workshops like we typically do. Also at some point in January, I plan to give a financial update to full council, uh, likely at the retreat at the end of the month or the annual strategy session, I should call it. So we would have that to kind of set the stage uh, where we are, and then we would go into our budget workshops. So we spent some time as a staff trying to think about what are the key things we feel we need to get in front of you guys. So that's kind of the starting point here, and, and I'll go through it quick. Uh, capital affordability update uh, on our first workshop, that would be our financial capacity, uh, presumably presented by our CFO. Um, there are a lot of impacts and changes going on due to the cost of borrowing um, that, that we would likely uh, need to adjust for. Uh, city facility capital investment plan projects is an opportunity for us to talk about our five-year CIP, uh, some of the facilities that are either in construction or are planned to be in construction uh, or we need to plan for being in construction, think of things like fire facilities and police facilities. Um, and then our existing capital project updates, uh, we will bring in our city engineer, Jennifer Smith, general services director, Phil Rieger, uh, talk about the projects that we had previously funded that aren't in construction yet. Um, I'm sure you guys uh, will not be surprised to know that anything that was funded a couple of years ago but isn't in construction yet, we will be dealing with some inflationary pressures, and so we'll need to talk about that. Uh, bond strategy and priorities discussion would be around 
Our long-term planning of our transportation, housing, neighborhood bonds may also be potentially around mobility. Uh, but the theme of the first workshop is the capital investment plan. Uh, the second workshop, we would like to be around revaluation and employees. Uh, going back four years, uh, my first year here, we, we did get to talk about revaluation, neighborhood by neighborhood impacts. Um, I think you guys asked 4,000 questions that day. Um, so I think there'll be a lot that you guys will uh, like to get from that. So we'll try to get some data people there, uh, support from the county, uh, so we can talk about that. Um, I'll come to the revenue last. Staying in place strategies. Uh, I know that the uh, Nest Commission made a recommendation. There may be things that come out of the uh, Housing Committee, but uh, we wanted to make sure we set a place for all of those discussions as it relates to displacement and as it relates to uh, revaluation impacts. Uh, operational staffing, compensation, and healthcare, similar to what we talked about last year. We'll talk about our strategies uh, that we've implemented over the last year, uh, trying to close some of the staffing gaps that we've had in some of our key operational areas. Uh, key revenue update and economic forecast, I held that for last. Uh, we will bring in our uh, city economist, Dr. Ndem Tazafor, who is here. If he wants to raise his hand there, he'll, uh, 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 Ndem's been with us five years, uh, which I know because I'm going to give him this five-year pin after this meeting, so publicly giving it to him, but <laughs> uh, Ndem's been an integral part of the... <laughs> I'll take him to lunch. No, it, you think about what a time to be an economist over the last five years with the city. I'm um, just like, what a time to be a budget director with COVID and everything changing. But we would like to wait on some of those updates until the second workshop because we just need more data. Um, and then finally, the uh, third workshop, uh, City Council has a lot of responsibilities as it relates to our enterprise fund, water, stormwater, cats aviation where we need to give them an opportunity to get in front of you guys talk about their plan um, let you guys uh, uh, ask some questions of them that we would bring back before the budget and then finally our financial partners um, which uh, will be due this month our applications but before the manager makes a recommendation we like to make sure that everything is laid out with you on who applied for what what they're intending to do with it to get some feedback prior to the recommendation so we're not looking for a uh, formal vote today. Um, this is really within the committee's purview rather than the full council. So I'm really looking for uh, adjustments, things to emphasize, or just a head nod from you guys that um, our, our plan here works for you. So I'll, I'll go ahead and stop there. Yes, I, I have a couple of questions, Mr. Bergman. Thank you so much for sort of walking us through this preliminary schedule. Uh, I remember when we did the budget workshop planning at our last, well, last year, we actually had key revenue update and economic forecast. Uh, so sort of like the workshop two theme as our number one item from what I remember, because that is critical to, to some of the decisions that we'll be making on capital investment program. So I was wondering, I know that you do need some data, uh, but is it possible to move the workshop to theme uh, in, in at the beginning so that we have really important update that we need to make decisions on capital investment program? So the uh, the reason that we actually had the revaluation of employees at the second workshop this time, we could certainly do employees earlier, um, but some of the revaluation process impacts the further we can put that off, the more accurate the data we will get from that, the county. Um, so that's that's kind of why we wanted to, to let that one go until March this year. Got it. So in that case, then, um, do you want to move the enterprise fund and partners in the, uh, in the middle and then move the revaluation towards the end so we have the most accurate data? We, we can certainly do that. I mean, there's... Uh, uh, we could do a couple of the enterprise funds in the second workshop along with the employees um, and, and we could move the uh, uh, staying in place and revaluation and impacts which I think kind of go together to April if that's the, uh, the the wish of you guys. Yeah, the only reason I say that because I remember when Mr. Joyner, is it right? Um, yeah. uh, when he did a presentation, he talked about really a shift 
in timeline this year uh, because he wanted to get um, more recent sales transactions uh, in their evaluation assessment so that they're trying to get, so if the market shifts um, in a different direction, at least in the beginning of what we have seen, sort of a cool down on real estate, it would be included in, it would be part of the assessment revaluation process that goes out. So that we could put, so that we can really take that into consideration. So that gives us at least till uh, April, uh, because I believe first is in February, second is in March, and third is in April. Is that right? That's correct. Right. So that will align better with Mr. Joyner's timeline, um, and then we could have enterprise fund and partners discussion a little bit earlier, if if that's what the committee wants to move forward. But I, I would recommend that. Uh, other item, other question I have is, um, uh, I know uh, in past couple of weeks, um, there was questions about uh, uh, having um, a virtual option where we do have virtual option for committee meetings. So would this also have a virtual option or um, because I know we decided, the reason we decided to not have a virtual option because any of our full council decision, decisions could be subject to a legal challenge. But really at budget workshop, we are not really taking an action. It's really the full council that takes an action at the council meeting. So I just want to see if the virtual option would be provided as part of our budget workshop because this will occur during the daytime. Um, if, uh, with other commitments that, uh, especially with other jobs people have, uh, other council members have. Yeah, so I, I think it's similar to um, the, the infrastructure meeting that we had where I think the attorney's office said that with a full council, um, the full rules of procedure um, would require the in-person attendance as opposed to a committee. But that said, I am, I am saying a, a legal um, discussion. Uh, Mr. Baker did step out of the room. So let me try to get you an answer on that prior to tonight's full council meeting, if that's okay. Yes, that would be very helpful uh, if that question does come up at our uh, discussion later today. Okay. And that's all I have. Uh, Mr. Mitchell and Ms. Mayfield. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ryan, just a couple of them. Um, the MSD conversation, where does that fall? Municipal Service District. Does that fall on the financial partners, or is that where in, in, in your uh, in your draft topics? So there, there's a process. If MSDs are looking to go anything above revenue neutral, they actually have to come through the budget committee. Okay. Um, if they aren't going anything above revenue neutral on their tax rate, then they would just need to. Um, we typically try to have an update for them each fiscal year, mm -hmm. so it might not necessarily be in a budget workshop. Okay. Um, we can, if, if, if that's your preference. I, I think with that, you could either go a committee, a workshop, or try to find time in uh, one of the May or June city council meetings. Okay. I don't have a preference. It, for me, it's almost like a source of information. Uh, it's starting to get trends now. First, okay. we had four uptown, then we went to university area. Now we got one in South Park. Uh, and so and for, questions it's always questions. And so, yeah. and then the boundaries have changed. And mm -hmm. so to, to get council comfortable on um, municipal service district, I'm flexible, whatever you like, you ever like, like to put that as thing, it'd be great to report out. And then our corridors of opportunity, would that fall under uh, city facility capital investment or where would that conversation fall under? Um, well, I actually believe that the corridors of opportunity was uh, planned on being handled either at the retreat and or at a regular okay. council meeting okay. as kind of like an update. It's certainly something that we need to get in front of you guys. Okay. Um, but I mean, th this is this can be iterative if, if we feel like next committee meeting um, or even the one after that, we feel like there's something that wasn't accomplished. Mm -hmm. We can always adjust this and add. Um, you know, as, as I think about your MSD comment, um, I, I think you're probably onto something that that might be an appropriate 
a better time for us to have them provide a written update and then mm -hmm. come and maybe answer yeah. questions from yeah. City Council during one of the workshops. Yeah. Um, so I, I will, uh, I will uh, tr probably try to put that in with uh, financial okay. partners since it's similar. Okay. That's the will of Council? Okay. Or yes, that, that's fine. I'm, I'm okay with that uh, to Mr. Mitchell's request. And uh, a corridors of opportunities, uh, I would I would like to see uh, that under capital investment program because that is that is absolutely one of our priorities. So uh, could that be added as part of part of our first budget workshop, Ryan? Yes, yes, we can add that as uh, a, a part of our uh, twenty our, our bond strategy and priorities discussion. Um, corridors is made up of. Uh, cash funds they receive, but also a CIP component, um, exactly. which would be in the 2024 bond. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and, and Ryan, last, I'll make sure I got my date. So the first workshop is February the 9th. Correct. Uh, workshop number two is what date? March 9th. March 9th, 3 9th. And then workshop number three? April 6th. Gotcha. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's all I had. Yeah, absolutely. And I know Ms. Mayfield made a request earlier about a uh, form of government, especially to be specific, full-time versus part-time uh, council and mayor compensation discussion. So Ms. Mayfield, is that something you'd like to see being added to this one of the budget workshops? Thank you, Madam Chair. So if I understood correctly when you were sharing it with in the last presentation you mentioned that this upcoming time would be the best time for us to have that discussion so with this breakdown of workshop one two or three where do you recommend because we the challenge is with this being an election year since we have to get back on cycle we need to get this done as quickly as possible earlier in the year since we know we have a short window before we're not able to have certain discussions right. so is where do you see this being able to fall so that we can get this moving forward sure i mean if, if it isn't addressed ahead of then um at, at a retreat or something i think it would make sense um during the compensation discussion of workshop two okay so because i think i heard from madam chair was to bring it back to committee in our next meeting. Yeah, we're going to bring the data so back. if we bring the data back, then we can start the conversations, which will be right in line of our budget conversations. How does that sound to you, Madam Chair, for workshop two, which is 3-9, to yeah, be able to identify? That's perfect. Thank you. That's perfect if it's not addressed before, if it's not addressed in the retreat. but. You know, after seeing the data next month, who knows, we, we might even address this at one of our strategy discussions and we may not need budget workshop. But I think for now, it'd be good to have this placeholder in budget workshop two under compensation. So, uh, Mr. Bergman, if you could add that. So yeah. from what I hear to summarize, really, there were uh, uh, four, no, three changes. One is adding MSD to our uh, financial partners, corridors of opportunities to Mr. Mitchell's request to our capital uh, investment program workshop, and then adding the compensation council, full-time versus part-time compensation discussion under workshop number two, and then um, a revaluation process so that we have full data moving that to workshop three, and um, and the forecast moving that to workshop three so that we really have an accurate picture. Um, and and then moving a couple of enterprise fund to workshop two to accommodate uh, uh, enough time for each workshop. Is that, is that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, correct on everything except one thing. Um, we're comfortable leaving the revenue update in workshop two um, okay. I, I would like staying in place strategies to stay with revaluation. So oh. that's the one I would suggest moving to three. And the, the, the ones we would likely move to workshop two for enterprise funds would likely be uh, cats uh, and water, water and or storm water. Okay. But, but, but I guess I would say I, I don't, um, everything that you guys have suggested all fits within the plan so we can make, um, I, I will make those adjustments. Um, Moving forward, our next committee meeting is before 
um, any of the workshops. So we'll give you a final schedule. Um, I don't need a vote or anything today, but thank you. Okay, perfect. Uh, and obviously, if there is anything else, Mr. Mitchell and Ms. Mayfield, that comes. Uh, after our strategy discussion today, we can certainly send that feedback to Mr. Bergman uh, later today. Uh, but I think this is a good start. And uh, I, that's all That's all we have. Do, uh, Mr. Bergman, do we have anything else on our agenda today? I know it's 1.33, right on time. I think we did good today. Yeah. Move to adjourn. So move. Uh, second. <laughs> Second, all right, well. <laughs>
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Malcolm Graham. I'm the chairman of the City of Charlotte Jobs and Economic Development Committee. We'd like to wish each and every one of you a happy uh, new year. Uh, this is our first meeting of the year, uh, Tuesday, January 3rd, here in the Government Center at um, room CH14. I want to thank those who are visiting with us virtually. Um, the meeting is officially, uh, officially uh, beginning. I want to take this opportunity to introduce the committee members, those who are virtually first, uh, and then we'll pivot to those who are in the room. Good afternoon, Dimple Ajmera, committee member. Welcome, Dimple. Again, and happy to be all. Malcolm Graham, committee chairman. Ed Driggs, committee member. Braxton Winston, Mayor Pro Tem. I want to thank the Mayor Pro Tem for visiting with us yet again today. Uh, and we'll introduce everyone um, uh, in the room, starting with the back wall, and then we'll start with the staff at the table. Oh, welcome. <laughs> Charlotte Business Inclusion Advisory Committee. Oh, oh. Thomas Powell, City Attorney's Office, Counsel to the CBI Office as well as the CBI AC. Pam Pam, Economic Development. <laughs> Lauren Livingston, Office of Constituent Services. Tracy Dodson, Assistant City Manager. Renee Askew, Assistant City Manager. LaWanna Mayfield, Council Member at Large. Stephen Coker, Program Manager for Charlotte Business Inclusion. Priya Sarkar, Arts and Culture Officer in the City Manager's Office. Well, thanks everyone for being here today. We have two agenda items on the table for today. Um, discussion, arts and science culture, as well as the CBI disparity study draft recommendations. Um, before I kick it off to our uh, assistant city manager for economic development, I just want to remind everyone at the table that they should have a copy of this year's report of opportunity year in review. Uh, we talked a little bit about this in uh, December at our meeting, uh, all of the great things that the staff has done in terms of the quarters of opportunity program that we've um, focused on in the last year. Uh, this will give you a very com comprehensive understanding of some of the goals and the objectives, but more importantly, the accomplishments um, that we accomplished last year in our quarters of opportunity. And so just want to make sure that um, everyone is aware that this is at your table. And I'm pretty sure that the public, if they want to see, can go online uh, and take a, a look at it as well. So a lot of work went into the quarters of opportunity last year more good stuff to come this year, and I'm excited about the progress that we're making. So, um, Tracy, I'll turn it over to you to introduce the agenda items and uh, any comments you want to make before we get started. Okay. Thank you, uh, Council Mem Member Graham. <clears throat> um, I would encourage you all to use these um, quarters of opportunity documents as you're out in quarters talking to people about all the different things that we have going on, and we can supply other copies or, you know, obviously you said point them to online um, if needed. As we go into the arts and culture um, report today, um, I thought it would be good if we start, I think, with um, a discussion around the council priorities. And Council Member Driggs, if you want to, if you want to chime in on that, and then we'll kick it over to Priya on the state of Charlotte's culture now in the draft. I recognize Council Member uh, to uh, give us an introduction of the topic and um, where we're going from here. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so we have had um, conversations going back, I think, two years about what our direction should be for arts and culture. Uh, we've gotten to a point now where the council really needs to kind of consolidate whatever input we want to provide to the development of an arts and culture plan so that when the plan comes back to us, we don't encounter uh, issues that we hadn't uh, thought about before. Um, towards that goal, <laughs> Uh, I've talked with the chair and with Mr. Winston, with whom I worked, we worked together to 
confer with council members and try to identify priorities that had been uh, offered by council members. And I, I have here a draft mem memorandum that basically summarizes a little bit of history and offers a suggestion as to the kind of action council might take. It's a discussion document. The intention is that uh, committee members and council members can, by responding to this document, uh, converge on a, uh, again, some good guidance to the people writing the report. So I'm going to hand this out, if I may, Mr. Chair. Um, it's not intended that we uh, that you respond to it today. I just want to get it in front of you so you can all uh, think about it. And I'll pass it up. Yeah, thank you. Keep one for myself. Okay. <laughs> and the goal would be to uh, uh, follow up, I believe, at our next meeting, Mr. Chair. Um, what you'll see in particular at the back of the memorandum is a suggestion for a statement of council position. So I think where we need to come out in this whole process is with some specific guidance from the council as to uh, what our pr public funding for the arts uh, intends to accomplish. And we need to provide that guidance now again so that we don't end up with a culture plan that doesn't, uh, isn't responsive to those issues. So the suggestion for council action does not try to uh, narrow the scope of the work that's being done on the culture plan. It is merely intended to identify a couple of issues that we should be clear on before that plan is finalized. So, uh, uh, and uh, Ms. Sirkar, you haven't seen this yet either, so uh, <coughs> I hope you won't find anything surprising in there. Uh, basically just uh, recaps some of the recommendations from the slides that you presented to us after the conversations with council members and, and makes a few suggestions. So I think, Mr. Chair, at this point, um, unless you think maybe it would be worthwhile to talk about a couple of the points in the uh, recommendation. If you wouldn't mind just kind of summarizing the, um, the points in the recommendation. Okay. For the uh, record, since there's no um, presentation. Okay, so again, for discussion, uh, the suggestion is that the council would, for one, resolve that a vi vibrant arts community is essential to a healthy community in Charlotte and uh, to its future economic and social development. And recognizing this, city council hereby adopts the following policy for the arts and culture. For one, city funding for arts will continue after the infusion fund expires at the end of 2024, subject to an annual budget approval by council. So just a general statement of our intention that we will continue to provide public funding for the arts. Um, we will also continue to talk to private funders about the potential partnership we might have with them after the end of the infusion fund, because that commitment from them was really for that three-year period. And uh, we haven't fully resolved yet what relationship we will have with them or what their role will be, so we will continue to promote that. Uh, we will also make an effort to diversify funding support to new partners and revenue sources. This was part of what was discussed by some members of council that we take a broader look at this and go to surrounding towns uh, or other potential funders. So and include that as a goal that we have. Uh, we will ensure that the future funding plan provides adequate operating funds to the facilities that are owned by the city, the legacy, so-called legacy facilities because we have a big investment in those facilities anyway. We service debt, we provide maintenance, and so um, as we go forward, we need to be sure that they have adequate operating funds to perform their intended function. Um, there's a suggestion here about the Arts and Science Council, which is that it continue to manage the city's public art investments, as it does now, uh, and that it also be uh, one of several uh, grant-making entities. Uh, so the Arts and Science Council currently has awarded grants through its Opportunity Fund on a grassroots sort of basis. They have a great network and a, and a big infrastructure for that. Uh, and uh, so we should talk about uh, what their role is in all of this. This is an idea that they would continue to do the public art and that they would also um, uh, have some of the other available money for grant making. Um, that perhaps for a grassroots or for other purposes that would be decided in the plan. And then, um, subject to agreement with private funders, other grants would be awarded by established nonprofit organizations nominated in the arts and culture plan that have established presence in the areas supported by the plan. 
So the idea here is that the principal grant making would be done by nonprofit organizations in the arts community who have the best awareness of who the participants are in, in their respective sectors um, without prejudging or limiting how those allocations might be made. So uh, essentially, all it says here is the allocations to these funding organizations will reflect key council priorities as reflected in the opportunity section, uh, which is included earlier in this. So we will kind of pass on to uh, the, the authors of the plan the input that we got as to the kind of things that council wants to achieve with our funding uh, and then let them come back based on the work they're doing and based on the membership in that board of people in the arts community with a recommendation on how we might apportion the grants that, are, that we are able to make from these funds uh, to individual recipients. So that's the gist of it. Uh, it, it doesn't, uh, again, it doesn't intend to, uh, for council to get overly involved in the arts part of the conversation, but merely to address a couple of questions that we really think ought to be answered before you go down the road and try to finalize that. Did you get a copy of this, Priya? Okay. So you can, you can read it at your leisure, everybody. Uh, it, it, is, it is out there in order to try to bring some structure to our conversation and get us to a point in the next month or so where the council can provide whatever guidance it intends to the people writing the arts and culture plan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Driggs. Um, council Member Ashmere, we we're sending to you a copy of the, um, the memo via email so you can read it. Um, I know you have a question, so I'm gonna give you time to do that. And I'm going to go to the mayor pro tem, and then I'll come back to you once you received it and had an opportunity to kind of put your eyes on it. Is that okay? Yes, I I just um, I had an opportunity to get a gist of what Mr. Drake's went through, okay. so I can ask a couple of questions, okay. um, and then I'll read it, uh, and then I'll read in depth. But really, um, to Mr. Drake's recommendation report here, are we? Um, are we saying that we will continue to fund at our current capacity out of general fund what we are currently allocating towards our culture? So uh, the current situation is we are in year two of a three-year plan in which the, uh, the city committed $4 million of general fund and $2 million each year of ARP funds. Um, Subsequent to that, the private commitment and our commitment essentially lapses. And so the question as to what the public funding would be or what the structure would be of our partnership with a private funder is not clear. Our goal is uh, one way or another, uh, I would suggest, and again, we're just talking, but uh, our goal is to try to maintain the sort of levels we established through the infusion fund uh, going forward and to have a reliable and stable source of, uh, of revenue for arts funding. But uh, the, the details of, you know, general fund or private funds or how that works um, haven't been worked out. Got it. So <clears throat> I, I just want to make sure that, you know, we are not locking the future council with specific commitment dollars. Uh, so I think having that flexibility is important to me. And uh, while also ensuring that we continue to support our arts and cultural sector, because that is very important. Um, and second, I, I would like to understand, I, I really appreciate that we are really um, letting the sector decide as to who gets the funding so it's not really the council deciding because that's where it, it may become political. So I know you said you shared that it would be nonprofit um, uh, sector that will ultimately decide uh, who gets the funding. So would I guess what role would our arts advisory board play in that process? So the arts advisory board. Uh views as its primary assignment, and Ms. Sirkar, correct me if I'm wrong here, the creation of this plan and putting in place a trajectory going forward. 
Uh, I don't believe it was their intention to be the people who make the grants. So what we're suggesting here is that the uh, Arts and Culture Plan suggests to us who those nonprofit entities might be. We don't get too deep into that as council. Uh, and to your other point, by, as a matter of law, we can't bind future councils, which is why this right. says that uh, we have a general intention, this council has a general intention that there will be continued funding, but it's always subject to budget approvals by subsequent okay. councils. So I think we're good on that point. I'd just like to send the message out to the community that we recognize the importance of the arts uh, in terms of, um, again, the social priorities, economic priorities, uh, uh, disparity issues, and uh, we intend to uh, support the arts. That, that's the sort of broad indication here. And then uh, uh, passing that along so that the people writing the arts and culture study uh, know kind of what they're working with. Got it. No, that's helpful. Thank you, Mr. Driggs, for your leadership on this. And um, I look forward to reviewing the recommendation. I'll quickly uh, read through that and ask any additional questions. But this addresses my concerns. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Thank you, Mr. Chair, if I may. I, I just want to point out the memo refers to attachments. Uh, I will send an email around to everybody with links to the attachments with the documents attached. Uh, they are documents we've all seen before. They're just in there for your reference. Okay. Thank, thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Driggs. Um, I think Mr. Driggs did um, an excellent job in um, framing in, in this document and in, in, in just now introducing framing the work that we've been doing. Um, you, you know, uh, what we've been doing over the past couple months is having uh, conversations with council members to see where we are already aligned and to also get to a place um, uh, where we frame a conversation where council has to provide some clarity to staff uh, so they can do their work um, and we can work together um, in um, having a robust arts and uh, cultural um, uh, funding um, in, in the city of Charlotte. I would, I would um, again, just echo Mr. Driggs' um, earlier statement that the draft statement of a council position is right now um, a conversation piece um, and is not necessarily a recommendation yet. Um, and I, I would point out that the reason that the recommendation, it, it's not a recommendation, it's a, it's a discussion piece is because uh, in these individual council conversations, there were certain places where there was clear consensus. Like there were at least six council members that were saying the same thing, um, but there were certain places um, where that was not so clear. Um, and Mr. Driggs does a great job. Uh, you know, he and I often come to similar conclusions, but we have a bit of, of different kind of um, pathways <laughs> that we get there. Um, and, and so he, I think, has given us a document that we can all work from um, uh, that is, is going to have some guardrails, right? And I would, I would, I would um, really uh, turn our attention, turn council members' attention uh, towards the last two paragraphs of the um, draft statement of council position. Um, because everything above those two, I would, I would pose um, that there is, like I said, that there is clear consensus amongst council members about where our priorities are. And I think that gives good guidance to staff of, of, of how to operate. Um, but I, do, I don't think, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Mr. Graham, um, uh, Mr., uh, Mr. Driggs, that in these council, individual council conversations that there was clear consensus around the, 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 two, uh, the two bottom paragraphs, um, particularly around those grant, um, um, uh, how we go about um, our, our future grant making. We, I think we all agree that there's a need for these, uh, these grant making um, uh, actions to occur but there were some council members that believed that we should be dealing with an individual um, grant making entity, a la the Arts and Science Council. Um, some folks believe that um, we should have uh, multiple um, grant making entities that we work with. And there were some folks that um, uh, uh, thought that maybe this grant making process could be brought in house. Um, in a non-political way, sort of like the way we do community block grants um, in, in our housing and neighborhood services. 
I'm not suggesting um, right now that, uh, you know, which way we should go, but council needs to give staff a clear direction on what, what our priorities are uh, so that they can go out and, and, and make the proper recommendations to us. Um, secondly, um, we have also talked about um, sort of a parallel track to investing in the arts and, uh, arts and culture community in, in our city. Again, we have done it traditionally through grants, through the arts and science, called, uh, arts, and, arts and science, ASC, <laughs> uh, the Arts and Science Council. But we've talked about things like economic development, uh, things about targeting certain industries within arts and culture, finding ways um, to, to uh, support the workforce um, and workforce development um, in, in, um, uh, 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 in the arts and culture community. How do we deal with things like affordable housing and affordable workspaces? These are certain things that um, might not um, um, necessarily fit within nonprofit partners, um, um, but might fall within a different policy framework, i.e. maybe determining, you know, uh, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I got some notes here. Um, uh, it, it, what are things that we're willing to subsidize, things that are going on in our community that, we're, that we want to accelerate, um, or what are new ideas that we want to incubate? Again, perhaps not in a nonprofit um, model. But again, these are not things that where we have a clear consensus of six people on council to say, hey, this is what we want to do. So we need to decide um, if that is something that we, we want to do, get clear verbiage behind that, and, 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 give, and give staff that clear uh, communication. Again, I think Mr. Driggs has pre presented us something that we can work from and we should work from because it really does narrow the focus of the work that we have to do. Um, I'll just, again, put it out there. Um, that's my little piece of the, the discussion. Thank, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. And let me welcome um, Council Member Wallington to the, to the meeting. Um, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you. Uh, and um, Mr. Drakes. So I uh, agree with you on the last two paragraphs. And I have to admit, I just love that out there, right? Uh, I mean, uh, to stir something up, right? We need to deal with the question of the role of the Arts and Science Council. There is a diversity of opinion. People can respond to this, and it could change, uh, or it could get fleshed out more. But what I'm basically doing here is saying, OK, for example, you know, it, could it be this? And what would the fees be if we did that? Um, if that's not where everybody comes out, and that's why I'm inviting, uh, and you know, the three of us work together on these conversations. We heard a diversity of feedback. The memo includes a virtual laundry list of things. So in there already is a vibrant <coughs> arts community that supports big city-owned facilities while also supporting grassroots to ensure equity and diversity, workforce development, so it's not like those issues have not been acknowledged. Um, the question is, how far do we want to go in prioritizing those issues and communicating those priorities? Uh, so I think that is still available. Well, thank you. So let me thank Mr. Drakes and the Mayor Pro Tem for, for their good work, uh, as well as staff. Um, again, we have communicated with all of our colleagues, and this is um, a summation of those conversations. Uh, this is for discussion purposes only for the next 30 days. Um, so uh, council members still can weigh in um, as we begin to uh, finalize a set up what I call framework guidelines uh, for, the, for the city council so that we can take some type of formal action probably in early February. I think that timeline fits neatly with um, where the report status is uh, and should provide um, staff and our consultants uh, a roadmap and or a framework in terms of questions that we want to answer. I, I agree that the last two are, are the, the, the rub in the room. Uh, and hopefully as we get feedback from the consultants, they will help us um, provide some answers to those questions. So I, I think we're in good shape unless um, Council Member Ashmira Wallington has any additional questions, um, we will pivot to our next agenda item. Well, which would be the second part of the arts discussion. Slides. There's more, right? Slides. There's yeah. more. <laughs> but wait, there's more. Yes. We couldn't have an arts and culture discussion without a little drama, right? So yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
so um, yes, hello everyone, good afternoon, and, uh, and happy new year to you all. Um, thank you for this discussion. It's, it's actually a perfect segue into the second piece of the arts and culture conversation. Uh, we are joined by two of our lead uh, members of the consultant team that is doing this uh, the facilitation of the arts and culture plans development. Uh, Joy Bailey Bryant and Rich Overmoyer are with us virtually, and so they will actually be doing uh, the next portion of the presentation. But just to tee that up, and I guess I'm going to ask Wendy if you wouldn't mind uh, forwarding the slides a little bit. Um, we might be able to go past these because, uh, thank you, this relates to the discussion that we just had. <clears throat> Okay, this is great, thank you. Uh, so uh, just to kind of do a refresher now that uh, we're in the new year, uh, what we're doing with the next little while uh, will be a very um, whirlwind, uh, in the interest of time, kind of overview of the draft state of culture report, which is essentially the research and analysis findings from the last several months of the arts and culture plans development thus far. So again, this is not the plan or even a draft plan. This is before we start to develop a plan, which is why it's a great time for the conversation that, that the council is having right now. Um, uh, but this does uh, essentially, we're talking about the culmination of the research and analysis uh, of the planning process that began last early summer. Um, so just a reminder for everyone, uh, the council did receive the draft state of culture report back in, uh, thank you, yes, <laughs> I'm sure council member drinks, your dog copy is all marked up and yes, and dog-eared. Um, and so uh, some or, or many of you, I know, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, you started reading it the same day because you started <laughs> giving us feedback, which we really appreciate. So thank you to all of you who have dug into this draft report and um, and for if you haven't had a chance, there's still time. And also, of course, you could, you could uh, dig into the revision. So essentially, this report uh, was shared with you all, as the draft report was shared with you all, and with the steering group, the community steering group, which includes, as you know, the Arts and Culture Advisory Board as the core of that steering group. And we received feedback from the steering group, as well as from various city staff. We also was able, were able to have a session with county staff. Um, and so, because as you know from the discussions thus far, uh, and from reading the draft report, uh, there are elements that really, you know, look at arts and culture throughout Charlotte and Mecklenburg. So we have actually been working over the holidays <laughs> to incorporate that feedback. And so we're in the revision process currently, but wanted to uh, take this opportunity to provide that high level overview, um, which might be especially helpful for folks who haven't gone to read the whole thing yet, or just, you know, you could decide where to focus your, your efforts if you're looking at it now. Um, and so uh, with that, um, I'll turn it over to Joy and Rich, and I'll just say that uh, we are going to be sharing the revision, so the final state of culture report. Again, this is, if you think about it, it's almost like um, it's letting us know where where is arts and culture right now in Charlotte and Mecklenburg, you know. Um, it's not recommendations, but it's taking stock. And it provides the jumping off point to then develop strategies, priorities, et cetera and an actionable implementation plan. And so we'll be bringing back the revised final State of Culture Report in mid-January. So you all will receive that, as well as the steering group will receive that. And then we will transition to where we start to develop the plan. So um, Joy, with that, I would love to turn it over to you, please. Happy New Thank Year, you. Joy, and welcome. <laughs> Happy New Year to you, Council Member Graham, and, and also to committee members. And thank you all so much for having us. Um, I'll move very quickly. And actually, Nicole Mules Kilkucky is going to be um, presenting. We have both Rich and Nicole, but Nicole is going to be presenting um, some some of the crucial um, funding and evaluation research, as well as benchmarking. One of the things that I just want to emphasize on this slide, and just to move quickly, I won't talk about everything, but I want to reiterate what Priya mentioned about the purpose of this State of Culture report. It's a snapshot. It is a moment in time of where arts and culture, the state 
of arts and culture in Charlotte Mecklenburg today. So these are findings. These, this is all information to be used to create further recommendations. So this, this is where you are as an arts and culture community. And then we will, that sets the stage for us to, to begin to talk about how we want to get to where we want to be as an arts and cultural community or and as a community uh, overall. Ask, so next uh, slide. Can I ask you a quick question? Yes, sir. And I heard Priya said there won't be any recommendations, right? But I'm looking at item number three, assess strength, weakness, opportunities. And when I do my SWOT analysis, I also do threats and a small a alternatives. So while there won't be any recommendations, recommendations will they be a threat analysis and maybe uh, some alternatives in terms of, of what we should be doing well council member graham we have what we call strategic insights mm -hmm. and those strategic insights are really a composite of holistically taking all of this research and information. Um, if you're looking at the, at the table of contents, we're talking about a, a huge composite, uh, just like months long research about Charlotte Mecklenburg and what's happening, um, what's happening public engagement wise, what the community is saying, as, as well as what is actually happening regarding how arts and culture is funded publicly across um, the area. We're pulling all of that information together and we have at the end what we call strategic insights. And that's what big picture wise, we are seeing that the all of this information is telling us and that could possibly help us to go in, in, in the direction that we need to go. So where Charlotte Mecklenburg's arts and culture community needs to go based on all of this information what it is telling us. So that's what those strategic insights are um, doing at the end of this report. And that is, that is you are correct, based on the opportunities and challenges that are identified throughout the report. And you, you see that kind of building as you go throughout the State of Culture report. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. So the next slide, um, I just want to remind you one more time of where we are in this uh, planning methodology. This has been a three phase process and right now we are at the end of phase two. So we are really moving rapidly through this process. And thank you all so much council members um, for your uh, just real uh, attention to this arts and culture plan and the way that you have allowed us to do these check-ins. So you've seen a lot of the research that I've talked about um, from the market analysis through the public engagement through the um, right through uh, the SWOT analysis that Council Member Graham talked about. Um, the countywide meetings that we went through in the public engagement now to get to this place of where we are with this state of culture in Charlotte Mecklenburg. Uh, we're moving forward to the draft, the vision strategy to what the draft plan says. So that's that's the next moving into the next phase. OK, so we're right now saying what the state of culture in Charlotte Mecklenburg is. Next slide. So just to remind you of how the public engagement was um, conducted over uh, the about a over the last few months, we had the opportunity to engage with over 3,000 uh, residents in a variety of different ways, just to make sure that we were really getting into the pockets of Charlotte Mecklenburg. A lot of times we talk about having these public meetings, and if people don't come out into the public meetings, are we still getting their feedback? The answer is yes. We had a number of ways to do that, including drop-in events where the plan went into different communities. We had ambassadors who um, had in-person conversations at different classes and events, yoga classes and um, uh, JSU, JCSU games and um, festivals. And we also had convened events that were convened by the plan. We had a survey um, that was offered in both English and Spanish. And we also offered other languages, uh, ambassadors and other uh, availability for 
contributions in different languages. So uh, we really worked hard to hit all of the sectors of Charlotte Mecklenburg that we possibly could. And so we're we're proud of this. Uh, emails collected over 750. We're proud of this, these results. And you can see on this map the zip codes of the people that were engaged as it's almost like a heat map as the circles get larger. But we were able to engage with people, uh, more people over time with these different circles. So you, you do see how we were able to really engage in uh, different ways across the Charlotte Mecklenburg community. Next slide. So talking a little bit about the planning context, I'm going to ask um, Nicole to speak just a minute about that. Next slide. Great. So thanks, Joy. And hi, everyone. Um, this this slide is really meant to show um, the work that went into um, understanding the community's priorities prior to starting our work. Uh, we've reviewed all of these plans um, that were uh, recently conducted in Charlotte and Mecklenburg to, to make sure that this arts and culture plan really builds on the stated priorities from the recently conducted comp plan and all of these other recent planning efforts in the city and county. Um, if you go to the next slide, I think what we learned from that exercise, oh, well, what we learned from that exercise is that there's a number of key um, issues that, um, you know, where we saw an intersection of arts and culture with existing plans and their goals. A lot of the things that you mentioned just now um, in terms of council's goals around wanting to, to see the city and the county grow, um, you know, understanding that Charlotte and Mecklenburg is growing and diversifying, um, that we want to have livable neighborhoods, strong connectivity, cultural equity, um, but also connecting and leveraging arts and culture assets back to the economic and community development goals that um, Charlotte Mecklenburg has going forward. So I'll turn it back over to Joy for this section. Thank you, and I'll move quickly. So the next slide, we engaged in, in so many different ways and we did so much different research. Next slide. We um, just thinking, looking through the different kind of buckets of people that we engaged with. Here you see, um, I, I talked a little bit about this through the survey, the interviews. Um, we engaged with well over 90 um, individuals. We actually engaged more people than we had we had thought when we actually wrote this report. So um, at, on, on many different levels, and these were person to person conversations, community workshops, as well as the sector workshops. And what we found, next slide, is um, as Nicole said, next, if you could go to, on to the next slide. Uh, we have kind of some big picture findings. One of them actually this is so interesting as I was listening to the city council priorities. Um, one of the things that, that does come out very clearly is that center city and uptown institutions are a key strength, strength to support with simultaneous equitable support of arts and culture and communities. So it's not a choice. You don't have to choose one or the other. People do want to support center city and uptown institutions. So those kind of big picture, the, 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 um, the um, what you, you've been called legacy organizations, as well as equitable support out in the neighborhoods and in the communities of arts and culture. Um, Similarly, you're looking at maximizing the revenue opportunities for local artists is top of mind. And I will use many different ways of saying this. I will say maximizing revenue opportunities means earned opportunities, earned revenue. So ways for artists and arts organizations to, um, to earn their living, right? A livable wage um, for there to be real employment opportunities for artists and individual artists and artist organizations. So we're not talking necessarily about grants here, we're talking about the creative economy. So all of that's very important and you'll continue to see that throughout the report. And then finally, this affordable and accessible space is a key, key need. I'm just I'm illuminating a few of these points that came out because, but and all of them are important, but I really wanted to speak on those three. Next slide. Talking about benchmarking and comparable communities, Nicole, if you could just run through this really quickly and then on to the next portion. Sounds great. Next slide, please. 
Um, so we went through a process of uh, narrowing in a few different communities to look at at the city county level. Um, you know, looking at uh, communities that are, look similar to Charlotte in some ways or aspirational to Charlotte in some ways. Um, and we benchmarked them against a number of key data indicators. And there's a lot of useful information that came out of that exercise um, in the state of culture report. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, some of the things that we learned through uh, studying each of these communities uh, at a deeper level I'm not going to read all of this, but um, at a high level, you know, we learned about how these communities successfully use public funding. That was something that you brought up earlier today to support arts and culture. We learned about the ways that municipalities support arts and culture in ways that are non-monetary, non-financial. What does it look like in a typical um, and exceptional place? Um, what does private support for arts and culture look like in various communities? How does the private and public sector work together uh, to support arts and culture? Uh, but also, what is the role of independent nonprofit organizations? So that was something that you brought up uh, just, just now as well. Um, and then finally, how do all of the organizations within a community work together to promote arts and culture, both to current residents to make sure that um, you know, the, the community is a vibrant place that has a high quality of life, but also to um, tourists, visitors, uh, prospective businesses and pro prospective talent that, um, you know, we're seeking to attract to our cities. Next slide. Okay, so we also did a, a cultural uh, asset map and inventory exercise uh, that I'll, I'll run through some of the high level takeaways. If you go to the next slide, um, we were able to map uh, almost 400 assets. These include infusion fund grantees. Uh, the city's placemaking sites. We're adding the county culture blocks as we speak, um, but but really able to see visually what the landscape of arts and culture looks like, where people experience arts and culture, um, and where those facilities are located. If we go to the next slide. Um, you know, we pulled out a number of key takeaways. We were able to layer in using GIS some economic and demographic data uh, to, to come to some uh, findings about, you know, where are assets located? Um, you know, we see things like a lot of assets concentrated in areas that have higher income than the county's median, um, areas with home values that are above the county's median, and in majority white census tracts. So that's you know, I think a data point in time to to take note of, and also potentially something to track over time as as Charlotte Mecklenburg evolves its arts and culture support. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, we wanted to make sure to to look at quarters of opportunity. Um, currently, you know, we see um, very few arts and culture assets located within these corridors. Of course, we know that these are really important places. Uh, that the city has already prioritized in terms of, um, you know, economic development and other investment goals. So uh, that's a current priority for the city, and we expect to see that grow um, in terms of investing and and uh, investing in those assets. If you go to the next slide, um, I think we can actually skip over this one. I think the other key note here. You know, we see a lot of emerging clusters of investment and activity, and that may be something that, you know, we tie to ultimate recommendations that you see in the plan. Um, and we can go on to the next section, which is around funding. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, um, and apologies, we're kind of racing through this information because we know we have a short amount of time. The funding evaluation portion of the of this uh, state of culture report. Um, you know, we took a historic look at the city of Charlotte's funding for arts and culture, um, you know, looking at the different uh, uh, uses of funds um, over the last 10 years. Um, you know, we see things like public art obviously varying from year to year based on capital improvement plan amounts. Um, and we see that, for example, in, in fiscal year 2020, 22, uh, you know, we saw the largest amount of funding uh, coming from the city of Charlotte uh, uh, in, in the past decade. If you go to the next slide, um, we also looked at county support for arts and culture. 
um, along with the uses of those funding. Um, so you can see a breakdown there of the, the most recent fiscal year. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, I'd actually like to skip the next few slides, but just to note that um, to, to, the, to the previous question, there are a number of strengths identified here. There are a number of challenges. There's a number of opportunities. But I think really um, they're all leading towards those emerging those emerging insights, the strategic insights that Joy mentioned. So I'm going to pass it over to Joy, and if we could just skip, yep, perfect. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much, Nicole. So, uh, so big reveal. Let's talk about the emerging insights. Next slide. Yes. So we have eight. Um, kind of big picture insights that we are uh, putting forward in this draft state of culture. That's also very important to remember. Um, we're working this through the next month. Um, and so these eight emerging insights are uh, very similar to what I started to allude to in this public engagement. And as Nicole was speaking, um, that you saw coming forward. The first being that equitable access to arts and culture is needed throughout Charlotte Mecklenburg. Um, and that leadership in the arts and culture is a public sector responsibility. That comes from this idea that the public sector, not even the idea, the fact that you is that that the public sector has mandates around equity and mandates around um, uh, around the way that you will um, that you will address the public need uh, differently than the private sector. Uh, thinking also about sustainable funding. So you all, all this, you saw this in your, uh, the council members priority, the sustainable funding um, requiring that public private collaboration and commitments. Um, it's that support for local artists is really great to recognize um, those kind of larger um, international and national artists, but really understanding and, and really building up the local and homegrown talent is, is important. Building from the ground up is how you get to a very strong creative economy. Um, collaboration throughout the arts and cultural sector. This space again, again, and again, and again, that space is challenging, a stronger need for communication and cooperation among and amongst the arts and culture community. And then finally, this was one that, you know, it, I hope you saw it come throughout the report. Um, public art is successful and can be leveraged if expanded. This was important, especially when we think about, uh, actually throughout the report, we, we saw um, that communities that are, um, the opportunity corridor is being a really great opportunity for arts and culture. We're so excited about this um, prospect and the idea. Um, but again, public art is a, is a successful um, program and that that can be leveraged to broaden people's understanding of what arts and culture is and their opportunities to um, engage with it. So that is um, so just thinking about next steps in finalizing the report. Thank you so much. Uh, this is a draft, as I mentioned, and we are refining this with the steering group feedback. In mid-January, we're going to um, present these revisions uh, to the steering group for review. And then finally, um, we're going to be sharing this with the public in February. And that is our opportunity to transition to strategy development. Um, so really exciting to receive when, when we do receive those priorities from you all council members, from the committee, um, and to also um, incorporate that into the work of this, um, of this, this plan. Thank you all so much for your time. And I turn it back over to Priya and, and Tracy for council members. Thank you, Joy. <clears throat> I'll just ask if there are any questions we can answer. Thank you, Joy, for the for the presentation. That we got two um, hands up for questions. Just want to remind the committee we do have a, an, another agenda item uh, that um, that's really important um, that we take action on. I think today. So, Council Member Dregs, and then we'll pivot to Council Member Ashmeer. So, I just wanted to say first that since there was no opportunity to kind of uh, coordinate these documents. Uh, I'm pleased to see that I don't see any conflict at all here. No, uh, so uh, this is very valuable information. I appreciate the work that's being done. And I think we can kind of harmonize council with what you're telling us. This will help us to proceed with our uh, RFA. Um, and the one question I did have is, 
when you talk about where the arts uh, are located and there's a reference to these higher income neighborhoods, uh, do we have data everybody eats? And if there are no stores in certain areas, that's clearly a problem. But uh, how does the existence of these facilities align with the participation in the arts community? Thank you. Um, that's a great question. I'll briefly answer, and then I will also ask Joy and uh, uh, Fourth Economy to weigh in as well. Um, so we do have some data from the uh, online survey uh, that is about arts and culture participation uh, in uh, from the survey respondents. Uh, one thing that is um, challenging about that, and this is something that is uh, we do commonly experience in community engagement and in surveys is that, so we do have demographic information from respondents, but we, that, that information is, um, it is not required because we do find that folks are less likely to answer those questions and take the survey or complete the survey if the, that section is required. And so typically that section is, we have found uh, in uh, over the years of doing surveys, um, that we get a better response to the rest of the questions if that section is not required. And so the other piece of that is that the specific answers and the other portions of part of the survey are not then tied to the demographic information, if that makes sense. So I'll turn it over to you, Joy, if you wanna speak a little bit more to Councilmember Driggs's question. And please correct me if I misstated the, that piece around the survey responses. No, you actually you actually um, address the nuances perfectly, and I will say that we were we have been able to through the asset inventory to include places where in in both live and in the survey people did offer where they were experiencing culture across Charlotte Mecklenburg. So to answer your question regarding patrons and where they are going, we do have that information when people were, um, and, and we got a good deal of that information, uh, shared where they were experiencing culture and how much uh, they were consuming, if you will, culture um, in those locations. So we do have that information and it is a part of that asset inventory. I think we can push out to promote more participation but certainly at one reference point should be where the demand exists today. Thank you. Council Member Ashmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Drakes and other uh, colleagues, you all have done a great job, a lot of heavy lifting that's already been done. So certainly appreciate the work that has gone into this, I did get an opportunity to review the report um, and also the memorandum that was sent out or just um, um, a few minutes ago. And um, I, I would just like to add to that memorandum, if we can also include equity and governance framework as, uh, as one of our council priorities especially as we are looking at a nonprofit, established nonprofit to be specific, uh, making some of the grand decisions. I wanna make sure that we are looking at, uh, we are looking at some of those grand grant making decisions from the equity perspective. And that was the framework that council had adopted earlier last year that needs to be taken into consideration uh, as one of the priorities. And that's all I have. Thank you. Point well taken. I uh, um, noted. Okay. All right. We all good. All right. Um, Joy, I uh, want to thank you uh, and your team as always for the work that you're doing. Uh, Priya, uh, again, keep this train moving for us. And uh, council members will report out this afternoon. And we got about 30 days to massage what's in front of us. I think. Um, uh, the mayor pro tem and council member Drake have done an excellent job is kind of leading us to where we need to go and so i think we're in a good spot okay thank Great. you thanks take care take Great. care thanks council member graham um next we will kick over to the cbi disparity study if you remember we had a discussion around this um last fall and said that we would be back to you with some recommendations and so i will kick it over to mr coker to walk through some of that. 
Happy New Year, sir. Thank you, and uh, of course, good afternoon, uh, leadership, staff, uh, and I've got to say, uh, Happy New Year. Uh, today, we are uh, seeking your input, guidance on the recommendations uh, that have been uh, produced coming out of the disparity study, and of course, uh, CBIAC. We've worked closely with uh, the chairwoman of CBIAC, Vernetta Mitchell. Uh, I have to give her a major shout out. A lot of the work that we did together, she was uh, in Athens, Greece. And, and so uh, that's commitment. So it doesn't really... sound like a whole lot of work being done. But I, I'll, 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 I'll go with it. <laughs> and then, of course, I have to thank our uh, counsel, Mr. Powers, who does just a, a, a fabulous job. His uh, knowledge of the law as well as historical understanding of disparity studies is so important in what we do. But uh, there's so many uh, thank yous to go around, and, and that would just tell you that this is a team sport. We've engaged with our external stakeholders, our businesses, internal, our liaisons, our departments, of course, our senior leadership, and you, uh, the committee member, and our uh, council leadership. So thank you all for this. Uh, relative to, to what we're going to talk about today, uh, it, it's basically three uh, parts to this presentation. There's the 2022 disparity study, which Colette Holt and Associates uh, produced the findings and presented in September. There's CBIAC working along with uh, CBI staff. And then there's the schedule or the timeline to implementing this and getting this uh, eventually over the finish line. Um, as it relates to, next slide please. Thank you. Next slide. As it relates to disparity study recommendations, all of this uh, may sound familiar to you because this is what Colette uh, Hope produced. Uh, but we also took a close look at it and made the determination if we could do these things or if these were things we're already doing or they just didn't mesh with uh, North Carolina uh, law. Uh, but. This uh, page right here is things that we can actually do and complete by July, which would be our next fiscal year. Adopt a mentor-protege program. Uh, our CBIAC is working extremely close with us and helping lead the way to produce something called Linked Up CLT. And this is going to be a mentor-protege program that's meaningful and, and that has uh, real teeth to it and can produce some serious results. Uh, also, uh, as you would know, update our uh, program administration policy and procedures. That comes along with this uh, disparity study. Uh, implement a bonding program. Uh, we're real excited on where we are. Major shout out to Holly Estrich, who's been with us along the way in helping get to where we are. Next week, we're going to interview three firms who've been shortlisted on our RFI. And we hope to, in short order, select that firm who's going to administer a bonding program, which if you're a nation-leading program, which we aspire to be, you ought to have that type of program. Also, uh, implement technical assistance program, uh, which part of that will come along with the bonding program, as well as some of the other uh, components of what will eventually be CBI University, providing classes for our CBI certified firms uh, on estimating as well as uh, bid per paperwork. That's all important uh, in terms of the lessons learned needing to advance your, uh, your business. We are fortunately to have a good relationship with uh, Central Piedmont Community College who's uh, working with us to provide a number of those uh, technical assistance or instruction to our certified firms. Uh, next slide, please. In addition to those recommendations, improve long-term procurement forecasts. Uh, you've heard about early bird. Early bird at this point is mature. It's going, knocking on the door of being three years old. We've made constant improvements. Uh, we're recognized actually throughout the country for the work that's been done on early bird, and we're making improvements not only with that, but if you look at this new uh, ten to $100,000 space 
that were implemented for our service uh, uh, contracts. That right there is going to be uh, absolutely essential to what we do, but there is a forecasting component uh, to that, which city procurement uh, has worked very closely with us on. Uh, access to capital access program, I should say. That's something that we've had in years past. We've had it with something called self-help, but it, it really wasn't strong enough to meet the needs of our 1,400 plus firms. We are working with CBIAC again, on making improvements on that and really delivering a world-class program. It's gonna take us some time to get there, but we're working every day and we're making major strides there. Uh, Colite also talk about replacing NG, NIGP codes with NAICS codes. And, and really what she's talking about, move toward best practice as far as the type of codes you use that provide better description and over time, we hope to implement that. But that'll take a lot of work because we have to engage our uh, many departments throughout the city. Uh, credit MWBE participation only for work in NIGP codes. We're doing that, but that, that can be uh, strengthened and of course that's ongoing. Uh, create strategies to assist mature and experienced NWBE firms. We know that uh, one size doesn't fit all. So with our stronger firms, we don't want to just give them those uh, one-on-one type of uh, courses. We want to create measures that even help them and help them move maybe from uh, subcontractors to primes. So a lot of work uh, focused there. Next slide. These two uh, recommendations are ones that came from Colette but they're really gonna require some work with our uh, attorney. Uh, that's uh, Count MWBE's uh, self-performance towards goals and extend our quick pay beyond GFE uh, category. Again, we think it makes sense we could get on board, but you know, we have to make sure that we align ourselves with what's allowed in the state of North Carolina. Next slide and next slide. Next is our CBI uh, AC Advisory Committee recommendations. And I will say uh, from top to bottom, we agree with them. Uh, we support their recommendations. It's just a matter of if we can do these recommendations in the short term, which is in this uh, before current fiscal year ends and we enter into a new fiscal year. Uh, the first one is to require bidders to submit good faith effort paperwork at the same time as the bid versus after. Uh, add new GFE category for our LinkedIn, our linked up CLT mentor protege program and assign 20 points uh, for GFE points for that category. And then also add a new GFE category for bidder and proposers who host outreach events. And then that would give them 15 points. Next slide. This too is a short term uh, recommendation which we believe we can get these done before the fiscal year. Reference CBI uh, policy and solicitation documents including when a solicitation doesn't have an established CBI goal. Uh, this demonstrates priority for the city across the board. Even if uh, there's a waiver, we want to make sure that the language is there so that they understand that the city is serious about uh, inclusion. Establish an evaluation criteria for MWBE participation on service contracts. Now, you know we're an old hand at construction, but we believe this should be uh, added to what we do in the way of service as well as construction. Strengthen project monitoring for MWBE goal compliance. And then split the CBI policy and uh, the manual or the procedures into two, bifurcated. If you look at what we have right now, it's 50 pages and there's so much in there. It's a little difficult to uh, follow. We wanna simplify that and make it easy to follow as well as implement. Uh, next page, please. 
These recommendations, we believe, should be done, but these are more long-term. These are going to require a lot more work. Expand the use of technology for MWBE compliance and collecting data uh, versus using forms. We still use a good number of forms. Over time, we want to be able to get that to a point where we can do all of this online. We do so much of city business online, and this is no different. We should evolve to that point. Uh, next, explore measures to expand goal setting beyond, beyond construction. Uh, you know, we look at construction and we focus a great deal on it, but we should look at our other areas of uh, business that we are able to provide and, and be able to expand the goal setting. Uh, and then finally, facilitate more MWBEs with obtaining contracts by breaking down the scopes during the construction design phase. If we're going to do that in the most effective manner, we have to really look at when the, the work starts and when the design starts, and that's the best place to approach that. And we believe over time this is something that we could perhaps implement in our policy. Next slide. Back up one, please. Thank you. Okay, what do we look like moving forward today? Right now we are uh, you know, presenting to you the findings of these recommendations. Uh, assuming that uh, we can move to the next stage, we'd like to present all recommendations to City Council and seek uh, your collective guidance. Then we'd like to complete the revisions to the CBI policy we'll work with, our attorney will work with uh, the disparity study consultant and we'll produce that document. Then we want to begin crafting the communications and marketing plan concerning implementation. Then from April through July, we want to take, we want to present our revised policy and manual to City Council, seek approval of the revised CBI policy then from City Council, obtain uh, approval of the CBI manual from City Manager, and then implement the communications plan and implement a revised CBI policy and manual. And at that point, we're in a new fiscal year and we're working off of the 2022 disparity study. Next page. Questions. Th thank you for the presentation and, and thank you for sending me an advanced copy uh, during the holidays. I, I snuck and read it as well as the the arch report when my wife isn't looking when we were supposed to be on vacation. So I, I, I did some work um, to do it. Um, this opened up for questions, and I got a couple, but I'll save mine towards the end. And so, Council Member Ashmira. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Steve, great job. Uh, this is exactly the type of uh, improvements that we need to make to our CBI policy to address the concerns that's been raised. I really appreciate the work uh, that's been done till date. I appreciate the outreach done by you and your team. I've connected various minority women-owned businesses to your department, and they've been able to obtain their MWSBE certification. So certainly appreciate that, all the work. Uh, oftentimes, I hear two concerns from minority and women-owned businesses when it comes to our city bidding opportunities, uh, and I've shared those with you earlier. Uh, one is that oftentimes they get certified, but then uh, they really struggle with securing a bid. So uh, oftentimes, I hear the same organization, same firm are receiving city contracts, so out of some of the steps that, that you have recommended, what steps would address uh, their concerns about even pro uh, obtaining a small procurement and opportunity with the city and learning from that experience? Um, uh, so that's number one. And number two, the second concern I hear is that um, delay in getting payment, uh, delays in getting payment from the city. So I would like to understand what is our current process? Uh, what is the turnaround time to process uh, our accounts payable 
and if we need to also consider improving that process. Council member. That's all I have for now. Some great questions, and uh, certainly uh, it's a major problem when you look at uh, 1,400 plus uh, certified firms. Uh, and when we really get granular in terms of how many that we're using, it's really just over 300. So, you know, that is a major concern. Some of the things that we believe that will help our effort to include more is really focusing on those smaller dollar amounts. Again, when you talk about now focusing on 10,000 to 100,000, that's a lot of opportunity. And those firms who haven't gotten the opportunity, uh, they will have a better shot at being able to uh, you know, uh, qualify for qu contracts, but also be able to actually get those contracts, the more opportunities that are presented to them. Uh, in addition to that, you know, we are working extremely closely uh, with our CBIAC. Uh, they have their ears on the ground as well, and what they've been able to do is be able to deliver what they believe are things that will improve uh, city contract for our uh, certified firms. So I think hearing that, understanding these recommendations that they've put forth, uh, I think that's going to help us as well. Uh, <clears throat> capital access, that's major, and then quick pay. Uh, when you talk about uh, the turnaround, that is a problem. It's one that we are focused on, uh, one that we will allocate good faith efforts points toward uh, if a prime contractor is willing to pay the subcontractors earlier. That helps. But on a larger scale, we're working even more so to tweak it in a way that uh, will make a, a even stronger improvement, and we're working again with our attorney's office to make those improvements. Uh, but this is a, a, a living program. This is something that, you know, every day there's something new that we discover that we can do. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the recommendations don't get implemented until we do a new disparity study, but we're working on ways uh, that we can perhaps. Uh, work in between the next disparity study, but it is a major focus of ours to uh, make sure we grow that 300 plus number to 400, 500, and even more. And the more we're able to do that, the better uh, we're gonna be able to uh, support our uh, local MWSBE businesses. Uh, just Thank you so much, Ray. Um, it's it's um, obviously, from looking at the numbers that Steve just shared with us, certainly this should be our priority um, to, to really spread the opportunity to more businesses. Uh, and that's where also equity comes in. And also keeping in mind that some of the small businesses already have capital constraints so if the turnaround time for processing payment takes longer than what they would see in the private sector, then it really creates challenges for uh, many small businesses to be competitive in a high inflationary environment that we currently operate in. So I think it's important that we tackle that um, and we prioritize that uh, because those are uh, the concerns I have heard from uh, small businesses um, that have um, bid on city contracts. But uh, Steve, appreciate the work that you have done. I know you have also done a lot of outreach. I was attending one meeting with IT Serve, and I know it's just one of many that you have, you and your team have actually done a lot of outreach to provide and spread opportunities across our region. I certainly appreciate that. And Renee, I, Renee, I know she's also in the room, so I just want to also give her a big shout out, um, especially when it comes to IT, IT contracts and opportunities and how you're truly being inclusive in that process. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Vajmir. And I just want to emphasize two points she made. One is the, the access to capital. And if there can be some coordination between uh, your department as well as ED in reference to some of the, the resources that we have. Uh, 
that we don't have to reinvent the, the wheel to get some of those dollars on the street sooner than later. So hopefully that's 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 a, that can be a, a consideration. And lastly, certainly uh, the payment to vendors, uh, getting folks money in their pockets sooner. We got two questions. I'll ask, I'll ask one while I, while I got the floor. Tell me, I mean, it's an aggressive work plan for six months. There is no doubt about it. So. Uh, you tell me about your staffing, right? Um, because you know, if you want to know the priority of uh, of a city, just look at its budget, right? So, how many staff do you have? Well, uh, the best thing I can say about my staff, they are talented, okay, and they are committed, okay. Uh, but you know, we have uh, a lot of external or indirect staff that offer support. Uh, right now, we're down four positions, and we're working toward uh, getting those folks on board at, uh, sooner than later. Uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned, an extremely talented attorney who uh, really offers support beyond the law. And then we have uh, ACM who uh, really has uh, been able to help fill in the gaps. Uh, you know, give you an example. Uh, project management is huge undertaking when it comes to our work. Uh, sometimes we just don't have the horses to pull this wagon. Well, she's offered that uh, assistance. We have a, a dedicated uh, analyst outside of our department, uh, but dedicated. So we're able to use all of these resources until we get up to speed to where it won't be such a heavy so, lift. So direct staff under your supervision. Yes. How, how many? How many? Uh, six. Six. And and so two currently and four to be filled. Yes, that's correct. Okay. okay. Um, Council Member Drakes. Oh, I'm sorry. Drakes. So uh, I wanted to mention that I've expressed in the past misgivings about the legal framework here. Uh, you may recall, um, and. Uh, I'm not going to duke it out with Mr. Powers again. Uh, I, I, I just wanted to say I am supportive, since we have the program, of steps to make it more productive and more responsive to the people that it intends to serve. So for, for my part, I would encourage you to proceed if that's a question that you're putting to us. Uh, two questions. One is related to Mr. Graham's. Uh, do all of these things have budget implications? The ones that have bu budget implications would be the bonding program which has been taken care of at this point. Uh, depending on how we roll out capital access, that could perhaps uh, have some budget implications. Uh, you know, it depends on how we roll it out. A lot of times you will uh, attach some type of educational component to that. And if you do that, then there's uh, money needed to, to pay for that. Um, outside of that, everything that we presented uh, I, I think that pretty much uh, covers us. Now, of course, if we bring those four staff, or if we ever determine that we need more, then that's going to require uh, additional money. Those are funded positions now, aren't they? Uh, well, two of them are. All right. Uh, three, two others are new positions that we've asked for. Okay. You, so, so far we got. Yes. Okay. Uh, Good. So, so no earth-shattering budget. And not, for example, under capital access, suggesting that we start becoming a bank. No. <laughs> All right. I mean, the ideal scene is we live in a town where there are so many strong financial institutions. The city has great relationships with um, most of them. Uh, I, I just think there's got to be some way to collaborate. I love the suggestion of ED and uh, CBI coming together to figure out how to... Roll this uh, big rock up the hill and get it to the top. I, I think that would be um, beneficial to both parties, actually. Um, and, I, and Tracy's yeah. not nodding her head. And so I think that's something that we ought to um, put as a priority in terms of because getting the money into the hands of business owners uh, is, is step one. All the other stuff is other stuff, right? If you can't afford to, to operate a, in a consistent manner. And, and going back to your budget, I mean, again, I'll ask some other questions offline, but you know, we just need people to do the work, right? And uh, even one of the items that you made mention of earlier was um, doing a better job of um, um, getting the results in, right? And there are a number, and we talked about this before, there are a number of high profile projects 
that the city is involved in 7th and Tryon, Spectrum Marina, <coughs> others, and that people will be looking at minority women's participation. And so that's a, a job in itself, right? When you put uh, the pearl mm -hmm. uh, that Atrium is doing. I mean, all those are key projects with a lot of city investment that people will be taking a look at, making sure that uh, minority and, and women-owned business get an equal opportunity to compete fairly and equally in the marketplace to participate in those projects. So mm -hmm. um, I just believe that, you know, we need to make sure that if we're sending you out there uh, with a, a big charge that you have to, the resources necessary to get the job done. Council Mr. Member. Mr. Chair, I, I got to add some more. I haven't done yet. Uh, you're not done yet? No. I was I was talking and and then you made okay. your point. But uh, if I may, I'd like to just. Say okay. Well, well, we, we got we got two more. Uh, and uh, all right, I'll be quick. You'll be uh, quick. You'll be fine. So uh, I just wanted to comment on access to capital. I would recommend engaging with potential lenders, and for one, trying to establish whether they have stereotypes that cause them not to make loans or what their credit concerns are. Try to have a serious business-like conversation with them. And, and see whether or not there are any credit enhancements that the city could offer that might help to address. So I'll just throw that out uh, and happy to help with that conversation. The other thing I wanted to know about, though, was do we have any input from businesses that don't qualify for all of this support about whether or not they feel that there they're, are they're small businesses that aren't owned by women or members of the minority community? Many of them struggle. Uh, have we had any input from them to the effect that they feel disadvantaged uh, unfairly by these efforts? Uh, we, we have. Uh, we've done surveys internally. Uh, we've just gone uh, far enough to understand what the issues are, where their uh, needs are. Uh, but we also learn uh, anecdotally from our disparity studies some of the challenges, uh, especially when it comes to discrimination, things that have uh, been impediments to our certified uh, companies. Uh, I know in uh, Colette's uh, presentation, she went you know, probably four or five pages of all these uh, you know, responses that she received. And, and it's ones that we pay close attention to. We know we can't do uh, everything, but we do know that uh, working together, you know, if I were to sit down with you and say, uh, can you connect me with you know, such and such at, I don't know, Bank of America. You know, that's, you know, collaboration, and I think that's what it takes for us to drive this program. Um, you know, I've been at it now for two and a half years, and, you know, we've incrementally gotten better. Uh, you know, we started out, and I won't say we were buried, but we were in a different place. Now we've rolled up to a point where the city has clearly demonstrated priority for business inclusion. We report to the city manager's office, and, and, and they, they have our ear. Uh, we, we meet with uh, council members on a regular basis, and that's all important for the, the work that we do, especially for something that we peg as priority. So uh, I, I just want to be sure that we make clear to our other small businesses that we value them, too. Oh, of course. They're, they're a part of our economic environment. They're Without a driver question. of growth. And uh, so uh, uh, that, that's all. It's just uh, let, let's not make them feel, uh, you know, undervalued. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You want a quick comment? Yeah, I'd also like to add that the CBIAC is fully representative, right? So it's not just minority businesses. It's not just registered businesses. So it's people who are in the community and want to help. Ms. Rennie, we cannot hear you. Could you please turn on your microphone? I don't have one. Yeah, you don't. Pull it. That's you. I'm so sorry. Uh, what I was stating is that the CBIAC group is inclusive. And so it's not representative of just those who are minority businesses that are looking for opportunities. It is representative of those in the community who are not even registered with the city that wants to help bring things forward in this space. So I just wanted to clarify that I agree with you that there needs to be voices at the table to make sure that we are moving forward in the most um, equitable way. So you think about um, equity and service framework and making sure that we have that lens. I believe that CBIAC offers that. I um, also wanted to add that from a position perspective, um, we have, you know, CBI has a set number of positions that they already have and they have some vacancies they're needing to fill. And then where there's opportunity, they've uh, requested additional positions already in the budget. What I'm trying to do is make sure that we look at all the programs 
And we not just ask for money because it sounds great to do that, but put together a holistic program that says, okay, this is what we need to do to execute. And so execution could include um, resources, but execution could mean just having a plan to make sure that we can, can do that and have a whole ecosystem. And Tracy and I have had conversations about, you know, what are the small business opportunities for funding and small businesses, whatever, you know, ethnicity you are, it's a small business and what is available, what type of funding. And so we want to make sure that we're not trying to be a bank and reinvent the wheel, but leverage all the services that are available to our community. Okay. Council Member Winston, thank you for your patience. No problem. Thank you for the discussion. And I, I was just going to uh, give a comment, um, you know, to, to thanks, thanks staff, um, you know, to shout out the work that they did and are doing. Um, you know, I think remember a couple months ago, council had a pretty robust conversation and discussion and wanted to see some action and changes. And I think it was literally the next day um, staff was reaching out. <laughs> Um, to me and, and, and other folks to understand, you know, what they were hearing um, and how, how to go about it. Um, and they've had um, um, staff changes, leadership changes, um, and uh, it seems like uh, they've been very responsive uh, uh, to council feedback from all sides <laughs> that it came from. And it looks like that we have um, uh, something to work with and um, work to build on. Um, as the discussion went today. So I just wanted to acknowledge um, the work that has it's been going on um, on staff side and council's um, feedback and continuing kind of feedback and working with staff to kind of get through the route and get to some action in a really quick um, and, and fast timeline through some very dense um, language. As, 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 as Steve said, uh, this is a, is a highly litigious, potentially litigious kind of subject, and um, it's hard to navigate desires to outcomes in, in these places. So I think we've sussed out through a lot of things, um, and we've kind of partitioned out other places that we need to work. So I'm just very pleased in the way we've been able to work together with this as a council and, and a staff. So let's keep it going. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Council Member Mayfield. Thank you, Chairman Graham. Steve, I just want a clarification. When you ran through the recommendations, you have some short-term recommendations, and then you go into a little bit more detail on the back as far as the timeline. Are you saying that you're going to be able to tackle these short-term recommendations by fiscal year end? Yes, yeah, short, the, the short-term. Those short long-term, uh, if they are in, implemented, it's going to take us uh, uh, a bit of time to make those happen. Uh, we looked at the reality of where we are, meaning the things that we're currently working on, many of those things we are, uh, as well as anything that's new, uh, we do believe that we have the wherewithal to get those short-term recommendations integrated into a new policy. So for clarification, the only thing that I would ask, because I'm not on the committee, I'm just um, tuning in and play like I'm a committee member on TV. The it will be. It could be helpful that the language that you have for short term, that that's what you're identifying in your actions for that January through March, okay. because looking at the two, it looks like it's something different. Okay. So just for consistency's sake, so I think that'll be helpful for us to be able to help support our colleagues when the committee brings the recommendation to full council. Point well taken. We'll make sure Thank that happens. Sir. Thank you, Ms. Mayfield. Councilmember Wallington. Thank you, Chairman Graham. Um, I had the opportunity to listen to the presentation uh, in route, so thank you for that. I've got just a couple of quick follow-ups, and thank you, uh, ACM, uh, for being very clear that CBI includes small business. So if you are a small business owner and you don't feel like you fit into a particular box, you're in this box with us, so please, please reach out. Um, our staff will be happy to help you get acclimated to what the resources are. Um, a couple of my questions, a little bit of a follow-up to Councilmember Mayfield's question in regards to staffing and your capacity to uh, continue this work. Um, the items that we see in short term with your current staffing, even with the holes, you feel you can still deliver by fiscal year end, if I understood you correctly? I, I do, uh, mostly because uh, much of what you see, you know, although it comes in the form of a recommendation, it's things that we've already planned for and we started working on. Mm -hmm. You know, if, say, for instance, uh, 
you know, bonding program was something new. There's no way. It's taken us, uh, I started probably my first week uh, on this job working on bonding program. Tell them, Holly, right? <laughs> and, but that's something that we've gotten to a point where it's gotten funded and, and we are shortlisting the firms. So we feel like that, you know, we could get over the threshold. Uh, when you talk about, you know, the other items uh, such as mentor protege, CBIAC has been working on that uh, for a, almost a year now. They even have a name for it. Uh, so uh, we actually had a, a meeting, a great meeting this morning about it, just to see where we are. So there are a lot of things like that that we've already started. Uh, although it will continue to be labor intensive, we, we do believe that we can get those things uh, you know, in the uh, new revised policy and ready to be implemented come July 1st. That's actually a great segue to what my question was because some of the things I see here I know that we've been discussing for some time so I'm very happy to hear that they are already um, in the hopper. I want to understand two things. Firstly, these things like the bonding and the execution component, that has to be within the policy to execute or no? Okay, so as these things are rolling out, we don't have to wait until council adopts a new CBI policy. Okay. No, no. And then my second question is in regards to the uh, breaking up of smaller scope and procurement and that kind of thing. And I know we talked a little bit already about the connection with your group and ED, um, but can you speak, I think about like general services and the project managers who are actually putting together the design bases or the, uh, the scope of work. How have we gotten to the point where we are clear about what that training or what those job aids or what that that system looks like for the people who don't necessarily sit within CBI but are responsible for compiling design bases? Well, that's why we made that a, a longer term uh, implementation. Uh, you know, where we sit right now, we don't think we could probably get that done mm -hmm. by July 1st. However, we do value it. We think it's extremely important and we know if we're able to implement that, you know, right at the design phase, if you're talking about, I don't know, you know, this floor right here and carving out all the doors, if you get that at the design phase, we know that that's a great opportunity and a smaller opportunity for a, a firm to work on. We recognize the value, but as far as uh, being able to implement it uh, before that time, we don't think we uh, can do that. Uh, you know, we're going to work on it. We're going to uh, continue to advance on the ideal until we get to that point. I don't know if uh, any of my uh, well, it's partners okay, here. Well, it's okay because I know we're running out yeah, of time. We're running I, short on yeah. time, so. Um, but the only thing, the only additional thing I, I will say to that is that's exactly what um, I'm thinking about, and I think from a technical standpoint, how to break up that scope. Obviously, we don't expect that to come out of CBI. We don't expect that to come out of the SMEs in the particular department. So to the extent that we can um, think about how other departments can help give input to accelerate this part of the work, uh, certainly uh, would be supportive of that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councilmember Wallington. Steve, um, again, I think that um, Councilmember Winston uh, said it all. We really appreciate the work that you've done, you and your staff. Um, I've done this work before, and those check boxes are more than just check boxes. There's a lot of um, detailed work behind each and every one of them. So I want to appreciate uh, the work that you're doing in your staff, and that's why I asked the question about the staffing. It's a lot of work, uh, but um, I'm glad that you're leading the charge. Uh, council members, any additional questions? We got to wrap up like in 10 seconds. Move to adjourn. Uh, move to adjourn. So I have a second. Thank you, everybody. Thank
Do they tell us when they're ready? Are we ready? What are we doing? Yeah, it's happening. We're about to begin. I think we've already begun. Yeah, we totally did. Apologies. I waited until you stepped out of the room to start. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Housing Safety and County Committee. Community. <laughs> Y'all, it's the first day of the new year. Welcome to the Housing Safety and Community Committee. I'm your chair, Victoria Watlington, surrounded by some of my wonderful friends. <laughs> We're going to begin here momentarily. We will start with our introductions. Uh, we hope you had a happy holiday. We've got a full agenda today, um, so we look forward to getting into it. So with that, we'll begin with a round of introductions to my left with uh, our vice chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. LaWanna Mayfield, vice chair. Tark Bakari, committee member. Marjorie Molina, committee member of District 5. Braxton Winston, uh, mayor pro tem. And I do not see any committee members online, so then we will move on to our staff here in the room, starting with uh, ACM, Ms. Renee Askew. Uh, Renee Askew, Assistant City Manager. Sean Heath, Director of Housing. Rebecca Hefner, Deputy Director of Housing and Neighborhood Services. Gail Whitcomb, Housing and Neighborhood Services. Thank you. And then we have a number of guests around the room, so I'll just start right over here to the left, guests and staff. Um, and we'll do quick introductions. Hi, Jenna Cantino, Charlotte Observer. Madam Chair, I'm Rick Pfeiffer at 1623 Lynnhurst, uh, visiting here in part of a member group called One Mec. Hello, I'm Ken Szymanski. I'm a community volunteer. Okay. Justin Harlow, Ness Commission. Allison Craig Laney. Loretta Lucas, a lawyer reality. Rhonda Lawrence, local Charlotte Realtor, a lower Realty. Thank you. Kim Graham, Greater Charlotte Department Association and Ness Commission. Hi everyone, Debbie Smith, Charlotte Department of Transportation. Anna Schleinen, City Attorney's Office. Warren Wooden, Housing and Neighborhood Services. Harold Thompson, Housing and Neighborhood Services. Thank you so much. We will jump into our first uh, topic, our anti-displacement update, led by Deputy Director, Ms. Rebecca Hefner. Sure thing. Let's get going. Okay. All right, there we go. We are ready. Everybody, everybody is a little slow easing into the new year here. All right, so today we're going to run pretty quickly through a hefty amount of slides um, to share information on the anti just. Uh, work we're doing around anti-displacement. Next slide, please. There we 
driving. Nope. Next slide. So I know some of you who have been on this committee in its previous iteration have seen much of this already. Others of you, this may be some new information, um, but we'll move pretty quickly. We're going to take an overview of the city's current anti-displacement approach, uh, the work that we're doing uh, at, at your request to develop uh, anti-displacement strategy, talk a little bit about where we are with the staying in place pilot update, and then a short uh, uh, update on the activities of the NEST Commission uh, before we hand it over to um, our NEST chairs to share some of their initial work with you all. Next slide. Our broad anti-displacement approach that we've been taking as a city is really rooted in these four areas. Um, the things that we're doing on our current programs and initiatives, not just about housing, um, but also jobs and small business support and neighborhood engagement. Um, the new tools and strategies that we are currently working on testing and implementing, including staying in place and the work of the Nest Commission, and then all of the ways around that that we can leverage data and technology uh, and, and include robust community engagement so that we're making all of those things um, better and more effective. Next slide. So we're currently working on the development of a anti-displacement strategy, the draft of which is um, will be worked on with the Nest Commission and is scheduled to come to this committee uh, at um, potentially as early as your June meeting. So we, we looked at that uh, during uh, our discussion about the Nest Commission and the schedule around UDO implementation and so committee's request was to have that strategy back around the same time as the UDO would go into effect. So we are currently in, uh, in this first stage of analyzing our current approach and synthesizing different activities and information, basically doing a gap analysis. We are also actively working on getting community input and uh, working with the Nest Commission. Uh, and then the goal is to organize all of the things that we are doing and any gaps into an anti-displacement strategy. All of this, though, building on all of the things that you all have already adopted and enacted around housing framework. That's back in 2018 now, if you can cast your mind back that far at this point. Uh, and then the <coughs> council policies re related to the comp plan and the silver line and the work that the Nest Commission is putting forward. Next slide. So we're kicking off that project now. The strategy will go first to the Nest Commission for feedback and refinement and then to this committee and then uh, at your discretion would work through the council adoption process. Next slide. So that's the anti-displacement strategy shifting into an update on staying in place. So staying in place, uh, we continue to implement this pilot program really around how we, how we can more collaborate across the city and with our partners to ensure that residents can stay in place in their neighborhoods. Next slide. The pilot is taking place in three neighborhoods, so it's a part of the Corridors of Opportunity program. So within three corridors, we are working in Washington Heights. Hidden Valley and Winterfield. Next slide. And the idea of staying in place is really working towards sustainable stabilization so that we're not just providing one, uh, one type of support for one household, but really thinking about uh, what, what is the needs of the households themselves and the people there, what can we do to support the property, and then how does that fit within a neighborhood, and then broadly, how are we leveraging the um, supports that are being put in place at the community level around housing and jobs and other cross-sector supports. Next slide. This next set of slides is really to talk more about the process we went through to identify how to uh, refine and create new programs that would support staying in place. So I'm going to run through this quickly, but I think it's important because it was really a process this 
summer and fall of reconnecting with community and making sure that our assumptions about what was needed, um, well, testing our assumptions about what was needed. And in many cases, we found out a lot of new things. So it was a very valuable uh, process, which started with these visualization surveys. We had teams of staff members from across all uh, departments out in the neighborhoods with community members. Next slide. Walking the streets and identifying a variety of uh, locations um, and both challenges that people saw that needed to be addressed, but also opportunities maybe for grants or enhancements. So this is a slide that just shows the relative number of uh, responses on the community visualization survey, this one in particular for Hidden Valley, <laughs> related to essentially what, it, what did the neighborhoods and staff identify in this um, visualization walk. Next slide. And this led to us being able to test a few new approaches uh, around code compliance and trees and even thinking through uh, the grants that we have available. Uh, so this slide just shows a, a, a new way that we tested code compliance to let folks know that they have a potential violation, violation and there are resources affordable available to them. Next slide. In partnership with General Services, we uh, sent staff out from the Landscape Management Division to do tree assessments uh, in these neighborhoods and identify uh, large trees that may need um, pruning or other kind of assistance. Uh, through staying in place, you have made some funding available to expand on a uh, large tree assistance pilot from several years ago. Next slide. And we also asked community members and staff to identify where are there opportunities for um, enhancements or uh, other kind of um, engagement opportunities. And so they also took pictures of streets where they said maybe there's a mural opportunity here or an opportunity to adopt a street. So all of this information was compiled together. Next slide. And we developed a programming um, enhancements to existing programming that would be a much more holistic approach to staying in place than what we had former, formerly on offer, which was a series of you know, programs that did specific things. And what we're trying to do with staying in place is provide one program with one point of intake that under, asks people what they need, what they're what they're struggling with and what they would like to see and then matches them to the resources that are available. Next slide. So just a couple of the of the uh, changes to programming that this has resulted in. Uh, we're really looking broadly at housing rehab. So from emergency repair all the way up to whole house rehab and thinking about how that also includes energy efficiency, large trees, as you saw, and things like digital access. Next slide. The House Charlotte Home Ownership Assistance that you all uh, heard about earlier this year uh, has, has been uh, marketed in these neighborhoods. Next slide. We are conducting an accessory dwelling unit pilot in each of these neighborhoods in an effort to provide additional affordable housing and also um, provide rental income for low income households. Next slide. So you can see the number of housing specific activities we have in process here and the tree assessments and that's because those are the programs that have started rolling out or were already in existence. Uh, that is, um, and then we have a, another uh, uh, part of the programming that actually will begin here in January. Next slide. And that's, that's this idea of how we're building partnerships to really extend and expand the resources that are avail available to residents uh, through our partnerships with United Way. They are funding quarterback agencies in each of these neighborhoods as well as a community grants pool. And Lowe's Foundation has supported that United Way investment. We are partnering with Atrium Health to put a community health worker in each staying in place neighborhood. And that community health worker will be responsible for resource and referral and follow up and peer support. Uh, so that when, when we find uh, 
residents who need things that we don't provide through the Staying in Place program, they can be referred to other resources. Uh, and then pending um, approval from the North Carolina Utilities Commission, a potential pilot with Duke Energy to address energy burden. So again, really trying to think broadly and holistically about how we can support any given household. Next slide. Uh, this is just a slide of the Community Health Worker Partnership and some of the partners that are involved in that work. Next slide. The framework of staying in place is essentially looking at the social determinants of health. This, this slide is illustrating how the different partners are plugging in on those different components to address residents' broad needs. Next slide. And so the next piece of the staying in place pilot is really rolling out more broadly the staying in place interest form. The community health workers will be onboarding with the community quarterback agencies in uh, January and we will be uh, then promoting the stay in place interest form in English and Spanish and doing door to door canvassing with our partners in the community. So this interest form is really designed to be a single point of intake and, and getting an understanding of residents' needs uh, all in one place so that we can then match people to what their needs are on the back end instead of the typical, typical government approaches, oh hey, we have 10 programs, you can apply to all 10 of them, find out if you're eligible. We're really trying to reduce the administrative burden of accessing resources that are already available. Next slide. So one question we get a lot is, okay, there's three pilot neighborhoods, then what? The real key to staying in place is that we're not doing a pilot in three neighborhoods and then we'll move it to three more neighborhoods and then we'll move it to three more. We're trying to change the way we do business and change the way we deliver services and create the partnerships needed to make that sustainable. So we think of it as building a new engine for our programmatic service delivery and that as new programs and services come into play over time, we can plug them in and move them forward, but all in this much more coordinated, streamlined, and easy to access way. Now, what I'm gonna say is, this is not easy. It is a lot easier to say, okay, we're going to do 25 rehabs, which we're doing, and that's not easy either, I'll say. <laughs> But this is, this is taking some time. And so we are trying to both roll out the actual uh, pro programs that are being implemented and fit them all together at the same time. And so we expect the numbers of, of uh, activities to start to ramp up now that we have all of those different pieces in play. So that is staying in place. I'm going to shift gears. I'm gonna have a quick update on the Nest Commission. All right, so this is the last component of the anti-displacement update. We did strategy, uh, or we did approach, we did strategy, we did staying in place. The other piece of this is Nest Commission. The Nest Commission, of course, is charged with reviewing and recommending specific anti-displacement strategies and tools to protect, to protect residents of moderate to high vulnerability of displacement. The commission was formed as part of the comprehensive plan implementation and they kicked off in February. Next slide. This slide illustrates how the Nest Commission is related to other components of the comprehensive plan implementation. So there was a community benefits task force that did some work uh, that was completed a couple of months ago. And then of course the Charlotte Equitable Development Commission, which is also um, formed by council and is advancing uh, a separate work plan similar to what we're doing with Nest. Next slide. The NEST work plan, this is information you have seen before, but just as a reminder, the NEST Commission has organized themselves into three work streams, one group looking at the UDO, one looking at uh, what we call lay of the land, the importance of site control. If you don't own the dirt, you don't got nothing. And then um, one group looking at program improvements and policy gaps. Next slide. 
So they've been very busy in 2022. They've kept us busy. Uh, and I know that Justin and Kim will share with you um, both, a, both an early recommendation, but also um, so that you give you an overview of what the team has been up to. Um, but they have done a deep dive around what is displacement? What does it mean? What are the effective strategies for mitigating it? They've looked at home ownership. In fact, some of their early recommendations to staff uh, will, will be incorporated into uh, revisions, the next set of revisions to the House Charlotte program. They've looked at accessory dwelling units and provided us input in terms of how we shape our ADU pilot program, and they will bring forward some recommendations around that. We spent a great day uh, all together in person uh, doing a deep dive into the UDO and workshopping some ideas. We heard from the Housing Justice Coalition about their platform and their ideas. Uh, and then, of course, um, the Nest Commission has uh, uh, discussed property tax assistance, and they have an initial recommendation that will be coming forward to you today. Next slide. This is a look ahead to the next NEST Commission's work in 2023. Of course, I only got January through May um, because that, was, that seemed like enough for today. Um, so they have a recommendation that uh, uh, Justin Harlow will share with you today. Then we're going to just keep at it with our work streams in January. Uh, in February, NEST will be having a joint meeting with the Charlotte Equitable Development Commission to ensure that those uh, two um, bodies of work stay aligned related to the comp plan implementation. And then a couple of months that will be focused on the development of the anti-displacement strategy and the next set of recommendations from NEST to you all, um, the committee. Next slide. That's it. That is, that, that is as fast as I can run through um, all of the variety of things that the city and our partners and um, our fantastic uh, volunteers on the Nest Commission are doing uh, relating to anti-displacement. So I will pause there. Thank you. I appreciate that. You all have definitely been busy. I know we've got a couple more presentations, um, so I just want to check in with the committee members. Would you all prefer to ask questions? So I know some of you have questions uh, now, or do you want to wait for the next committee? Does anybody have a preference? So, Madam Chair, mm -hmm. I think it would be helpful for us to get okay. the report out from the next committee, because that very well can answer some of the questions I know that I have in Perfect. here, if all that's right. okay with the full committee. Everybody good? Awesome. Mr. Harlow. All right. Oh, Kim, join the table. Great. Don't leave me up here long. Perfect. Um, yes, there, yes. I thought you were sitting <laughs> there. Absolutely. Perfect. Welcome to Take the it party. away, Justin. <laughs> uh, first off, uh, council members, thank you all for committee members. Thanks for having us here today. Uh, as uh, Ms. Hefner mentioned, the Nest Commission has, has worked worked hard in 2022, and we look forward to continuing that, that work um, in 23. Uh, so on behalf of our, our 15-member commission, um, Co-Chair Graham and I, Kim Graham and I, will uh, like to discuss with you uh, our first recommendation coming out of the Nest Commission um, as it relates to tax assistance. I uh, appreciate the great summary of the work we've been doing. Um, we are tackling this anti-displacement charge from a lot of different fronts. Um, and so we, we've uh, voluntarily split ourselves up into kind of some subgroups, work stream, subcommittee uh, roles, and uh, we'll be coming to you hopefully kind of quarterly with various recommendations coming out of each of those groups. Um, so today uh, we'll be discussing the first recommendation coming out of the policy and program improvement uh, work stream. Uh, Ms. Graham mentioned, Kim mentioned uh, low hanging fruit. So uh, just for, for some background a little bit, do we have the slides for this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, low-hanging fruit uh, when we first kind of met as a as a commission in February and it was really more about darts of throwing at the wall and saying all right you know all the people that have been appointed to this commission have got various interests um, it, it, some are you know work in real estate industries some are just general housing advocates others community leaders organizers um, th things of that nature and so it was really just kind of you know going through ideas of hey how do we what are we hearing on the ground in our own networks uh, that may help you know help with gentrification anti-displacement how to you know 
uh, supplement where the city's going from a growth standpoint while also supporting, you know, communities um, staying in place and also making sure we're matching all of that with the council's goals. Um, and so one of the low-hanging fruit things that was discussed was, hey, you know, another revaluation is happening. Uh, we know the county has moved from eight years to four years, and um, that revaluation is happening right now. And so what does that look like from a tax relief standpoint? Uh, the council has, uh, you know, addressed this in the past with various pilot programs, aging in place. We now call it staying in place. Um, none of it, though, has been kind of permanently codified. Um, and this is where the Nest Commission and in particularly the, the uh, Policy and Program Improvements Work Group uh, kind of said, hey, you know, this is something that already has got kind of the bones around it. Um, a lot of the research had been done, fiscal year 18 and 19. I mean, you all were, were in the hand committee at the time when that was originally discussed. Um, and then COVID hit and it kind of, kind of got dissipated a bit. And now we're back with some of the same kind of concerns and, and issues around increased growth, increased uh, property values, and uh, therefore perspective increased tax bills. Now we know that the council has its own decision to make as it relates to this budget cycle, what that looks like from a, from a tax rate standpoint. We'll address that a little bit as well. But um, that's kind of what we've been doing. We've gathered some data um, looking at what already exists with the county, knowing that they are the real you know, purveyor of, of Tax, the tax bills come from the county tax assessor's office. One third of that tax bill is from the city. Two thirds is from the county. Looking at what some other municipalities have done, um, um, best practices there, and then looking at you know what what was already been in, in place here from a pilot standpoint, um, from the city standpoint, and then uh, we will leave you with a recommendation today on a permanent tax relief program um, going forward. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, just to kind of give, Kim, please feel free to jump in. All right. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Kim runs her own work stream around the UDO, so she, you'll, you'll, and I know she's in front of y'all tons all the time anyway on a variety of things. But uh, uh, so, looking at what the what, what exists already, um, and all of these are county programs. They're really state programs administered by the county. Um, most of us are maybe familiar with the, what's called the Homestead Exclusion Program. Um, that's that first that's that first row there, where um, senior citizens, generally 65 and above. Um, can get a break or an exclusion on the tax value of, of their residence um, up to either $25,000 or 50% of the actual tax bill, whichever is greater. Um, that includes disabled um, seniors as well. Uh, they've got to own the home, and but there's an income limit, um, which we'll find, you, you'll see this in all of our um, slides going forward, we find is generally the biggest um, kind of barrier is that the reality is someone's on fixed income, 30,000, 31,000 here, and that change is generally based on the slightly increasing AMI every year. Um, but, you know, there's tons of residents that, you know, make more than that, that own homes, that are dealing with the same scenarios, um, and it becomes a snowball effect because they're still, these are still working adults, maybe not necessarily retired, but even some of the 65 and up might be working adults. Um, and there's no way to change that from the county's program without some type of state implementation. Uh, or state state changes. Um, the homestead uh, disabled veterans one is very similar. Uh, it's it's poor for veterans though in particular. So those that have been honorably discharged um, from our military that doesn't have any age or income requirements. Um, so a, a relatively open program if someone can prove that they were a veteran and, and, and honorably discharged. Um, then the circuit breaker is a little different. It's a deferral uh, program, so it's not something where you say, hey, we got this tax bill, we can immediately give you a break on it. It's, it's all right, pay your tax bill and we defer your taxes later um, whenever, the, uh, whenever the transfer of the, of the property happens. There's a different barrier there, of course, when people uh, you know, pass on property um, in, through inheritance, um, then you know, those, those uh, dependents or, or whoever is left with, you know, left with that new tax bill that has been deferred for who knows how long. Um, it's not a bad program, I'm not saying that by any means, it's, it's another tool in the toolbox, as, as many of us like to say, uh, but it's, it's still a program that has some, you know, some, some concern sometimes around who can participate and then later who bears the burden of, of, a, of a future tax bill. Um, so uh, similar requirements with an income limit, though, uh, must have owned the home for, for five years, so a certain amount of time. So uh, next, next slide, please. 
So that's the existing programs that the county offers. Uh, the original aging in place program was uh, the pilot from, from 2019 and, and early 2020 was to help try to marry those two to say, hey, how are there, are there, are there segments of the population that might be getting this break on the county side but getting nothing right now on the city side? Um, and, and one of the things I definitely want to impart upon you is that currently, as it sits right now, the city has no tax relief program, period. Um, there, there's nothing that exists. Um, we, uh, so let, let's continue to talk here. So we'll talk about this in, in, in real practice here. Um, and, and the numbers definitely matter and, and make a difference. And so we, this is not to, I want to be very clear, because we had a lot of debate in the next commission about this. This example is just an example. Um, it does not reflect anything around specific averages or anything like that. It's just using a $300,000 property as an example. We know that there are properties worth less. We know there are properties worth more. Um, so using a $300,000 example with current tax rates, um, and kudos to this council and past councils for keeping the tax rate at a revenue neutral space from many years ago. Uh, but when we look at you know $300,000 taxable value, again, that's the appraised value from the tax assessor, not the value of the home. Uh, we, we then can break that down and show, you know, here's the, the um, county, 60, you know, 60 cents on the $100, $100 value, um, and the city as well, and then what the total tax would be with no tax relief at all, uh, almost a $3,000 tax bill. Um, and then we can see what that looks like if someone qualifies for the homestead, um, the circuit breaker at, at various income at income levels. And so if it's, you know, the homestead, they can get 50 percent value. They, they won't have any tax deferred uh, won't, at the circuit breaker, various various numbers there. So um, these county pro these state programs administered by the county do provide relief. Uh, I want to mm -hmm. want to say that out loud too. there. There is relief there. Um, but you know, there's there's generally only about, and I think we've got it in here, and Rebecca, please help me, on how many people are actually participating in that. Um, I think, oh, it's next slide, yes, okay. Perfect, yep. Um, so approximately, it, with these existing programs, about 18,000 people are eligible um, for these across the, uh, actually, that, technically, this would be across the county. Um, so, you know, a million people in Mecklenburg County, 18,000 people eligible for these programs that the state legislature creates and then allows county governments to administer. Um, approximately 6,000 of those, so one-third um, are receiving assistance through one of those buckets, um, those circuit breaker buckets or the, or the exemption buckets. Um, and we, we see that the very, very small amount in the circuit breaker program, only 27. Um, the, the table can kind of show you what the you know the full scope of, of um, these programs do shell out from a from a dollar value. And we're going to get to that as part of our recommendation as well. What does it mean for you all as, as sitting council members to recommend a dollar amount um, for a program that could exist for the city? But the, from the county side right now, this is their spend here on um, on various programs. Next slide, thank you. Um, so I spoke a bit about barriers and challenges. Um, Lack of awareness, we can say that about a lot of things, right? Um, you know, there's so many different programs that exist across the board for a variety of, of, of different issues um, that some people know about all of them, and then there's, you know, a good segment of our community that doesn't, doesn't know that they exist. Uh, the eligibility is something we're gonna, we're gonna talk about a little bit more in the future. Again, I mentioned the county programs all have generally, with the exception of the veterans one, have a 65-year-old age limit, and then based on each program, a, you know, something tied to AMI, generally 30% or 60% AMI that plugs us into that thirty dollars to $40,000 range. Um, but so sometimes there's limited eligibility either based on age or income or both. Um, another burden, right, is having to reapply every year. We have not automated this by any means. Um, the county has not, the state has, has not. Um, and we think that there's an opportunity there for the city to lead in the sense of, hey, how do we help once people get attached to this and they qualify, that they just qualify always. Um, maybe with you know one touch point a year, hey, just prove you're still on the home type of thing. Um, and often that 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 we think the Nest Commission believes that that can be pretty easily remedied through the tax assessor's office or, or through the Department of Housing and Neighborhood Services. Um, and so, you know, th those are those top three are, are important because we think those are the biggest barriers and challenges. Of course, there's other things um, around deferrals and burdens um, 
uh, with the heirs that may inherit these properties, as I mentioned before. Um, and then other, you know, qualification issues maybe around immigration status or folks who just have not been up to date on their property um, taxes before. But that's important because all of these programs, you only qualify for them if you are current, um, not if you are delinquent. Um, and so that, that definitely matters um, whether, you know, people can participate. No, no, no program exists now to help anyone catch up. Um, next slide, please. All right, um, so best practices. We, we looked at what, you know, uh, other, other things that are, that are playing in, you know, hand in hand with what, what the council's priorities are. All of this has to do with, you know, the council's affordable housing priorities and the staying in place priorities. Uh, you know, there are other nonprofit partners that the city works with, of course, Dream Key, Habitat, um, Crisis Assistance Ministry. Um, these are always, you know, places that, you know, community, you know, your constituents are being referred to on a consistent basis when, when they've got some type of housing concern. Um, you know, I, I, we know this committee discussing land trust models and things of that nature and then also looking at, um, you know, other, other, you know, counseling, financial counseling and, and these wraparound services uh, that exist. And so we want our recommendation to help kind of marry into what's already happening. Um, so, and, and then of course, educating, you know, any, any community partners on, you know, what may come, what may come from these recommendations. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Good. So, um, we, um, I'm going to, I'm going to jump a little bit. We are recommending a program, um, that looks similar to the, to the homestead exclusion, but uh, it looks very similar to the previous aging in place pilot. Um, but we are wanting to expand the eligibility. We believe, as an S commission, that that is the biggest barrier. Um, right now, all the programs, as I mentioned, 65 is the age kind of minimum. We, we looked at what age 60 would look like. We looked at age 55, and we, we even got aggressive and looked at age 50 <laughs> um, and um, said, okay, let's try to create a balancing act. There are dollars attached to all of that, right? The lower the income, the lower the age, the more people that can participate, which then means a larger, larger bucket of dollars. Um, so the Nest Commission did settle on 55 and up, um, and that would help um, up to 17,000 people participate in this program that don't participate in anything right now. Um, we also looked at various income, uh, various AMI limits as well. Uh, previous aging in place just did 60% below and 65 age. Uh, we looked at the same 60% and below. Um, we also looked at the 80%, up to 80%, and that's also where the recommendation is um, is going to be standing. So age 55 and up to 80% AMI, that's where you see um, that 17,753 estimated households. And then across the table, you'll see the annual estimated cost of full participation will be dependent on, you know, what the, what the value of that tax bill, the tax increase might look like. Um, that can range anywhere, of course, from 1.7 million all the way up to 8.8 .8 million. Um, it really just depends on a number of things, um, one of which is once the full revaluation is finished, what are, these, what are the assessed values, but more importantly, what does the city council set as the tax rate? Um, the, the Nest Commission is not making a recommendation on the tax rate, just for the record. <laughs> um, but we hope that you can see this and, um, and, and then you, know, you can play with those numbers based on, uh, but we do know that it, at full cost and full participation, um, up to at least $500 of an increase, that that 8.8 .8 is what it would, is, is what, you know, might be like a maximum, essentially, <laughs> um, if you will. Um, Based, a lot of this data was based on the 29 revaluation. It's, it's the most recent reval we have to use, um, where the, the median tax increase for homes valued at 300,000 was uh, $254. Part of that increase, some, some might say, oh, well, why is that? That increase might sound low, right? And you know, depending on, you know, because we had this huge, you know, growth between 2011 reval and the 2019 reval, but kudos to the council for setting a revenue neutral tax rate so people didn't get hit as hard as they maybe could have. Um, different market, different econ economy at this time, so, so who knows. But the point is, is this, this is where, uh, this is the data the Nest Commission looked at, um, and so we hope that uh, you can digest this in, in the same manner and, um, and, and know that also this important point, 70% of the homes valued under the median had value increases. Um, and so those that 
uh, maybe make the least or have the least valued homes felt the, felt the, the, um, felt the hurt, if you will, of, um, of an increased tax value the most. Um, so uh, next slide, please. That's, uh, that's uh, so where, where we're seeing the biggest changes, uh, we can have the same crescent and wedge argument as any policy decision and anything uh, that's essentially, this, nobody's a stranger to this map, but uh, this is where, where we're seeing uh, the, the, the largest uh, increases and so the, the color coordination uh, matters. We know where the, the values, you know, the highest, you know, property values generally are in the wedge. Uh, lower values are in, in the crescent, but as I mentioned, it's almost an inverse relationship. So those that feel that feel higher tax bills are those that have lower values. And so part of trying to tie it to AMI, lower, uh, increase the, the, the bucket of people who can participate and lower the age is to try to capture more participation and eligibility in the, um, you know, across the city, but, but certainly in places where folks are feeling those high growth areas, the areas we classify sometimes as, you know, gentrifying areas, if you will, um, and, and many of those are, are around the, around the, uh, the crescent. Next slide, please. Is that it? No, okay, didn't think so. All right, uh, cool. Um, so I, I know I jumped it ahead a little bit, uh, but I wanted that other slide to make more sense. Um, but this is what the tax assistance recommendation is, is to provide tax assistance grants for households at age 55 and up with incomes up to 80% AMI. Um, and again, the, the seven, that 17,000 is for folks who don't, who are not eligible for state programs. So there are folks who will participate in the county programs, uh, but there's a, a good handful. In fact, almost the same amount of folks who qualify, who are participate, who, who qualify and are eligible for certain state programs that also could qualify for the city programs and get a break on the county and the city side. Um, we want to make this easier, right? Um, you know, when I talked about barriers and challenges, you know, how do we coordinate? Um, with Mecklenburg County and uh, the tax session office, particularly their homes program, um, which we didn't talk too much about, but it's essentially the county's trying to do something similar to what the city previously did with aging in place. Call this new thing what you want, but it's, it, it's to say, hey, how do we do something similar to walk hand in hand? So again, not create an information gap or an information barrier. So when, when you know, residents call into 311 or when they call in to email you, um, and they say, hey, I, I, I need some help here. How can I, what can I participate in that we can give them information on both, on both things, um, and use that, that kind of communications infrastructure uh, to create a larger outreach um, to currently eligible homes. So still use all the community partners that are being used, broaden the door-to-door -door outreach, um, and, and you know, try to, it, long, this is long term, uh, the Nest Commission's even said, hey, how do we, what does it look like, you're like this Mr. Bakari, developing some type of resident facing app, right, that says, hey, and we, we know, I mean, apps exist already on the city side, but how do we plug in these programs to that technology already? It's again, make it easier. Um, and so those are things to consider. Um, uh, we're open for any questions. Uh, what does permanently funding this really look like so we don't have to come back to this every four years in a reval or let it kind of dissipate every year or every two years when a council turns over, things of that nature. Uh, but again, uh, we're open to any questions. We're, thank you again for, uh, for allowing us to try to come to you with these type of recommendations and um, the recommendation is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Harlow. Um, I will open it up. I've got a couple questions. Hello, welcome, Councilmember Johnson. Um, I will open it up. I know that Vice Chair Mayfield <coughs> had some questions from previous, but we will do a go around. I see that this is listed here for action if the committee so desires. So I would like to hear from folks and see if we're in a position to take action today. Council, uh, Thank Mayfield. you, Madam Chair. And I'll be asking for both, but starting <clears throat> Excuse me, with staff and our anti displacement update, the PowerPoint on page seven, what a couple of things that I'm wondering how we're going to identify it. So, when we're looking at program development enhancement, <coughs> excuse me, small landlord assistance. It will be helpful to bring back, what does that mean? What does that look like? One of the challenges, as was mentioned, is the conversation that we have around not only accessory dwelling, but also 
communal space. We have not had a lot of conversations that I'm aware of um, around council, around communal space, and how that is being utilized. Currently, between the county and city, we have language of up to six non-related individuals, but there are also homes out there that have 10 plus people in them. We need to be on the forefront while we're looking at language updates where we're addressing the opportunities that we may have in communal space when we're looking at our subsidies, but also making sure that we have language in place to protect individuals because we don't want to go in and clean house and create to our homeless population. We want to be able to transition individuals, but we also don't want people to be in a position where they're being taken advantage of. So when you have 10 plus individuals in a four bedroom, that may be a challenge. If it's a larger home, if it's separated where it is safe, safety in it, then we want to make sure that we're creating access and equitability across the board. And what does that look like? Also, when I was looking at housing activities, which is slide 18, why did Winterfield have nothing? I think you mentioned it briefly as we're moving into 2023, where we know Hidden Valley, the assessments and process, we have emergency repairs and tree assessments. The only thing that Winterfield community has is under tree assessments. It would be helpful to know why we haven't, have we just not gotten around to addressing the assessments or rehab? So on Winterfield, for one thing, it's a much smaller neighborhood. Okay. And so the efforts that we're doing in Winterfield right now are, we're still in the stage of working through the, the neighborhood level components. Uh, so we, we phased the implementation. So we, we started first with the community visualization survey and those names in Winterfield, none of which have uh, entered the rehab process as of yet. It's also a much smaller neighborhood, so when we when we do start those projects, there will be fewer um, that that uh, show up on the um, numbers anyway. But by pulling together the resources of our community quarterback agencies and the community health workers who are coming on board this month. We expect to get many more applications in from all the neighborhoods and especially Winterfield where we haven't had any uptake yet on the housing uh, activities. So additional question in this one, I'm going to ask you to go back in your memory bank with previous discussions that were held over the last few years. So prior in my previous role on council, we created the CLT by TLC by CLT program. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to understand is why didn't we continue with the initial communities with the enhancements <clears throat> versus identifying new communities when if we go back, if we step back and go to the neighborhoods where we initially created the program, we can see that some of our investment we didn't have all these extra pieces in place and a number of those people have what we were hoping not to happen is exactly what did happen. So if you look at historic Camp Green where we started, a lot of displacement has happened in Camp Green. You have a neighborhood where homes were purchased $90,000 or less that now have homes that have been purchased for three to $700,000. So, and a lot of those homes had rentals. You had a very small percentage of home, we were like less than 30% home ownership. I'm trying to understand, and that's something we can follow up with, why would we create additional with lessons learned and go plop it somewhere else opposed to sticking with the areas that we initially identified and creating immediate rehab for the sake of a, letter, of a better word right now to those areas when we were seeing what was happening from our investment because we didn't put language in place. So it will be helpful to get an update on those future because if, if I heard you correctly, now that we're here, there's no room to expand this. But my logic is that's not expansion when we moved on from where we started to go into a new area 
but we haven't gone back to see if these, this additional support can help. So we can get an update on the neighborhoods that participated in TLC by CLT and, uh, and share that back. The, it, it's not that there's no room for this to expand. It's that we would intend that once this is all packaged together, it then becomes the product, this collection of services that's available in any neighborhood rather than uh, it then moves to a next neighborhood and a next neighborhood. So the, a lot of these uh, programs and services are existing programs that we have enhanced for staying in place and then when we figure out how they all fit together and we're better able to do exactly what you're saying is instead of just offering a component of it through the housing rehab, we could then package it and ensure that residents have access to these other services as well. And there are many of them in here, particularly digital navigators and financial navigators um, that are already available broadly and the energy efficiency pilot that's referenced with Duke Energy will be available broadly. It's not specific to staying in place. When we figure out how the ADU pilot works and the Nest Commission makes recommendations around it, and that these things will be available um, uh, more broadly depending on the decisions council makes about investing in them. And so uh, the idea is we're using these three neighborhoods to test those ideas and to get the process <clears throat> straight. But we will definitely go back and take a look at TLC by CLT and how some of these already existing other components can be plugged into places we've previously made investments. Because I think that would be helpful of, to ensure that we're achieving the goal. Because looking at the map that you all had to use as well, that map of the Crescent and Wedge has changed drastically but almost every presentation is still utilizing that, we need an updated map. Because a lot of those areas that were considered the areas for high investment, investments have been made into those areas and the individuals who potentially could have benefited the most from those investments are no longer there for whatever reason. So to tie it together so it doesn't look like we're throwing this pebble across the ocean having really a comprehensive look of where we are today versus just a five-year snapshot. Not going back a decade, but looking at a five-year because it would really be interesting because I noted it twice, the small landlord assistance. What does that really look like? One of the things that I pushed back on on the TLC by CLT program was the fact that, that we had the language where we'll do this investment, but if you sell this home, we just get the money back on the front end. Whereas now you have language where you qualify if you lived in a home a minimum of five years. The challenge with that, which I saw back then, is that a lot of people don't know what they have. So they may have sold and undersold because there is targeted solicitation in certain areas of our city. So they may have sold at a price not realizing the value or realizing that you're putting yourself in a financial position that's going to be even worse because no one anticipated what was going to happen in 2020. We knew something was going to happen in 2019. Well, now those individuals may be living with family, may be homeless today, may be trying to rent, whereas if we have put stronger language in on the front end, that's what I want us to think about and get to. For the presentation that came out of Nest, when you're looking at the how do we use technology, I think this will be a perfect opportunity if we can do it through the CLT Plus app by on the app adding the access for people to tap into these resources because we all receive calls of people needing assistance and you're absolutely right and thank you Nest Commission for all the work that you have put into this is we can't do everything we're government we're not a bank yet 55 and over is a great start but we know that we have individuals that have been negatively impacted that are 38 and up 
We can't do everything, but there are some programs. So how do we, to the best of our ability, connect those individuals? Because we, for me, the focus can't just be 30% and below. Because you have a segment where if they just get a little boost, that will stabilize them and they will be good. So if you're making 70000 72000 in Charlotte today, and you're a household of two, you're barely making it. Whereas three years ago, you were in a position to potentially be able to buy a home. That is not the reality today. So if you're currently in your home, and now you're looking at, what did he share with us? Almost a 60% potential increase on in the new property tax evaluation that's gonna be coming this year. So if you're in that arena, so that home that you may have purchased for $100,000, what that increase is going to do to you, you don't qualify for any of this. And I believe now, as I believe previously, we have some more flexibility, whether it's through CDBG, whether now it's through ARPA. We, city, has some flexibility in some of our dollars where we can address some of those specific needs to help ensure agent in place. Agent in place isn't just 55. Unfortunately, here's the reality. You're a lot closer to going home than you are to being in that community and being a contributor. So what are we doing for those people? Yeah, that was the nicest way I can come up with that. <laughs> that what, is, what are we doing for those individuals? When you look at the, this council, if in, those who are homeowners, those who are interested in purchasing, we are different ages. What is happening for us to age in place? What is happening in our demographic, in our age group? for us to age in place, not waiting till 55 with the hopes of having a home because home ownership is going to be a challenge for the next decade plus. Thank you, Madam Chair. Absolutely, very good points, but how do we get ahead of the curve versus trying to keep it between the buoys for folks who may even be, maybe they're not going home just yet, but they are towards <laughs> the end of their home ownership <laughs> journey. <laughs> Council, did you? Yeah. Oh, Council member, um, Melina, and then Councilmember Johnson. Excuse me. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I just, for um, just a brief moment, I actually want to expand just a little bit on what Councilmember. Um, uh, oh God, I'm having a, a moment to. What is wrong with me? Same thing. Look, it's, I'm having one of those moments, right? Um, Council Member Mayfield, what she just said was outstanding because I, I couldn't agree it enough. I think, um, and, and I, I, I can't help but think of, um, I, and I'm wondering if we can kind of uh, find some information around single motherhood. I think that's a very important one for our community because um, a lot of the, of, of the people who, I, I've always believed that poverty is sexist mm. and it is pretty, uh, obvious that you know a lot of the people in our community and communities around our nation are women who are raising children alone and that's not to say that there aren't men who are doing the exact same thing so maybe you know for um, looking for the opportunity to include I would like to say single parenthood but I would bet and without any quantitative information in front of me that we have more women than men who are in that particular uh, demographics. So I, I would wonder what that information would look like. What type of quantitative information do we have around uh, the people who are experiencing the highest amount of poverty in our communities? And then how do we then kind of work with the end goal in mind? So we're looking at the results based on what we have from the quantitative standpoint. Um, and I think that's our best approach. And I actually, I think this is a great start. I love that you guys, I was on the Charlotte Equitable Development Commission, so I know what goes into these ideas and the thoughts and processes you know, behind it. And I know uh, a few people who are gonna be really happy to uh, collaborate with you guys. I think that's gonna be a powerhouse of information coming from that, and I'm looking forward uh, to post that February um, a meeting that the two groups have. Uh, but I, I would like to see how um, we work from the data backwards. And, and if there's an opportunity to look at that demographic, because like, you know, my colleague, and you know, I'd like to, first of all, thank you for your service, because I know that you've sat in the same seat and you know what we do 
and what information we need to make the types of decisions that are going to make the greatest impact. Um, and so, like you know, my colleague said here, um, we we we're remiss if we look at it from just an age sure. perspective. I think we're going to miss a big chunk of that pie. So, um, specifically, um, single motherhood, you know, even children, you know. And then this is this whole envelope, you know. We're helping people stay in their house, but then how do we help them access a job, right? So, I think that's where that additional collaboration comes from. So I think once we do that, of course, we're going to add additional questions and, and uh, maybe even expand the scope of our conversation. But I, I'd like to see what and how we can add that. And, and it may very possibly, it quite possibly may change how we look at the age portion of this. Thank you very much for that, Councilmember Molina. I'm going to go to Councilmember Johnson, and then I want to make sure that before we end this discussion that we are able to give some feedback on the policy choices. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got you, Picard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so as you're thinking about the program and your, and, um, your thoughts and where you'd like to see it go, there are some specific policy choices that we have that we'd like to talk to. So uh, real quick, if you could just lift those back up for us as we think about this discussion, then we'll go right to Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Councilmember Watlington. So just in direct reference to what are the types of things that staff is listening for today? I mean, first, of course, is what is your appetite for the notion of this sort of program in the first place? It's, it's kind of like a decision tree here, right? And if the answer to that question is yes, no, or maybe, then there's a whole set of other questions that we, from a staff perspective, have. What are your feelings around the design parameter that was referenced earlier in terms of this program being done on an ongoing basis, where essentially you get into the program and you stay in the program versus different types of scenarios? What are your thoughts around the age eligibility and the AMI eligibility? And then there are also maybe some other policy assumptions embedded in here around, for example, what if you have an individual that is 55 or older and is at less than 80% AMI, but didn't actually experience an increase in property taxes as a result of this valuation, what kind of policy choice would you want to make around those types of scenarios? So I just offer those up as kind of generic things that we're listening for so we know what to do when we leave the, the meeting today. Thank Thanks. you. Councilor Johnson. Thank you, as I'm representing the 55-year-olds in the room, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Me and Janet Jackson, okay, just so you know. <laughs> Anyway, um, I just wanted to piggyback off what Councilmember Mayfield said. I think you brought up a very good point. If we take a look at the at slide number nine in the Nest Commission slides, if there is, so if you look at the median tax value change, I want to make sure I understand that. The darkest is, um, does that represent higher than 221? thousand dollars in tax increase the tax value tax value yes that's huge Assess the value. Yep. that's a whole i mean you know so i think if there's a way that sean if there's a way that we could calculate maybe not just income base but the amount of the tax increase like that's that that's huge no matter how much you make so if you're if your tax value is increased over $221,000, that could really hit someone very hard, no matter how much you make. So we need to take a look from a um, weighted perspective or something, I would think, and individuals with these excessive tax increase need to be considered. Because if you, I mean, if you bought a house at whatever the value is, if it, if it increases this much and the tax rate increases this much, that's going to impact uh, folks. So I really, really think that we have to take a look and, and skew the values or do something to consider such excessive um, increased values, right? So, and then also I wanted to talk about the areas that were the pilot areas for the um, staying in place. I don't know what slide that was in, but I know it was Hidden Valley and the other areas. I know I worked very, very closely uh, when Hidden Valley was in District 4 to have Hidden Valley as a part of this pilot because they were one of the targeted areas. So I think that that's one of the, the reasons that that was considered. I'm happy to see the utilization. Um, so I don't know, as we're 
looking to expand these programs if we're if we're considering the utiliz utilization and and the targeted areas. So I'm I just wanted to thank you for this information because it, um, Hidden Valley was one of those areas that was receiving you know solicitations from developers constantly. So I think I really think we want to consider that. I like what Council Member Mayfield said. The areas that were vulnerable back when are no longer the vulnerable areas because they've been gentrified. So I really think we want to um, somehow continue to look at the the um, the targeted areas and where that's moving towards. I know there's a lot of development in District 3 now. You know, Derrida might, might be the next place. So wherever those trends are, those targeted trends, we need to make sure that we're following that. Thank you. If I may, uh, thank you. Um, with the, the map on slide nine that, that almost all of you are addressing, um, I do want to just make, uh, it's kind of a nuanced point, but uh, to make sure that uh, there's understanding that the increase of tax value is not the increase in the tax bill. Because it, the increase in the tax or the assessed value is not the increase in your actual property taxes. It, it, so a, a $221,000 increase in value does not mean you owe $221,000 more to your tax bill because there's a rate attached to the tax rate is then attached to that. I don't know if I explained that. It sounded right in my head, but. Um, <laughs> Um, so, for, I, if, if I may, Madam Chair, so if I'm understanding you correctly, um, Dr. Hollow, what you're identifying is, one, we don't know what the tax, we don't know what the tax assessors is right now. So you have the market rate, you have the assessed value. The assessed value. We don't know what the taxes are going to be yet because the tax assessor has already presented to us and said there's going to be a delay in getting proposal. Well, what he mentioned is that they're anticipating around a 60%. So as an example, I was sharing with, uh, with Madam Chair, I have a friend who is one of our elders. When she bought her home in the 80s on Queens Road, that was a $100,000 home. Today, because of what the market has done, that home is valued 1.2, 1.5 million. When the tax assessor comes along, it's going to be somewhere between that 100,000 and that 1. Point whatever million. They very well can see that 221. But this is also someone who's who is older, who's on a fixed income. Are we? Do we have space? for their fixed income might be above the limits that we show because it's not at the poverty level, but there definitely will be an individual that would need assistance. Yeah, so, so just to circle back on the funds, noted that the tax value is not the difference in the tax uh, bill, but it certainly is proportional oh, to the change. No doubt, no doubt, yeah. Cool. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Bakari, or I'm sorry, Ms. Johnson, was that everything? Yes, yeah, Mr. Mr. I'll be brief. <laughs> Please. Um, we, we have a tendency oh, to in this body to focus in on the doing things because we can do them and not prioritizing amongst all the things and what the greatest outcome of what we're trying to achieve is going to be. And I think, you know, in the last five years, we inherited a lot of messes before that. But in my opinion, having sat through it, the, the aging in place program was one of the first and largest kind of our own self-created uh, issues. And it, it was something where we spent a lot of time. We allocated money away from other things that it could have been used for, and it, it didn't get used. It was, an, it was it, it, a measurable failure in that point. And now I'm just surprised that we're being presented with something to double down and go all in and codify it for the future. When it, in the pilot phase, which is what our pilots are designed to do, didn't end up uh, proving itself out. Now, there could be a variety of reasons, but there was plenty of time pre-pandemic uh, in this. There, there, were, there were notifications and things that went out. I think the, the bottom line is, while there is need baked in here somewhere, when you look at overall, I, I don't think that our highest priority for spending up to $8 million is thinking about, at a median level, $250 tax bill increase that's equivalent to $21 a month 
when they are paying uh, their monthly um, mortgage there. I, I'm not saying that there aren't buried in there some real issues. I'm saying I don't believe, though, that a majority or even a material number of people are losing their homes over $250, over $21 a month versus other things like people renting in gentrifying neighborhoods where predatory folks are coming in and buying it out there and, and doing things. People who uh, under the age of 55 and 50 where their number one uh, aging in place tool is a job, right? That's, that's the job time frame. We should be investing that money in our workforce programs and hire and things of that nature. Um, you know, and, and there are other tools. There are, I mean, for the people who were lucky, this is something we should all count as. That's amazing you, you bought a 200000 or $150,000 house that's now worth $1.2 million. Is there a challenge there? Absolutely. Your tax bill went up. But there are tools out there, reverse mortgages. There are things you can do in order to pay that tax bill and not have to be kicked out of your home because, indeed, what you have built is equity, and equity is a good thing. So. I, what, what I would suggest we do here is, I, I won't say, like, let's scrap it, but I can't fathom that this should rise to a priority level alongside other things that I've just listed and more that I haven't that have a more meaningful out, out, output and outcome in the future. I, I, every, if you guys are looking both in this anti-displacement strategy statement and in these committees and things like that for a, a strategic guardrail to operate in, what I would say is not like synthesize activities, identify gaps. What I would say is think long term and strategically. Is an idea that we could pilot something that could scale to a million people in 25 years in the city, to 4 million people in 35 years at a county and an MSA level? Because if we can help 15 or 20 people, all right. I mean, I'm not going to discount that, but we should be thinking big and thinking at a scalable level here. So I think that staff, you guys should probably have the takeaways of this and put it alongside other things. But we should, when we come to figure out how to divvy this up, this should not be a conversation by itself where we say yes or no and then we move to the next topic. We need to be able to prioritize what, what the opportunity cost is of what we're doing. And just as a side note, if it makes it to that point, which I, you will shock me if it does, but if it makes it to that point, my suggestion would be we're not trying to create a, a kind of a handout mentality where folks can do this because it exists and they know about it and it's easy to get to in an app. We want to save people from being kicked out of their homes because they can no longer afford the tax bill, which means maybe we put some sort of levy or uh, a constraint on their deed and say, okay, we'll pay it now, but when your house is sold, this has to be taken care of because at the end of the day, it's just about keeping them there. It's not about creating a system that relies on this. Thank you, Councilman Bakari. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem? Yeah, and I'll be quick. And, and to Mr. Bakari's point, I actually do think you have something here in one of those recommendations. On the bottom of slide 10, um, you say consider state level advocacy to expand eligibility for the homestead exemption. I really do think that should be point, uh, that should be pushed uh, to the top, and, and I say that because, to Mr. Bakari's point, uh, this is something that could affect a, a, a ton of people, not just here in Charlotte, but across our MSA, MSA and really across the state. I also say that because I think there is an intersection there uh, between advocacy groups. I talk to folks in Rebic and I talk to folks in the Housing Justice Coalition. This is both on their radars, and there's not a, and this is both something that they are, that they would like to push forward. Um, and I also think that there is um, there could be uh, the political um, uh, will in the state to explore this. And I say that because um, uh, I don't know how many of you guys read this, but Mayor Mayor Lyles sent us these uh, two reports, the future of local option taxes in North Carolina, as well as uh, uh, the, the future of North Carolina revenue, state and local options for the next few decades. These are reports commissioned by the Republican National Co um, um, Convention host committee um, uh, and that, that were done for us as, as, as one of those gifts. And one of, the, one of those uh, recommendations in here um, uh, in, on page 23 uh, is uh, the uh, homestead exemptions for low-income 
and or, and or elderly homeowners uh, to expand those, the need to expand those um, from, from a state level. So I think we do have those options. And again, like I said, I would push that way up to the top because to Mr. Bakari's point, um, this is something uh, that won't just hurt, help 20 to 25 people, but could help everybody <laughs> and, and could expand the eligibility by thousands um, in, in our community and potentially hundreds of thousands, if not more, um, across the state. So. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. So just as, um, as we look at this conversation, we will defer item number three to the next um, meeting, considering the time frame. Um, so as I think about what I've heard so far, when we think about the program, I'm hearing some yes and some maybe, and Council Member Bakari, a no. Okay, when it comes to ongoing versus year to year, it sounds like whatever we do, there will be some general support to, of course, make it easier. I do think that there should be some sort of opt-in. You gotta do something uh, to verify your eligibility each year, um, but not necessarily to the same extent. Um, from a location standpoint, heard loud and clear that we wanna think about how do we get ahead of the curve? Where do we think that the trends are going so that we can try to um, stop what's already occurring um, before it gets out of hand in certain areas. And from a t standpoint of policy eligibility, I'm hearing we wanna look at how do we create some flexibility around the age and the income restrictions. And then one of the things that uh, stuck out to me was as it relates to true estate transfer, I know that you all did a, um, you did an analysis around the barriers and challenges to the previous aging in place. So we do have an understanding of why the funds were underutilized. How do we think about or where where can we play in terms of the estate transfer? Because we think about who are the people that end up selling their homes because of um, because someone has passed on and now there's a lot of multiple owners or those kinds of things and it's the easiest thing to do to get it sold somewhere. How do we interrupt that process um, to help owner occupants get into these homes. I think that's one place that we could spend our efforts and our energy is as we think about the increases we made in our um, home ownership assistance, how do we marry that up to where are the homes that are the, I'll say the cheapest, if you will, in the market where we want people to have, be owner occupants because we also are experiencing a high level of renters in a particular neighborhood, for example. I think there are some overlap um, there. And so that's where I'd love to see the energy. Um, I absolutely agree and had marked uh, as it relates to the state level advocacy for homestead exemptions because what it feels like is the, the, the reason that we are getting in the game is because too many people are left out from what's existing. And so if we can increase um, our advocacy to expand that, across the state that may help um, so just as a check-in uh, staff how are you all thinking are you getting what you need to move forward in a particular direction or what have you heard or, or what you, tell me what your reaction is to what you've heard today just to be candid I think we're, we're just gonna have to reflect on this and figure mm -hmm. out where do we take this conversation based on Know the nest recommendation i think this gives us you know good bits and pieces of feedback but i'm not exactly sure what the go forward plan is i'm not going to make one up on the spot oh, for sure i don't <laughs> want you to don't want you to um are you are you getting the sense that this is a we need to go back up and punt kind of thing or do you think that it may be more of a tweaking just in general because i'm getting the sense that it may be a back up and punt if i might just and maybe this is helpful um i i think I think that we, as we enter and get ready for this budget cycle that we're about to go into, we have to start thinking of all of the opportunities in relation to one another. I don't think we can sit here and approve one thing right. because that's going to happen like 70 times through 70 different committee meetings. I think you guys have to bring us what, what is the opportunity cost of doing this and what things won't get done. And I think what you've got to do is go back and figure out how you're going to work that process over the next month or two because I, I mean you will hear me as a broken record on every topic that comes up that's asking for budget cycle approval I want to know what we're not doing right or I want to know like what what are we giving up the ability to do and the summit next week of course will be helpful as well absolutely yeah. um, so it sounds like at this point we are not ready to take action we'd like to 
see a little bit more in terms of what we can do with the feedback. Um, I do think, just from a NEST standpoint, we know that we were trying to pull some things forward um, when it was ready so that council can view. So I'm glad that we were able to have this discussion on this end. So thank y'all for bringing it to us uh, so we can kind of get an idea of where we are headed. And as I look at the overall strategy, not only for anti-displacement, but also for NEST, it, I do feel confident that the, that broader view of what all is out there um, is, is already on the table. It's a matter of how do we see it at the same time. And the last thing I'll point out is given that, to your point, Vice Chair, we've got these ARPA dollars, we've got some one-off funds, it may not necessarily be a situation of either or. So we want to make sure that we capitalize on those extra, if you will, funds that we have in the buckets uh, now. So, yeah. yes, Ms. Grant? I, I just want to um, make a comment. I appreciate um, your perspective, Councilman you Bakari. And mm -hmm. I, I will say that we're probably going to come to you all with a menu of anti-displacement strategy tools in the toolbox. Some of that may include relocation funds for people who get displaced because a property is purchased that they can no longer afford. Some of that may be workforce development and job training because we know that housing costs are related and associated with living wages. Um, some of that may be homestead expansion. Uh, I know that you all will have priorities, competing priorities for the things that you're going to advocate for at the state level. And so I hope that if homestead, if this, um, if this recommendation doesn't rise to the level of funding from city council, that it doesn't fall off of the priorities that go to the state because I would love to see us advocate for an expansion of homestead exemptions so that the number of people who can participate and get money at the state level falls off of your, your, your shoulders, right? It falls to the state's shoulders. Um, so I just ask that we keep that in mind because there are going to be lots of competing things for, this, for the city's priority at the state level when you guys have to take something to the state. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Madam Mayfield. Madam Chair, this question is actually for staff. With the, so we have a legislative policy committee. Thankfully, two of us also sit on that. Seemed like that piece can be pulled out. And the question would be, do, do we need a recommendation? Do I need to make it in the form of a motion from this committee for that to be referred over to the legislative committee? Can't be refer from committee to committee. We can't. Uh, yeah, I just sure made all kind of changes when I was gone. So we got to figure out from staff's recommendation, how can we get that piece pulled out to get it from this committee? over to the legislative committee so that we can have that discussion since we are in the process of having our discussions of meeting the new members who will be sworn in shortly. We'll know what the leadership is going to look like. I think tentatively we're looking at our first visit in February to go up. So that would be a great opportunity to get that, that piece, the, all the language around legislative policy to get those pieces over to that committee. And Madam Chair, I would, meeting, um, yeah, Madam Chair, I would recommend you bring it to the committee as part of your readout mm -hmm. and put it on the table to see how it can move forward. Yes. Thank you. All righty. Any additional comments? And if not, you all good? Move to adjourn. Uh, all in favor? <laughs> Thank you. Move to adjourn. Thank you, Madam Chair.